video game console. And today we have web browsers built into our smart televisions, accessible via our television remotes. And uh, Web TV was another first of its kind product that kind of gave us a glance into the future that we have with smart TVs now. I could go on and make these comparisons for products like the Danger Hip Top, the T-Mobile Sidekick, the dawn of video game streaming with OnLive. Obviously, you've got Google Stadia. Or uh, the game-changing and motion capture technology that MOVA brought to Hollywood. But a technological history lesson isn't the reason that we're all here today. We're very lucky to have Steve Perlman of Atari, Coleco, General Magic, Catapult, Web TV, Microsoft, Reardon, Moxie, Iceblink, MOVA, OnLive, Artemis, and Joe Britt of Apple, 3DO, Microsoft, Catapult, Web TV, Danger, and Afero join us to shed some light on a different chapter of both of their careers, the story of Web TV. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Tommy. Um... Steve, how are you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> um, uh, what an introduction, huh? That's an awesome introduction. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah, and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, appearing here. It's really great to talk to people that are um, are interested in the stuff that we did back then. And uh, um, certainly we're happy to go and tell you stories um, if we can figure out a way. I think Joe has some stuff that he, he can show you as pictures that he got, but I somehow thought we might have video working. So I have all sorts of paraphernalia here from back then. If we can figure out a way of showing it, then I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but uh, then of course, whatever questions you got, you know, we're at your disposal. I, I don't know if you have anything to add, Joe. I mean, yeah, no, that, thank you, Steve. That That's excellent. And yeah, it would be great if we could if we could figure out a way to, to show folks some of the stuff we dug up. Uh, it's hard to believe kind of um, how long ago <laughs> this was. Uh, and in the, the photos that, that I dug up, uh, you know, there's a very young uh, Joe Britt and Steve Perlman uh, at, a, at Web TV. Um, and before the call, we were, we were talking to Tommy some more about how much things have changed and uh, how interesting it is that the visions that, that we had, uh, that Steve had, um, back then around video games and, and using the internet on a television, how prescient those were, because those are all things that we now take for granted. Um, you know, Steve and I, we were, we were at Apple together in the early 90s, uh, and I feel extremely fortunate to have been able to, to be a part of both X-Band and Web TV, because not only were the technologies really interesting, but the people were incredible. I mean, this, the, the teams at both of those companies were um, of an incredible caliber that, that's just impossible to find. Uh, and I think the thing that was really magical about it for me was not only was it technically really interesting, but it was genuinely fun. You know, I, I loved going to work every day and I loved building this stuff. Um, and it, as we talk more, um, I think, I hope you'll be able to tell that from some of the stories that we have. I completely agree. You know, um, uh, first of all, you know, the co-founders at uh, Web TV, um, Bruce Leake and the late Phil Goldman, um, you know, the, and Joe was one of the first people to join after that. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone else, it was just amazing, the level of talent and the flexibility and the challenges that we had to overcome and how many things had to be invented. Same thing when we were doing um, a Catapult. I don't think a lot of people realize, or maybe you guys already know this, but Catapult was founded in May of 1994, and it was on store shelves with four games that we had reverse engineered completely by looking at the, uh, you know, the, the, the actual, uh, you know, uh, assembler code that's on the, on the ROMs and the cartridges. Uh, and when that was in stores in September, so that's really, you know, you're looking at a five month runtime from founding to having, um, you know, uh, custom silicon working, um, uh, having the first game server for consoles, having, you know, chat working, <laughs> having all the login dealing with how the uh, dial up and the phone matching would working, and then having these really complex real time games running with perfect synchronization over phone lines. And then, um, and then the boxes, you know, it takes time to make the molds for the plastic uh, and then the marketing uh, and then have that show up at a, a Toys R Us, which was still in business back then. Um, 
uh, was just an incredible thing. And, you know, we literally were just sleeping there and eating there, you know, around the clock. The general mode was to basically work for three days and not, you know, around the clock before you have a full night's sleep and you would do these catnap things. Remember these, Joe, of like 10, 15 oh, yeah. When when you, when the world became too confusing to understand what's going on, you know, uh, yeah. you tap cat now for 10, 15 minutes, just get a few REMs, and then you right. wake up again and you get back to work. Oh, what Steve, you, I remember you sleeping under your desk. Yep, I had a futon that folded yep. out of the desk. <laughs> and in fact, my uh, my wife uh, would come and she'd cook like um, uh, turkey meatballs and uh, spaghetti yes. and feed us. <laughs> yeah. And then, and there's no air conditioning, and this is the summer. And <laughs> remember that? Well, they turn off the air conditioning totally. uh, after about 6 or 7 p.m., right? Because they figured, yeah, late. Yeah. And and so we, yeah. You invented the Coolatron. I invented I think we all did the Coolatron, yes. <laughs> a colander. We'd get dry ice, and we'd put the dry ice in the colander and have a fan blow mm -hmm. over the dry ice to blow some cold air over us. So we could survive, uh, you know, California, um, you know, evenings uh, in the summer. And then we were just waiting until the, the air conditioner started back up in the morning. It was really, really hard. But everything Joe said about the quality of, of everybody working on it and, uh, and just how, how excited we were, um, it's all true. I mean, that, that's what drives you to, to those extremes. I mean, I know, I thought we were mainly going to talk about X-Band, but we, we got to talk, I mean, mainly going to talk about web TV, but we have to talk about X-Band because I think a lot of that insanity from X-Band um, definitely shaped the, the wonderful insanity we had at, at web TV. I mean, um, X-Band is kind of like a, a crazy fever dream, right? But then coming out of that, we, we had a, a blueprint, I think, for how to approach certain kinds of problems at, at web TV. Um, but just maybe a, a few more stories about X-Band, because uh, I have a hard time counting the number of times I, I woke up on that couch uh, in, the, in the, the main lobby, um, surrounded by fast food wrappers, you know, from whatever it had happened the night before. Um, and we had this fridge that was always stocked with healthy food, like Hot Pockets. Um, and uh, the, the X-Band, when I, when I joined X-Band, I remember the, the feature set for the product was pretty basic. It was like um, playing a game with your friends over the phone line. Steve, now you correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember it was like it was going to be 25 cents a play, and it was super basic, like just match, play, pay 25 cents, you're done. But over those few months between when we started and when we launched, there was this amazing feature creep that happened because everybody was so passionate and just wanted to get more and more stuff in there. Um, you know, we, we built the hardware keyboard and we had to do that because we wound up adding chat and we wound up adding uh, email and created the bandwidth newspaper. Um, and then all of the, the crazy visual effects and the, the music that was in the box. Um, and then like Steve said, we also had to, to build the hardware. There was a custom chip that was in there. I mean. Nowadays, to think about building a custom chip in, in that kind of time frame is, is just, uh, I mean, it's not insanity. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's just impossible. Uh, so to think that we did all that and, and built the hardware, the PC boards, and did all the agency approval and FCC testing, and like Steve said, the objectionable plastics and, and got the packaging created, and then actually got it out and into stores. Um, I... I have a hard time thinking about how you could actually do that today, but somehow we actually did. Yeah, no, and I, I don't even, <laughs> you know, thinking today about uh, the way projects work and also the expectations that people have about um, how specialized people's work is. You know, uh, software has grown up, um, hardware yeah. has grown up, and, you know, the, you know, there was no operating system on any of these game machines. Right, you know? right. You know, I don't think you realize people realize that today, you know, and there was no APIs. So mm -hmm. everything was doing, implementing everything uh, in code and everything was just totally optimized to try to squeeze whatever performance there was. And um, so, you know, everything that we did, of course, had to be built on top of that, including building user interface and so forth. And uh, there's a couple of things I want to mention that made it even more difficult. As we designed this thing, we realized that the cartridges were because we were trying to figure out why games were getting out of sync at two ends of the phone line 
And as we dug into that, what we found out is that the cartridges were not being manufactured to the proper spec. The ROMs, which have the game, game software, were not always, and sometimes the read that was done from the ROM just got the wrong data. Now, the thing about it is that these games, if they got the, most of those data, not instructions, they, they would usually just run on. For example, you know, they would, the game would play a little more randomly. That's okay. You're, it's only the people playing right there. But if we got two games on two ends of a phone line that have to match every single thing, the random number generators, every single step of the game has to be identical, the, the games would go off. Somebody would shoot a basketball or an, an NBA jam, and it would, it, would, it would make the shot in one game, but not in the other, because the way it read the, you know, uh, a particular byte was, was different. So we had to actually build in mechanisms to detect those differences and then send corrections over the phone line so the two things could remain in sync. And it was, it was not only were we doing this impossible task of bringing up this, uh, you know, the first console, um, you know, um, you know uh, um, multiplayer game system, we were actually fixing the bugs of the existing <laughs> system, you know, That's <laughs> right. bugs that nobody knew about, you know? So, yeah. and, and then one last thing I'll add to what Joe was saying about all these things we started adding into it. Yeah, but this is what happens when you're the pioneer, when you're, when you're the one that's the first one to find a new continent or, or whatever, or new or something. You know, when you find out what it is to go and set up console gaming and you find out what people are interested in, well, new ideas come about. Joe was right. We found the company. We didn't think of half the things we, were, we ended up doing um, uh, in the final product. But the thing is, the people not only were so capable in terms of implementing both software and hardware, and dealing with such low-level code, but they also were just very creative individuals in terms of thinking about things to do. There's nobody there that was just like writing code or taking instructions, oh, you know, do this or do that, or implement this one thing. We were all generalists, and all of us were capable of dealing with uh, things, you know, both the software and the hardware at the deepest levels. In fact, we had one company we had hired to do the out the uh, which was to uh, host the server that was going to do the matchup in the beginning of the players, and they couldn't keep up couldn't keep up with us, and it was going to delay our launch. So remember, Joe, we took we 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 let them go, and we create our own server. That's so right. here we were, like weeks from launch, and here we are creating the first console game match server and like supporting, you know, all, all the different things that had to be done. It was nuts, but uh, what we created was something that was really cool. Right, and I think it's, it's kind of mind blowing, like to think about how when we were doing this, there, there was no GitHub, there was very little open source software that was relevant to what we were trying to do. And when we started on both of these projects, we basically just started with the hardware data books and the reset vector uh, and an understanding of how the, um, the different pieces of hardware worked, uh, like graphics and sound and stuff like that. But, but that was it, you know, and, and we had to write all the code from scratch. And that was both incredibly freeing and powerful um, and, and also uh, requires uh, an incredible amount of focus and attention to detail. And I think that that attention to detail was, was not just on the code side, but also on the way that the graphics were, were produced and designed, right? So on, on X-Band, it, uh, it was this crazy guy named Joey Stockline who was responsible for the look and feel of the UI. And I remember going into Joey's office multiple times, and he would always sit in the dark, and he had this enormous, like, 21-inch, which is not enormous now, uh, CRT. And, and it was not uncommon to see Joey with his eyeball like, you know, two inches away from the screen because he was just tweaking individual pixels. Um, and then at Web TV, uh, the, the designer of the look and feel was a, an amazing uh, gentleman, uh, the late Keith Ulfs, who had been at Next. Uh, and he did all of that uh, original graphic design look and feel work for the Web TV box um, on a Next machine because he had built his own graphics editing tools on the next box. So you had a graphic designer who had built his own graphics tools. Uh, and, and there's some really cool stuff that he did that a lot of people probably don't realize, like the mailbox that's in, um, in the web TV UI that you see on the homepage. That was a real mailbox. And it was sitting outside of his cube for a long time. And uh, Joey, actually, maybe that's how the Phil Berger picture got taken, because it was really hard to digitize um, you know, real images back then, but, but Joey had, not Joey, uh, but Keith had 
um, a video digitizer for his next machine. And he would take pictures of physical objects like that mailbox, and then he would paint over them uh, using his graphics tool. So he would create something that was synthetic, but it had the soul of something that was, that was real. And that was just an, an example of like the kind of amazing work that these people did with a lot of tools that were completely homegrown. No, I completely agree. And, you know, I think a lot of people also don't realize uh, the constraints we are dealing with. Um, you know, there's a tiny amount of memory. I don't even remember what was in the uh, Sega Genesis. Maybe you do, Joe. But I do know that Web TV had two megabytes of RAM. And uh, of that, I think 600 kilobytes was used for the frame buffer, you know, put the display up on the TV, which right. left 1.4 megabytes of total RAM to run. And we had to create our own operating system, et cetera. And then, the, um, and then there was two megabytes of ROM and web TV and one megabyte of flash, right? Right. right. So yeah. we had to implement uh, a full, we had an operating system to run the thing. Uh, that would just boot and work all the time and had to implement an, uh, a complete browser, had to go in, uh, for example, the, the versions of JavaScript that existed were way too big. So uh, I don't remember who wrote it, but we wrote a, a whole new JavaScript interpreter from scratch. We wrote, um, um, like a lot of people were starting browsers, like Microsoft created their first um, Internet Explorer browser by starting from Mosaic. Mosaic was way too big and slow for us. So we had to really write all the HTML uh, browsing uh, you know, code from scratch. And then we had to write, um, like Flash was the big deal then. There was animated things in Flash. And we wrote all of the Flash decoding uh, from scratch. And the thing about it, this is one thing that's interesting that we were able to do with Web TV. Um, Web TV worked through a proxy server, which again was a, was a pioneering thing that had not been done before. In fact, I'm not even sure we had a good name for it at the time. But, the deal is when um, you went to go to a, a web page, it would actually go to our servers, which would go and, and uh, um, process the web page. And for example, it would know that you're going to a television screen, which is much lower resolution. A lot of stuff is off the edge of the screen. So we would go and re-res things to something smaller. And this is one of the really cool things. Very often flash animations were way too, I just had too many curves in them for them to fit in our memory system. And we would go and re-res the flash animations. In other words, draw curves that were lower resolution. That's all you need for a TV screen, right? Well, I have higher resolution than you need. And then it would send the flash animation down, um, uh, converted on, on the web TV servers. And the funny thing about it that made it that the web TV browsing was faster than any other browsing over a dial-up modem. Because if you think about it, everybody else who was using a dial-up modem to a browser on a PC or a Mac they were getting whatever resolution the website was, you know, which very often was higher resolution than the screen they were using. Whereas with uh, web TV, it was getting, um, you know, extremely, uh, you know, highly optimized um, HTML. And the, the, of course, the internet connection to the, uh, to the proxy servers was a much higher bandwidth connection than could possibly be available in home at that time. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying that, you know, and it's not like we planned web TV that way. It, it, yeah. it's, and it was it was it was necessary in order to make it right. work. Right. Well, and, and then when we did Danger and we made the sidekick, there were some similar problems. We had a very slow processor. We had very little memory. Uh, and the first sidekicks ran on GPRS, which was a really slow um, cellular now digital cellular network. And we did a similar thing. We had a proxy server, like Steve described, that would transcode content. Um, for the device, you know, so we could make the, the most efficient use of, of the network connection. Um, but uh, but it, it's true, you know, like it was a, it was an incredibly clever uh, approach to solving this problem that otherwise would have been intractable. Um, we just wouldn't have been able to support kind of the, the native internet with the limitations that had to be in the box from a from a price point of view. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that also we implemented was a full mail system. And it's kind of funny because Hotmail was acquired by Microsoft roughly the same time that uh, uh, Web, TV, Web TV was acquired. Hotmail had very few people working there because the one thing they did was HTML. They did it very well, obviously, and a lot of people were using it. And uh, we were acquired for everything we did, hardware, software, you know, the full yeah. browser experience, the full supply chain manufacturing, FCC, yeah. 
Oh my god. Uh, and uh, and also HTML email. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, our valuation was not much higher than theirs. So it was... <laughs> hey, you know, one of the one of the guys who did Hotmail, um, I think his name's Sabir Bhatia. He was actually a summer intern at Apple. The one of the summers that I was there as well. That dude sat like back to back with me in a queue. Just such yeah. a small world. It is, and so. Well, anyways, we could keep telling stories, or or someone could ask some questions. I don't know what you guys yeah. want to do. It's your time. Yeah. What are folks interested in? Hold on. If you guys have any um, any suggestions, go ahead and put them in the um, meet and greet chat. We'll take a look at them. Well, while we're waiting for that, we can we can tell some more stories, I guess. Um, well, Joe, do you uh, the photos you have? Well, if well, you guys uh, wanna, if you guys wanna get dangerous here and. Uh, we could move everyone. Wait, Natalie, how big? What? How big are our voice chats? Can we even move all these people into a, a video room? Or hold on, I okay. It's it's pretty big. All right. <laughs> all right. So, would you guys mind if I dropped us all now? I'm going to ask the audience while we're in this chat, I'm going to trust you guys to not just jump on microphone and uh, try to steal the show. Um, and uh, Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Natalie. Um, all right. Well, we're going to move. Natalie, do you want to move us all there? Uh, okay. Get lost. Where, where do we go? Whoops. Oh, look at that. That's pretty cool. Super cool. There we go. Hey, guys. Um, all right. Can everybody hear us okay? Tommy, is it? Yep. I can hear you. I can hear Steve. Can anyone see me? <laughs> yep. We can see both of you. All right. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, Steve was talking about these photos. Let me show you guys some stuff. And then Steve brought a whole bunch of stuff for show and tell. Uh, so let's see if I can share this. All right. Can you guys see this? Um, Steve, you want to guess what year this was? I actually don't know, but this was some web TV uh, company meeting. Um, we're having lunch, obviously, and there's a very young Joe Britt and a younger Steve Perlman. Um, but uh, we would we would have these kinds of events. Oh, and by the way, this is a, a photo I took a few minutes ago um, with my smartphone of a physical photo. Like I I found a box of old photos which are weird, they're like printed on paper and stuff. And so I just like took a picture and put them in a Google slideshow. Um, let's see, here's another photo. Seven, I think when we were that size. Yeah, this is at Lytton in Palo Alto, for um, sure. 19, I think it was be just before we, it must have been, probably was 1996 actually, come to think of it. It's possible it's 97, because we began to get too big for Palo Alto, we moved to Mountain View. Right, yeah, into the old Netflix building. That was, That's or right. not Netflix, no, Netscape building, Netscape building. Yeah. Right. Uh, so just uh, Steve talking to the company. These, these were great events. Everybody always had a great time. Um, here's a photo of Steve, Bruce, and Phil. Um, do you remember the, what this photo was for, Steve? It was for, I think, Fortune Magazine. Okay. Or something like that. And they did another photo, which is uh, not this one. They had the three of us because we got Web TV working on a. We, we happened to there was a an old um, there was an old museum that we actually moved into that had all sorts of old technology and stuff, and they had a, one of the first color TVs ever made. And we said we're going to get Web TV working on that thing. We have to, and we did. 
And so yeah. they have a picture of the three of us around a color TV. It's, it's, it's actually, maybe you'll find it on the internet. Um, and I remember we had to go and modulate it on, on the TV you know, channel. There was no, obviously, video input then. So we did it over RF. But uh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> I think that TV also had a very round screen. So a lot of the corners got chopped off. That's right. Yeah, back then, they didn't have the, um, you know, when the screen, when the beam sweeps, uh, if you're sweeping it, it really would be on the edge of a sphere. And that's the way the first, particularly color picture tubes were made. And then later on, they found a way to do autofocus as the beam went across to make the beams, it makes the TVs more flat. Uh, and finally, completely flat TVs, just in time for the world to switch over to plasma and LCDs and ultimate OLEDs. Steve, I remember like when I was a kid, like all popular science and, and radio electronics, they would have these articles about TVs that were going to hang on the wall like a picture, which was just mind blowing, you know, having taken apart a bunch of TVs before. And you may remember um, Sinclair, Clive Sinclair, right? The same guy who made the, the Sinclair ZX80 and ZX81. He had in the 80s a flat TV, and it was the coolest thing. It was a little portable TV, but it was a total hack. He basically took the neck of the thing and he folded it 90 degrees and he put the phosphor against uh, that curved side. So he was shooting and he would look down through the glass onto the phosphor, but he was able to make a little flat TV. Yep. Uh, yeah, but so the, uh, <laughs> it is true. And we were dealing with, you know, cathode ray tubes and, and hooking stuff up to them. And uh, by the way, there was also challenges with um, high voltage ground loops. Uh, one of the things that when we were doing our beta testing, we hooked up, someone hooked up a web TV to a rear projection TV in their home and it caught on fire. <laughs> and so we went over, looked at why it was, and we saw, oh, I see there's a ground loop here. Uh, and we bought him a new TV for, um, and then we, fortunately it wasn't any, anything serious and he was a very technical person. And we um, changed our design of our power supply what was, and then, of course, it never happened again. That's why you do thorough beta testing. What's interesting uh, is it took another, I think, three years or something like that for AOL. We tried to do a deal with AOL, who was the big cheese at the time, but we could never do it. They were determined to go on. They said, we don't need you. We're going to do it. And they did AOL TV with RCA. Yeah. And the first month they came out, they had, you can read the press about this. All of these AOL TVs, uh, when, the, when you, the boxes, when you hook them up to a... Uh, a project, rear projection TV, they would catch on fire. <laughs> RCA Corporation did not do the beta testing that we did and figure out that a computer and a TV, when you get to the analog stuff, are different things. Because we really were the first meeting of those two worlds of, of television and, um, and computers. And, and AOL TV never really came back after that, which was kind of interesting. And then RCA came to us, and they um, actually, I have one right here. They made um, a web TV. With, uh, and in the end, it's so funny, they became, RCA wouldn't do a deal with us and neither would AOL, but in the end they became um, our, our largest manufacturer. And then at the end of the, day, end of the Web TV's days with MSN TV, if I'm correct, they were the only manufacturer left. But I have, um, so anyways, oh, Joe, you maybe want to keep going through your photos because I want to make sure we leave enough time for you and yeah, I mean, it's especially ironic that RCA would have that problem, right? Like a classic television manufacturer. Yes. <laughs> so this, um, you guys may have seen pictures of the box that's on top of this TV. This was called the Mondo box. Uh, and it was actually named after the mechanical engineer who designed the sheet metal enclosure. His, enclosure. His name was uh, Armando. Um, and uh, these were the, the first prototypes that we used uh, for people's in-home testing. So we actually had enough of the system up and running uh, that a bunch of our friends and family could, could take them home and hook them up and maybe blow up some projection TVs like Steve was talking about. Um, but the, the guts of this thing uh, were essentially like what went into the, the original Sony, the very first Sony web TV box. And then you can see hanging out the front, there's kind of a funny smart card. Um, these original boxes didn't have uh, a UART for debugging. So we, we did this total hack where we would bit bang um, serial out on, yes, that's one of the, the Sony boxes. We would bit bang serial out on one of the smart card signals. Uh, and so we had these crazy debug rigs that would plug in the smart card slot, and then you could basically get like kernel messages out of the system as it was running. 
And then this is a shot in the hardware lab. Uh, that's Bob Reidenauer, and he's debugging something on a, on a board. But you can see uh, beyond him, this, there's a box that's got some red LED, display, red LED displays. That's a telephone line simulator. Um, and not much call for those these days, but we use those a lot at, at both X-Band and, uh, and Web TV, um, just for tricking the boxes into thinking they will really dial in the phone number. And then up above him, you can see a huge Hewlett Packard logic analyzer. And then next to that, it looks like a high speed oscilloscope. And then next to that is the obligatory stereo speaker because there was, there was kind of always music playing in the lab uh, when we were working. And here's another picture of Bob uh, along with Tim Bucher. And Bob is smoking a cigar. And what they're doing is um, the web TV boxes use what's called convection cooling. So it means there's no fan and you're counting on the, the heat rising off the components in the box to pull air through and create like a chimney. Um, and this, this prototype, if you look really closely, you'll see the board's not populated. It actually had a bunch of big power resistors in it uh, that were just running off of the power supply to make it hot. And then Bob would blow smoke into it, into this plexiglass version of the enclosure, so we could see how the, the heat was going to move inside of it. Yeah, you may then a picture, Joe. You may well, notice yeah. there, there's this connector. You see it through the plastic, and this yeah. is the connector yeah. on the early TV boxes. Because we had imagined that there'd be accessories that we connect to the end here, but that never really materialized. There, there were there were two accessories, and only one was publicly available. For the original box, there was a parallel printer port that would plug on the side, uh, right. so you could plug in a, a parallel printer. Um, and then there was also a, uh, a debugger that was called Pico. Now, oh, and since we're talking about that, the, the parts in a lot of the, the web TV designs were, were named after the dogs of, um, of employees. And so uh, there was one chip that was called Solo, which was named after Steve's dog. Um, and then there was a chip on the debugger board that was named Pico, and that was named after Susie Brown's dog. Uh, and Susie Brown was, was a hardware engineer uh, that we had all known from from Apple, who um, who was part of Web TV. Right. The Solo One and Solo Two was, if I remember correctly, was the one for the uh, uh, Web TV Plus. Yes. And a lot of people don't know, and I'm, I'm sad that it was never implemented. But Solo Two um, had a full um, uh, a graphics engine built into it that would have allowed Web TVs, if we had the drivers and the code, to be a video game. Um, they, you know, they, they, you could create uh, sprites that were screen sized or move them around. They were very, they, they were used for a very few things, like this uh, animation capability. I mean, but really, it would have been something that could have competed with a PlayStation 1, um, yeah. and maybe even on its way to a PlayStation 2. But the, the um, th but of course, you know, the company had to focus on what it was going to focus on when we became part of Microsoft then they really wanted us to focus on uh, what we were doing. And then they wanted to go and introduce Xbox. And then, interesting enough, Xbox was done in, in Redmond, in Washington, but it was not as successful as they had hoped. And they brought Xbox 2 hardware down to the Web TV team. So the, the Web TV team designed the X, Xbox uh, 360. And um, so, you know, Although it wasn't using the Solo 2 chip, <laughs> it was using at that point, I think, an NVIDIA chip with an Intel processor, right? I think that's right, yeah. Yeah. I but you're right, it was a lot of the same guys from WebTV. I thought that 360 used a, a power PC. Oh, you're right, it did. Oh, you're right. It yeah, used, 360 did. Yeah. It was an Intel chip, right? Xbox. You're, you're, Tommy, you're right, yeah. And, um, yep, and then, um, uh, but the thing that was interesting was when we were at Microsoft, here we were this division. You know, I, one of the things I had to do was build, a, you know, find a place for it and build a campus for Microsoft in Silicon Valley after they acquired the company. So we, I did that. It was one of the things I did. Things you never expect you'd ever have to do in your life. Uh, and uh, so all of Microsoft's stuff was down there. And then we kind of became their television division. And we did other things, you know, for cable TV. We did the satellite TV receivers like... Uh, Actually, the, the, the RCA thing I showed you was a satellite TV receiver, and here's a, uh, a Sony uh, direct TV receiver here. And uh, somewhere, I, I couldn't find one quickly enough to bring it up here with the basement. 
I have a Dish web TV receivers that were, we made as well, the Dish player. And what was cool about all of these things is they all, of course, implemented uh, digital video recording, you know, like a TiVo or a Replay TV. But instead of digitizing the video that, that came in, which is what the first TiVos and Replays did, it actually was using the digital MPEG-2 that was coming off the satellite and recording it on disk. And um, so we, we ended up implementing all those different things. Uh, and God, when I think about how many products were released in such a short amount of time, and it just doesn't happen anymore. Um, no. but yeah, it's mind blowing. Like Dish Player was actually the, the, the last product I worked on at Web TV. Um, and that was it was a it was a super fun box because like the ultimate TV that Steve was showing, it was essentially a satellite receiver and an L C two glued together. Um, and the, the graphics that Steve was talking about, the graphics engine, it had this really uh, cool system that Steve had been working on for a, a long time. Uh, it was basically a, a scanline renderer, right, Steve? Yes, it was a yeah. it was a chip that I did at Apple called QuickScan, but um, I was uh, Apple did, wasn't I wasn't able to uh, ship it at Apple, and they let me have non-exclusive rights to the technology, so I took it with me, and I was trying uh, I tried it at General Magic to get it out there, and then um, Solo One didn't implement everything, but Solo Two did. And it was, the, the deal was that, um, you know, we had very, very little RAM back then. And, and I don't think people can possibly relate to what it was like to work with, you know, uh, you know hundreds of kilobytes or megabytes, single digit megabytes of RAM when you're dealing with, you know, 24 bit images and so forth. So what it would do is it would um, have uh, the various sprites, a sprite could be as large as the whole screen uh, and it could be at any depth. It could be one, two, four, eight, you know, 16 bits, you know, uh, or 24 bit color. And then it would go and when, as the TV was scanning out, you know, as you're going line by line, it would go and grab the data out of, um, out of RAM and pile it all into this one line buffer that it had. In other words, you know, so for all the layers of the sprites that intersected with that line. Now, the other thing it did, which is really cool, again, never utilized, is it would decompress as it was going and doing that. So, for example, if you used, um, uh, if you used, well, one type of compression, of course, is just using a lookup table, like a 4-bit or 8-bit lookup table. It would decompress the four, 24 bits, and it could blend it with the lower layers and so forth. But then the other thing it really did, which is pretty cool, was it, it could do um, decompression using, um, it's called uh, vector quantization. So vector quantization, you can Google it if you want to see, but basically what it would do is instead of doing a lookup table of just, you know, single color entries, it would do a, a four by four block, eight by eight block. And of course it could do rotations and things like that. So that meant when it could really render a, you know, a shape in, in perspective or rotate it, and its texture could be compressed using vector quantization so that you're getting this 24 bit texture rendered on this image and it would do its line by line. So the deal about it is that this chip, the Solo 2 chip, which was hardly ever utilized, would actually uh, decompress the image into a scan line as the TV was scanning down and then would throw away that image and create another image for the next line. So it never had to store the 24-bit results of all the decompression, all the layering, and all the translucency and the blending, except on the chip in one line. And everything else remained in incompressed form with the ability to move around and rotate and blend in RAM. Um, and so essentially what you were doing is storing the final rendered image in the phosphor on the screen of the TV. There never was a time when the entire image was fully decompressed into RAM. So we were therefore able to do what would normally be done, and I, if, to my understanding, was probably always done in video games uh, to this day. Certainly it's done, that's the way GPUs do it because they have the RAM to do it we would render the entire image without ever using a large amount of RAM. And that allowed us to go and keep the, the, the memory footprint extremely low for this, which was the only possible way to introduce a product at the time. Sadly, um, a, a chip like that needs a lot of software and it needs a dedicated team and a lot of focus in order to use. And that just wasn't gonna happen. Um, you know, first of all, there were really good GPUs that were coming out from NVIDIA, I guess ATI at the time, I'm trying to remember where they were, but anyways, and, um, you know, the decision was to just go and use it for, I think, some screensavers and a couple other things. And that was it.
I think it was used for two things. The, the screensaver where the web TV logos rotate and bounce around the screen. Right. Uh, and the other thing was when you, on, an, on LC2, when you flip between TV world and web world and the whole thing like flips over, that, that right. was done. That, yeah. And those were both, that was all written by uh, Sean Callahan. He was the guy who did the code uh, for right. both of those products. Yeah. There you go. So it just goes to show you that there's, there's, there was so much technology inside of web TV that's never used. We had the smart card, never used. I mean, today, you know, our credit cards are finally all switched over to smart cards, but it was in there. In fact, we had that with catapults as well. Um, that's right. You know, <laughs> that was never utilized either, you know. <laughs> yeah. These catapults and modems that are translucent, the, the few ones we shot like that. Yeah, the developer units. Developer units, yeah. And I saw, actually, you holding that up reminds me, um, it may have been Natalie that discovered this. There was a, a feature on X-Band called Joggler Vision, where we would do a persistence of vision display on those seven LEDs. And so if you were using X-Band, you would see the LEDs kind of flickering. And if you swept your eyes past it really quickly, you would see like uh, whatever message. It, by default, it was like the X-Band, just it said X-Band, and it would kind of float in the air. But we made it so that you could you could download you know whatever you wanted to. And I remember like during development we had a lot of fun with that, like sending out messages, you know, like hail Satan and stuff like that, just that would make the kids all laugh when they saw it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah. So yeah, this would be you know so we had um, seven LEDs vertically, and yeah. of course if these LEDs are pulsating and you sweep your eyes across, yeah. you would read a message uh, drawn in the yep. air. Um, as a um, uh, like a uh, five by seven dot matrix, right? That was called Joggler Vision. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, well, I got, I got one more photo, which is Bowser, uh, the Web TV Rabbit. This was Phil Goldman's rabbit. Um, Steve Perlman, uh, before the, this call, was was remembering a fantastic story about how Bowser saved the company. Steve, I think you should tell everybody about one. Okay, so Bowser saved web TV. So remember, <laughs> I mentioned that we were in this um, this old museum, really, and the the museum actually itself was in was an old BMW dealership. So most of the space was in the back, which was a garage area. So we set up cubicles there, and then we didn't have electric power for all the different cubes. So we would go and have one uh, power strip plugged into another, you know, in a chain. We got a surprise inspection by the Palo Alto um, um, the Palo Alto fire marshal. Yeah. And he, yeah, and he said, this is unsafe. There could be a spark that comes from things that light the building on fire. You need to shut this down right now. So I said, whoa, 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 we'll get it fixed. We'll bring in electricians. They'll put in proper, you know, cabling. But that's going to take, you know, a few weeks and we have to get an inspection. I think he says, I'm like, it doesn't matter. You got to shut it down right now. I'm like, we tried and everything. So then he's heading out and he notices Bowser who would wander around. Bowser was never potty trained. And so, and I would walk around in bare feet and I would always get his gifts between my toes. But anyways, the, um, there, he says, is that a, um, is a Norwegian or something rabbit? I forget. It was some sort of breed of rabbit. I said, yeah, I think so. And then he went up and he was like really interested in a cuddly rabbit and stroking it. And he says, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I keep rabbits too. And then I said, get Phil real quick. So <laughs> Phil came over and Phil starts talking rabbit shop talk with this guy. They were both really into rabbits. You know, this is Phil's rabbit. And then the, something that Phil had told us a long time before that we just thought he was joking about. He said, this rabbit got some sort of a disease which caused it to lose half of its intelligence. <laughs> had no intelligence before, now it lost half of that? Okay. <laughs> but anyways, the, um, uh, the, the fire marshal says to Phil, did he get this disease? Oh, did he lose half his intelligence? Phil said, yeah, I'm afraid so. The guy said, oh, I feel so bad for you. Like, oh my God, he actually, it was real. So then after they finished talking about rice, says, you know what? I can give you guys a break. I want you to get an electrician in here right away and I'm gonna come back in, two, in a week and make sure that you've got an installation. You can keep running. Now, if we had been shut down for three weeks at that very moment, we yeah. had critical schedules we had to meet, we had to get the product yeah. out, we would have not gotten funding and none of web TV wouldn't have happened. So this, this rabbit in this picture here saved web TV. Thank you, Bowser. Yes. Yes, yes. So do you want to open up for some questions? Absolutely. Sure. And by the way, thank you guys so much for uh, coming out and helping us do this. 
Um, now let me figure out here how we're how we're best gonna handle. Uh, we have so many questions now that I can't I can't even scroll through all of these. So um, let me see here. I'll tell you guys what if you can um, pick your favorite questions and DM them to me right now. Okay, where, where do we see the um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them to you. I'd like to be able to unmute people and have them ask, but sure. we might. It might actually be better for us to go back to the stage channel to do this, because then we can actually just move people up. Okay, whatever, whatever you want to do. So let's, like sorry, we're uh, we're new to this whole Discord event thing, so. <laughs> You want me to show a couple of expanded paraphernalia things before we oh, switch? Oh, yes. Up? Actually, before we switch. Yeah, start that. All right. I'm going to show just a few things. I'm holding it to the camera. Can everyone see my camera? Yes. All right. Yeah. So um, here is, I think, a, a rare expand keyboard. This is Very it. Good. The Sega Genesis. Um, I think this was just one of the... Development ROMs. Uh, uh, they, these are EPROMs, if I remember correctly, that we were doing development with. And um, this is a X-Band mug, all right? And a uh, X-Band t-shirt. Nice. All right? With, you know, uh, a message. So we were giving those out. We would give those out at uh, stores. Uh, to people to try to get them interested in it. Here's the uh, Genesis box. You guys have seen. Here's the. Uh, sorry, that's that's the Super Nintendo box, and here's the Genesis box. Um, and then this was uh, some promotional material material done by our Japanese affiliate. And uh, this is the last X band I found. So I kept an eye on it, you know, and, and of course, you know, it, it was all of our babies, and, and this is the last one I found at a store. And I got it because it was marked down to $2.90. <laughs> 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 nice. Nice. Well, so to, well the last one that was available at retail. <laughs> it's funny because uh, to those of us who have uh, done development with the x band we know the power that is in that little box. It's so yeah. crazy that it's for two ninety. You could do a lot for two dollars and ninety cents. That's right. So here's the Philips Magnavox Web TV. In case you haven't seen it, has a it's kind of design on the back, on the top. Ah, put, them, put this one down here. So here's what it looks like on the top, and here's the connectors on the back. This is a Web TV Plus, if I remember correctly, right? Uh. Internet television. It, it had a print port, and it, yeah, because it had um, a video. It had RF in and out. It could two channels, and it had a disk drive. And um, I'm going to tell one quick disk drive story before I, we switch over. But here is the uh, Sony version of that. And um, then the other thing I wanted to show is um, this is a photo that we took. I don't know if people will be able to see it too well, but I'll hold it up. Um, and what we did is we um, we uh, went to a um, a park near our offices in Mountain View, and these are all of Web TV employees, and they all uh, had shirts of a certain color. And we had a helicopter take a photo of all of us. So that's the entire team that Web TV grew to uh, at some point. We had a, a photo taken. So anyway, so these are all... Uh, little Mentos. Uh, the one district thing I'll mention to you is that, you know, we were acquired by uh, Microsoft and, you know, um, it was weird um, because I was, um, um, it was actually, um, um, I spoke, Bill Gates called my house. We had already spoken to people at Microsoft. By the way, one thing I'll say about Phil Goldman, Web TV would boot in five seconds because he wrote a very simple operating system. And here we are talking to Microsoft. We're just looking to partner with, you know, and or maybe the investor. We didn't imagine they'd acquire us. But they, um, um, I remember at the time, I think it was Windows 95 was around. And it took forever to start up. You may remember, it just took forever until it actually started. 
And so we said, look, got to be cool. This is Microsoft. They're a huge company. There's an executive there. There's a couple engineers and everything who are looking to the executive. We got to like, you know, pretend we're adults. And um, the uh, one of the, the, we said, look, hey, we'll ask any questions you want. So one of the engineers asked, so how is it that you get web TV to boot in five seconds? <laughs> Bill said, I'll tell you if, if you explain how you can get web, uh, Windows 95 to boot in five minutes. <laughs> Christ. I'm like, what are you doing? And there was silence. And we're like, that's it. Microsoft, they're going to crush us after that kind of comment. And nobody said anything. And the engine, the lower level guys at Microsoft also were afraid to say anything. But then the executives start to laugh. And he started to laugh. And then everyone followed him. And later on, when I saw, well, I shouldn't really say this, when I saw Dr. Evil, when he would tell jokes in the Austin Power movies, it was very similar. We were all waiting for <laughs> him to get a laugh. That joke, but then I'll, but the thing about it was interesting when Bill called. Uh, um, I was at home and I'm always working. It was, and it was it was Easter Sunday, and it was in 1997. And I remember I heard the phone ring. I was busy coding something or whatever. And my wife was downstairs. She said she answered the phone. And she says, "Steve, it's for you. It's Bill Gates." I said, "What?" He says, "Bill Gates on the phone for you." It's so like, oh, oh, okay. So I took the call. I said, "Hello." I had never met him before. So we talked and talked and talked. And I told him about, you know, our future things. You're about to introduce the Web TV Plus with a disk drive. So why do you want a disk drive in a consumer product? So I said, well, we're doing, you know, things that are eventually going to lead to the point where we're able to record video shows on a hard disk. He says, you can do that? You mean the things you record on a videotape? So I said, absolutely. And there's going to be, you know, other applications and and more advanced games and things like that. At, the po at that point, we were imagining the Solo 2 chip was going to be used for gaming. And um, he says, OK, that's it. Let's go talk about an acquisition. I said, what? And so, <laughs> and so that was uh, the disk drive. The idea that we had were doing that and everything else really led to that. And uh, he was really blown away. And then, of course, we became this part of Microsoft. And they did give us the autonomy for a long time to do some really crazy things. In time, it became just part of the larger entity. And it's hard for a big company like that to, you know, to move as quickly. They've got a lot of moving parts. And, um, um, you know, but I can tell you that it was kind of weird how we ended up together with them. And it was very awkward. Uh, and in the end, though, I think it was a good thing for everyone. And it was, it was, great. It was a great experience there. And um, uh, getting to work with Bill just before he retired and, and everyone else and eventually being able to do, as I said, the Xbox 360 hardware. Although that was after I left, I think, when most of that work was done. All right, with that, yeah. I think my stories and my, my stuff to show. Well, I, let, me, let me add a couple of things to that. Because with the hard drive, the other thing I remember, Steve, was we were going to trickle data onto the hard drive over the vertical blank from the TV signal, right? So like over the course of many days, different content or applications could be downloaded to the hard drive just from normal TV broadcasts. That's correct. And we were uh, PBS, which was not restricted by, uh, by a giant corporation like ABC, NBC, and CBS, who are the big broadcasters. PBS had, a, had a, a means in place where they could insert data during the vertical blanking interval. And the Web TV Plus was designed to go and uh, re uh, receive that data. And, and Joe's exactly correct. If you, if you have a long enough download, you can download anything. All right. So, um, then, we, let's, yeah, go ahead. No, no, questions. It's question time. Okay. I'll tell you yeah. what. Let me, um, let's all jump over and to the, uh, back to the stage channel. Again, I promise, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, this is the first time we've ever done something like this. And we just learned some, some lessons. So I'm going to move you guys over. I'm going to move you guys over. Everyone else can manually jump up to the, mm -hmm. Stage channel. Can, oh, hey. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, Steve? Can, I'm here. 
Hold on here. Um, do we know where Joe is? He looks like a a, a normal person, you know, and a, a, a part of the, part of the audience. You may have to invite him. I got an invitation. I drag Joe from the user list. <laughs> He's autotelic. Hold on, guys. I apologize. And I can't hear audio right now. I can only, I think I can only talk. Hey, Natalie, can you invite Autotelic to the stage? Hello? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me, Tommy? Check, check, check. Uh, Steve, can you talk for a second? Yes, I'm talking. Uh, Test two, one, there two, three. There you go. Good. Yep. Okay. Now we're good. Joe, can you hear me? I can. Hello, everyone. All right. So, guys, um, we're gonna do question and answer. I know that we had a big between meet and greet chat and um, and the QA thread. We have a lot of cool questions. I'm going to start with Supersat because I know he's, a, he's a, a pretty crazy engineer. Supersat, hopefully you have some audio ready. If not, I can ask a question for you. But I'm going to move you up momentarily. Hold on here. Can you... I don't know if he wants to... Oh, uh, okay. So uh, Superset wants to know how you guys managed to get the ASIC manufactured, ASIC manufactured that fast. For which expand or for Web TV? Uh, I believe that was... Um... Uh, Joe, that was uh, Roscoe. I think that was, we started with an FPGA and then we, in parallel, had a Gatorade fab. Is that right? I think that's right. But there's another thing I remember that doesn't exist anymore, which was that company Chip Express. Right. So Chip yeah. Express, like like when we, were at, when we were at Apple, Steve, do you remember how long it would take to turn an ASIC? Early days, six months minimum. Right. And, and at Web T, at X-Band, Anyway, there was this company called Chip Express, and they had some insane workflow where they could take the design files like you would normally use for building a, a full-blown ASIC. And there were, there were limitations on what you could actually do, but it, as long as you stayed within those limitations, they could get a chip back to you in, I want to say like a week, something like that. Is that right? It was something very quick. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think it may have been that it was... Um, I'm trying to remember, it may have been like a Gatorade where they burned away some fuses or something. You know, yeah. I don't remember yeah. exactly what it was. But we, we went and looked at what the options were. I had done a board at, uh, at a, a product at Apple called the, um, the Apple II video overlay card, right. which <laughs> the, the, the VP of engineering at Apple told me that, uh, he said, we, keep, we don't have time to work on this. Either you get it working in a month or we're canceling the project. And I, <laughs> and I and so, and Xilinx, the FPGA company, had just introduced their FPGAs. And so we worked around the clock and we got two FPAG, FPAs done in a month. The other thing that we started doing at Apple was using, um, um, you know, design languages and compilers. Yes. And, uh, and so, and Roscoe worked very closely with me um, in those groups. And then he joined General Magic, then he joined um, uh, Catapult as well. He didn't join. He didn't come with us to uh, Web TV, though. But a bunch of the a bunch of the guys um, later at Web TV uh, were ex Apple folks who had gone through 3DO, uh, and I think 3DO had some some similar kinds of adventures. Right. All right. Move up. Next question. Yep. I think we. Uh, hello, Mumble. We're going to invite you up. You had a couple interesting questions and. You've got your hand raised, so I'm going to push you up here. Um, let me know if that goes through. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Hey, yes. Hello, hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. hello. <laughs> it's 
First of all, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to talk with you two as a general fan of both X Band, Web TV, and all that stuff, even on live back in May. I remember watching some YouTubers talking about it. Um, so I'll try and pick. I don't know if you wanted me to say all the questions, Tommy, or did you just want me to say like three questions out of all of them? Or, um, because I have a lot of them. Okay. Well, uh, try to pick three of your favorites so we can give everybody. I saw some of your questions aren't too crazy so yeah yeah okay well <laughs> well i'll try you know okay so um i guess the first question i would ask is let me just check on the list um there were rumors at the time that sony was going to support the x-band why was that can sony on the x-band sony was going to support yeah. the x-band oh you mean like on um, um playstation yeah well at oh. least there was like talk on the uh, broadband uh, news, I think, at the time. Okay, so, well, Joe, I, I can answer one thing, and that is, you know, the hack that we did was in, to insert our, you know, adapter between the, you know, the ROM and the video game as it was being read by the, uh, the processor so that we could go and insert instructions to change the behavior. So instead of using, say, two controllers that were local, one of the, you know, the, one of the inputs would then be sent over the phone line to this, you know, to this other thing. We also add our other code to go and control it. And so when we went with the, when you went to the PlayStation, which of course the innovation there was using a CD-ROM for a game, there was no place to insert with the, the, uh, the, um, the you know, the X-Band technology in there. And so you really were relying on Sony to want to go and set up their own um, game service. So there was no opportunity to jump in there. Um, as as we were able to with Sega and with um, um, and Nintendo. Go ahead with okay. your next question. Yes. So the next question that I had in mind was: Before Microsoft bought Danger Out, who were the other contenders that wanted a piece of that cake? You could say in a way. Danger or Web TV? Danger. Danger, we had actually filed to go public, and, and that was when Microsoft came along. Um, and candidly, we were very surprised slash um, skeptical that that was actually going to happen because uh, the Danger system was all built using Java. Now, it was, it was actually this kind of uh, funky Java runtime that, that we had created uh, that did a bunch of weird stuff to get really good performance out of like a 50 megahertz or 7. Um, so we were really just using Java for the compiler front end for like writing stuff. And then we would we would take the output of the compiler and then run it through this post-linking step to turn it into something that we could run on the devices. But still, just the fact that we were using Java for core development was um, uh, was was something that would, would kind of run against what Microsoft was into at the time. Um, but the only other... Um, candidate for an acquirer that, that we knew about was, uh, I think Verizon was kind of looking at, at, at acquiring uh, Danger, but, um, but that never really went anywhere. Okay, because I found my head maybe like somehow BlackBerry might want it to acquire you guys somehow, no, which would have been hilarious they, to me. They, I mean, they, they probably should have, but I think that was kind of like an NIH thing, you know, like we were we were doing a lot of the same sorts of things that, that they prided themselves on being able to do in a different context, you know, in, in a business context yeah. instead of a consumer context. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose maybe um, maybe they could have been thinking about that as, as danger being complementary to their business offering, but... I don't remember them ever talking to us about it. Okay. Um, I guess the last question, and uh, that only pertains if uh, you guys were at 3DO. Um, I think um, Joe Britt, I think you were at 3DO until 2000, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Okay. I was there, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there was something that's been roaming in my head for quite a long time is, I don't know if you knew about the Panasonic M2. Of course. Um, yeah, the PowerPC-based 3DO box. Okay. Is there a reason why that was canceled? Well, like, not released publicly beyond, like, for coffee machines and vending machines and stuff, like, being a video games console like the 3DO? Here's what I can tell you. I, um, I know the guys that, that built that box, and they, um, they're all in, in, incredibly brilliant people. And, and, in fact, that team, the core team that built M2, uh, was the group of people that 
that ultimately came to web TV and, and, uh, and did design there as well. Um, and, you know, it was people um, like uh, uh, Headley Davis. He was actually a, a very famous guy from, uh, from Commodore. Um, and then um, a whole bunch of other guys that, uh, that had been at, at Apple as well. Um, but I think, and I wasn't there at the time because I had left radio and I had been working on web TV for a while. But my impression is that um, the, 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 when the PlayStation came out, like that just set the bar uh, at a really high level. And M2 was, was partly a, a response to that. Um, but, uh, you know, 3DO had this model also of building a lot of their own um, top content for the boxes. And I think the hardware business was um, getting more and more difficult for them to justify. Uh, and as you know, 3DO ultimately became a, uh, like a, a title company. They, they, they stopped making the hardware and they, they built games for other consoles. So I think, you know, Steve was talking earlier about how insane it was that we were doing all of the, the hardware development at X-Band and at Web TV because, you know, it's not like you're just building a box. There's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that goes around it to support all the development, support mass production, support forward and reverse logistics, work with the different uh, brands that you're licensing to for whatever problems they have. Like at, at both 3DO and Web TV, we had these firewalled groups for each of the different licensees. Like there was a group of people who only talked to Sony, a group of people who only talked to Philips, and they, they could not talk to each other. And, and that was to preserve the, the confidentiality for those guys. And I think that there, there's a lot of, of overhead in running a program like that. And candidly, I think it just became too much for what 3DO was trying to do. I'm sorry I don't have a more definitive answer for you. Oh, it's okay. I'm just actually really happy to hear like even anything at all, because to be fair honest, the Panasonic M2 was pretty, like there wasn't a whole lot of people talking about it even at the time. It was like, oh, maybe 3DO is making a comeback, but like there was no you know, actual like big press event, like maybe what Microsoft would do with their Xbox or something. Uh, so it was the information is pretty scarce, you know? I think um, I have seen, I think, um, some of the M2 prototype boxes floating around in the wild. Yeah, they, they look like, um, I guess I'd say like they it look like PS1s, but actually they're all white, right? Or there's like that's one that's white and one that's black. I just remember the white one, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, yep. So uh, thank you very much, guys, for the for the answers. Anytime. All right. All right. We're gonna bring JackNet up next. Uh, you should have an invitation to take the stage, JackNet. How are you doing today? Um, can y'all hear me? Yep. Yes. Hello. All right. Doing well. Uh, good evening, Joe. Uh, good evening, Steve. Um, thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Perlman. Uh, you've been very, you've been an entrepreneurial inspiration for me. So thank you so much for that. Oh, no, uh, yeah, I'm flattered. <laughs> You're very well. <laughs> um, so I have one question for uh, for the for the view. Um, for Web TV, how have you all managed to get um, Sony on board as an OEM after what happened with General Magic? Uh, that's assuming if Sony already knew that most of the people who worked on web TV already came from magic. Um, cause you know, in the documentary on general magic, um, it mentioned how Sony got very put off by how long it took for magic link to be developed, how the poor sales figures had got and kind of, and I, and I want, and I was wondering how did Sony, uh, kind of reinstated their confidence with web TV after what happened with magic? Well, I can, uh, we almost, we lost Sony. And then we got them back again, and uh, we lost them over a golf game, and we got them back again over, I think it was a, a dinner. But uh, it, it, let me tell you the two situations. I, I retained my connections with Sony um, after I left General Magic, because I was doing something called Magic TV. Once again, trying to make a system with a chip in it that could do animation and 3D and so forth. And But General Magic was, and also I designed it was using a new um, uh, system on a chip. I, I convinced MIPS to add a multiple ad instruction, a single cycle multiple ad, so I could do digital signal processing and then build a, then I, I got three different companies, including Sony, to build an integrated chip around it with the rest of the functions and so forth. But anyways, so I, I had a separate relationship with Sony 
Um, and they they want they were very excited about Magic TV, but then General Magic really had to focus, and so I left, and that's of course when I started Catapult. And um, the I stayed in touch with them, and then when I was doing Web TV, of course I reached out to them, and it looked like they were very excited about doing this. They were they saw me as sort of the guy who was you know you know sort of the naysayer at uh, at, at at General Magic, and, and you know and the one who was very focused and, and tied to things they were. There were, you know, more of their interest, and so we um, we proceeded along in the early days, and we expected we were going to ship with Sony. They had an exclusive with us, and in fact, we had brought in funding from um, our first investor. And the condition was that they would give us one and a half million dollars in funding, and then once we signed the deal with Sony, they give us the other one and a half. That was the first funding that came into Web TV, and we were pushing, pushing, pushing to get things signed before we ran out of money. Uh, in the early days, um, because that one half million doesn't go all that far when you're trying to build a, a hardware, software, you know, servers and everything. And um, then um, we finally, um, we, uh, we were also looking at processors. And remember I told you I added that one instruction to MIPS CPUs, so I knew all the MIPS makers. And we were thinking of using a MIPS CPU because we wanted to implement ultimately a software modem using that one cycle multiply accumulate. Uh, which allows you to do digital signal processing. And so we were talking to Toshiba that had a, I think a 20 megahertz, 3000 series MIPS CPU for web TV. And we were going with them, but it was like $100 for this thing. And then we talked to NEC that had a $10 one that was a 4000 series, which was a much faster, had a floating point unit, if I remember correctly. And so we're like, okay, we're gonna go with NEC. So Toshiba was furious. And the Toshiba head of semiconductors there was friends with the CEO of Sony. They had golf, and he told the CEO of Sony that web TV would never work. He says, you can't, they're just trying to get money from you, just like General Magic did, and they're trying to, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be humiliating for you during a golf game. So we got a certified letter from Sony saying, we're, we're definitely not going to go forward with you. Now we had been talking to Philips up to that point and said, we can't do a deal with you because Sony is exclusive for one year. So I quickly called up the guys at Philips and, uh, and I said, look, you know, we, we, we managed to negotiate things with Sony, so you can go and introduce one right away. <laughs> and um, so Phillips said, okay, great. We want to go and do web TV. But we went back to our investors who told us, well, no, you don't have Sony. We're backing out. So then I desperately ran out to try to find funding. And I, I mortgaged the house. I had to get permission from my wife. And we, I sold everything I had. I sold all of my General Magic stock, which, you know, because it had gone public. Um, and, um, and the, um, and we were literally about to go bankrupt because I couldn't find anyone that was really, really, because, you know, the company looked desperate, right? Then we found, uh, Brentwood Associates and we threw a connection. Tom, um, Tom Ziola yeah. knew them and they came in and they said, we think this is the great, greatest thing. We're going to back it. And so we got them and then Paul Allen came in with Vulcan Ventures and so we raised actually $9 million and then things are going forward and we're going to launch with Philips. Okay, so the, one of the guys who was advising some of these investments, Spencer Tall, and uh, he went, he was uh, close friends. He spoke Japanese with the CEO of Sony and he had dinner with him or something. And he said, you know, you really missed the ball on this one. This thing is going to be really cool. It's going to go somewhere. And they're going and doing it with Phillips because of you. And so when I had this dinner with the guy from Doshiba, yeah, the guy from Doshiba was bad because Eddie C got the deal. So <laughs> then we, we heard that their, the chief technology officer from Sony was going to visit us. Now, we did not have an exclusive with Philips. We didn't, so we could go and bring Sony in and have two, right? And so we said, well, great. So he, and, and, and if we do a successful demo, Sony will consider it again. So he said, well, well, great. Well, you know, which day is he coming in from Japan? He says, well, he's already in the United States and he's in the air. He will be there in three hours. Okay, so we had been doing builds and these builds that we would do, you know, it's very hard. You'd go and burn the ROM and everything. And it would take, I don't remember how long it took to do a build, but it was like several hours for each turn, you know, with, with the speed of things back then. And the, the system was in a state where it was just crashing all the time. It wasn't working, you know? That happens during development. We did not expect any failures. And so I'm like, I, uh, I went to Phil and Bruce and, uh, and I said, look, we have the CTO of Sony coming by in three hours. What's the chance of the build being done by then and working? And they said, 
well, the build hasn't really worked for the last few days, but I think we got everything working this time. So I said, are you serious? It hasn't been working. <laughs> they said, yeah, it should be fine. So I said, well, that's what you said for the last build. Well, okay, I was wrong then, but this time I'm right. So I'm like, <laughs> crap. Okay, so the we went and got like, you know, some catering with like some, you know, things put in the, or a little room in the front. The guy arrives and the, the computers are still crunching. They're still burning the ROM and everything. And they're going to set the, the box. You saw the picture Joe showed you. It was this rectangular box, um, the Mongo box, right? And, uh, and um, he, finally, uh, and he says, well, you know, we're sitting in wine and dining, talking to him and everything. And um, he said, look, I really don't have much time. I need to see the demo right now. And then yeah. Phil walks in. He says, um, uh, he says, it's, it's done. We've burned it. And so I said, well, does it work? He says, well, I don't know. It's not been booted yet. The guy walked through. And so there it is. I'm like, I'm like, well, okay. I said, so the great thing about this system is you just press the on button, the remote control, and it starts up right away, which it had not been doing for the last several days. And lo and behold, it ran perfectly. The guy went and browsed all the web pages, and everything worked fine. And then finally, he went to one web page, which was his own web page in the Japanese, and it didn't render the text for it. He says, oh, that's okay. This is a product for the United States. He says, but this is amazing. He went back to Japan, met with um, Ideo san who's the, um, the CEO of, of, of Sony at the time, and said, this is, this is everything. And they said, you got to come out to Japan and show it to him because he, he wants to see it for real. So we packed up, got on a plane, we brought you know, a system there, and we had one guy, um, um, Mark um, Kruger, who had married a woman in Japan, and he had, he had, we worked, we had worked him at Apple, and he moved to Japan. He was living in a house in the middle of a rice paddy, and he had an ISDN line connected to his house. So <laughs> that was the connection there. And when we, I flew over there with Bruce and Phil, and I said, look, guys, it's a working build. We are not going to touch this, right? You know, we stayed at a hotel. We got there, you know, because of the time change or anything. Early morning, we were taking the equipment over to Sony, setting up and hooked up to the TVs. Okay, I said, no touchy the code, right? No change. It works, right? We've got to get Sony. They said, yep, you know, stack of Bibles. We're going to leave it alone. It's going to be great. And so, great. Went to bed, woke up in the morning. We're getting a cab over Sony. And he said, well, Steve, there's something I got to tell you. I said, what? He says, well, we touched the code. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> and I said, well, what'd you do? He said, well, Mark thought he could get Japanese working. So when the guy went to his webpage, it would work. Are you kidding? You implemented Japanese in web TV overnight? He says, well, how did you test it? Well, we haven't had much time to test it, but it should work. <laughs> so like, we go there. Yeah. Yeah. day son comes in and he's got his entourage of these executives, okay? And it was like, and then he brings in the vice president. Everyone's super polite and they're bowing and everything. It's very formal there, okay? And we hook it up to a TV there. I'm like, this is like I flew all the way to Japan. We had the thing and, the, and, I, and I, I said the same thing. And all you do is you push the button, it turns on and there it is. And it worked in English. <laughs> yep. And we went through different web pages. And then Bruce got up and I'm like, and Bruce says, and what was the website, what was the URL of the web page that you went to before that was in Japanese? He says, well, it didn't work in Japanese. He says, well, why don't you try it? And so the CTO typed with the keyboard, uh, the website, and it comes up in perfect Japanese. <laughs> the language had been implemented perfectly. They were a... floored. Yeah. They were floored, okay, yeah. that we, in, in a matter of two days, had implemented Japanese or three days, whatever it was, from the time the guy was there in our flight out there. And of course, I was ready to go and throttle those guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, I got I to add a couple things. One, I think that that is emblematic of everything we've been talking about around XBand and web TV. Like just that kind of, we got to do the right thing. We know what the right thing to do is. We want to be proud of the product. And then you apply just like superhuman strength. Like Mark Kruger is one of the most brilliant engineers I've ever met in my life. I mean, he was one of the main QuickTime guys, like the original QuickTime guys. Um, I also think, you know, maybe when Bruce, when you asked Bruce and Phil back in Palo Alto, uh, if the build was going to work, and they're like, yeah, maybe. I, I, I wonder if maybe they were they were kind of pulling your leg and messing with you a little bit. But uh, but I, I do remember that demo. It's really good that it worked. Um, I also think you know what you what you said about 
the, the tough spot that the company got into, that is emblematic of startups in general, right? I mean, I can't think of a company, a small company I've worked for where we didn't go right up to the brink of death and then somehow figure out how to pull back and not actually fall into the abyss. Um, correct. And, and, and the other thing about Sony that I will never, ever forget is the bathroom story. Uh, so the bathroom in the Palo Alto office, Steve Perlman, you had bought a bunch of mannequins from Nordstrom when it went out of business. And so we had these mannequins around the office and they were just creepy because, you know, you, you walk into a room and like there's some lady in the corner that you weren't expecting that was just there in the dark. And like you would get these jump scares all the time. You had them at the back. Um, but then somebody, and I think it was Chris White, put one of the mannequins in the men's room. Uh, and it was kind of just out of eyesight, so you wouldn't see it when you went in there. And as I recall, one of the Sony guys went in there and, and, and discovered her. Uh, just as he was finishing his business, kind of turning around and zipping up, uh, and then got a jump scare of his own. So I, I, I seem to recall he came out with, uh, with some slightly damp trousers. Yes. So we had these mannequins. The reason it was the bathroom is we were running out of office space. And so we didn't ever want to keep them there. And then we'd be dressed in different things. People would just dress them differently, you know. And we had one mannequin, and it was in the, the men's room, and it was behind the door. So when you looked in the bathroom, you didn't see it. But when you closed the door, and he was doing his business, and he felt, as you often can, there was, like, somebody in there with him. And he turned around, and he, um, you know, peed on his leg. And um, <laughs> we, um, he came out, and, and he said... You know, he was obviously, you know, a little bit embarrassed and very shattered. I'm like, you know, this is a really, and again, we were trying, that was before we had uh, signed Sony. Again, you know, here we were trying to build this relationship with the most important partner that you could have at the time. And what are we doing? Uh, we are, um, yeah. So anyways, so I, we did manage to survive through all of that somehow. Oh my God. And then also that bathroom. So uh, this next part is like, you, you, you could not do this today, I think, like, uh, there used to be this store here in Silicon Valley called Fry's Electronics. And the thing to know about, it was like an electronics department store. But, and they yeah, also sold yeah, like Fry's. Products, yeah. Right? But the, but the other thing about Fry's was like it, it used to be a grocery store like a long time ago. And so the time we we're doing web TV, it was still kind of this hybrid of like grocery store, electronic store. And they always had like a lot of magazines. And um, one time, Chris White and I were going to go to Fry's and get some stuff. And we asked Phil, hey, Phil, he wants to get you anything at Fry's. And he's like, yeah, give me a bag of chips and a Playboy magazine. And, and he was just joking about the Playboy magazine. But we're like, all right. So we got it and we brought it back. And he liked the chips. And he was like, why did you bring me this? And then he left it in the bathroom. So I think that Playboy magazine was probably on the, on the, um, the table in there as well next to the mannequin. Nah. No, no, okay. <laughs> I don't remember. But um, uh, in any case, it was, it, it was certainly... Um, we, we, were, we were viewed as a bit of a zoo when people came. And For sure. That certainly made it difficult to go and, and get funding. But in the end, <laughs> <laughs> so Thank anyway, you. just moving on with questions, I want to, you know, yeah. while people can still yeah. be here, because I know on the East Coast it's getting particularly late. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank Nett. you. All right. Um, I want to throw somebody under the bus. Um, just because I think they should be recognized for their work, which basically the x band project kind of kick-started the communities that we have. Um, there's a lot of people I have to thank towards the end of this, and uh, trust me, I will definitely, well, a lot by a couple, but um, I want to throw uh, Mike Benner on the stage really quick, if I could. Um, so, Mike, I just sent you an invite to the stage. Did you want to come up here or? And maybe you don't. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mike Benner is the X-Band 411 guy. And he is basically what I would consider to be the X-Band historian. He has Ooh. basically archived almost every single piece of X-Band history that he could get his hands on. So I yeah. thought it... I thought that it would be appropriate to bring him up and at least give him a chance to say hi. And I don't know if you had any questions, Mike. 
Uh, no, no questions at all. Uh, Steve, Joe, just want to say thanks. It has been amazing to hear all these stories. And uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Our, right. our pleasure. Yeah, this is super fun. Um, you know, Steve was pulling out the like the X-Band t-shirt earlier. There was actually also X-Band underwear. Steve, do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> and uh, I wish I still had mine, but the, the elastic gave out and I, and I tossed it years ago. Uh, it actually had... Um, so, you know, in the background imagery on, on X-Band, there's like all this stuff going on. And there was like, one of the images was like a little sheep. And I remember the, the underwear, it had like the X-Band logo, like on one thigh and like the little sheep guy on the other. There you go. Well, <laughs> I, bet, I, I don't know, I'm sure if anybody still has that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about X-Band, I will say honestly, there are things I, I remember very well, but we were working so hard yeah. and we were working so intensely. I never worked before or after uh, in my life so intensely for such a long period of time with so little sleep. I actually, you know, there's some parts of it I just don't even remember. You know what I mean? It was yes. crazy. I, I, I can tell you this, you know, Solo, my German Shepherd, had been pretty well trained up to then, but I would bring him with me off and he would wander around the office and he would be found, uh, people would like be passed out on the ground like a pizza box or something on their face to just, you know, uh, block the sunlight while they're sleeping. And then he'd be licking the pizza off of their face. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it was just, it was like that, that or you'd find a burrito in the trash, you know, that, that's partially eaten. It was, you cannot imagine, um, it was like, I don't know if the war zone's the right thing, but bringing that, bringing X-Band to life in such a short amount of time, it's got to be a record. You know, right, right. With all the different dimensions that had to work, plus the fact that we were reverse engineering stuff that we couldn't even be sure would ever really work, you know? Right. Well, we, and we're, when we showed it at E3, people told us it was a, a fraud. That's right. Yeah. And we, um, there was another company that was going and doing a multiplayer game. I don't remember the name of it, but... They had a modem, but it was only if new games worked on that modem. You know what I mean? They were designing games. And of course, the benefit of what we did is we could work with a hit game like Mortal Kombat or NBA Jam or NHL hockey or something. Um, and um, that week we could take a two-player game and make it work right with the system. And nobody believed that was possible. They just thought it was completely impossible. But of course, you know, we made it work. And as we, as we were mentioning before that, you know, even it wasn't just the engineering if the thing worked, we had to overcome things that weren't supposed to be things you had to overcome, like dealing with the fact that the ROMs themselves very often had uh, errors in them. So, you know, um, it, was a, it was a really monumental accomplishment, what we did, and it's, it's really terrific to go and see, uh, if you will, a historian go and, um, and document and, you know, and, and uh, collect all the different things associated with it. So I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. That's, uh, yeah, that's amazing to hear. I, it, it's funny to think back in 96, I was just recording silly little videos with no thought that in 2000, um, yeah, 2022, we'd be still watching those, talking about those. So just really, really fun, really amazing to hear about the environment, the mixture of uh, amazing engineering minds, fun, and just pure chaos probably at times as well. So thanks again for sharing all those awesome behind the scenes stories. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to... Uh... Thank you, Mike. And I wanted to add, I think that the um, I think that the competitive, the competing modem. I'm trying to remember what company it was, but it was actually a pretty big company that that you guys were going up against. If I want to say correctly, I want to say like AT and T was involved. Yes, that's it. They had much better funding than we did, and of course, they were also gearing up to write video games, right? But the yep. thing is. They never the video games they made. None of them were were big hits. Which of course, you know, if you, if you don't have a big hit, then you know you already have a problem. By the way, one of the things someone hasn't asked, but it's sort of related to this, is we often reflected on why we didn't sell more X band things because it was so cool. And the thing is, there were a lot more Sega and Nintendo machines out there at the time we introduced than there were PlayStation One machines. And but we learned I learned a lesson from that, and that is that. The tail end of the market, if you will, you know, the early adopters, the people that are most likely to adopt a new technology, 
were all getting PlayStation 1s. They were moving on to that. And even though there was a much larger base of users that were using uh, Genesis and Nintendo, it was harder to find within that group of people uh, enough adopters. And then we had this other constraint, which is that we had to be able to make a local phone number between two people in order for it to be a free phone call, which because you didn't want to pay for a toll call for a, a, an extended video game session. And so really uh, to make X-Band work re required a certain density of users. We gave people, we made a few people super players where we paid for their long distance calls in order to kind of mix things up and, and get things started for as much as we could afford, you know. But uh, in the end, it just wasn't quite enough. And, um, and as, as we described earlier, we could not do the same hack that we did for cartridge games with a CD-ROM game. And Sony just wasn't, uh, you know, they, it was many years later that they began to go and look into uh, multiplayer games. Steve, I think also um, a lot of that work that we did for X-Band for, for finding local phone numbers, um, that heavily influenced how MTV boxes found their local phone numbers. Exactly. It worked the same way. You, we dialed an 800 number and you, um, you, know, you could block your, your um, caller ID. So you know, if somebody called, if you called a number with your phone, no one would see what number you're calling from. But a lot of people didn't realize when you dialed an 800 number, the thinking was the number you're calling is paying for the call. They have the right to see your number. So we had the, uh, the X-Band modem dial an 800 number. It would see the number, whether or not your caller ID was blocked. Then it would go and look through a database to find another local phone number and try to match you up. Um, and that, that worked, but we just didn't get enough of them out there, you know, and so we had to go and add these long distance users. So when web TV came out, we did the same thing with dialing up. Back then, if you had AOL, it would give you a list of phone numbers you could dial up. And the list though, was based on your area code. And I'll give you an example, you know, if you're in Mountain View, California, you're right next to Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale is in 408, Mountain View is in 650. And so even though it's a different area code, it is a local call, but a 650 call to say, Redwood City would be a, or, or San Mateo would be a toll call. So, you know, a different area code could very well be a free number, whereas the same area code could be, you know, a for pay number. Well, AOL left it up to you, the user, to figure that out and perhaps get burned in a phone bill uh, when you find out you, you chose the wrong number to dial into. So we were determined to make it completely simple. So when we began that work, as I said, at XBand, but at Web TV, we um, uh, went and we were determined to go and create a, a foolproof database because we had a lot of people with X-Band when we, we thought were local numbers it turned out to not be and they, we had to pay their bills. So with web TV, we literally ordered every phone book in the United States. That's the only place where we could look and we looked at the front pages and we had a team of people, a lot of them interns that we hired from college that would go and create a database of what was a local phone number in the United States. And that database was the only one that existed so that when web TV would do that 800 number call, it would find a local modem that it could pool that it could dial into whatever the area code was and whatever your number was. And it, it, we did have a few mistakes. In fact, some phone books had some mistakes in them where people got outrageously large phone bills, we had to pay them. But after the, few, few, the first couple of months, when we resolved those, that's it. We had the only database in the United States that showed what a local phone call was and we made it simple for people because all they did hit the on button, your web TV would bot dial an 800 number. And then we even made it more optimized because we, we could find some modem pools were full and busy and other ones were available. We'd even go and tell the web TV box to go and dial to different ones. Um, so it, was, it got to be, we, we, again, as, we were, as we've been saying throughout this entire talk, you get, when, you, when you're innovating and you've got innovative people, you keep coming up with better and better ideas and ways to do things. And that's indeed what we did at both of these companies. Absolutely. And I, I think I remembered, I think that other modem that was competing with X-Band was from PF Magic. PF Magic, that's right. Yep, and the PF Magic, I was telling everyone at E3, <laughs> don't believe what's going on in the Catapult booth. What they're doing is impossible. <laughs> and, and Joe, I can, you know, how many times have we been at companies where someone had said it's impossible? In fact, getting web TV to show, to be use an interlaced image, because before that, every computer and video game was using non-interlaced, because when yep. you tried to make an interlaced, things would flicker. Yeah, yep. we had invented a, a, a vertical convolution filter, which would eliminate the flicker. So you could put it, use the full resolution 
of the TV, which is barely enough. And Sony, when I was there, that, that meeting where we were, where the day sign was there with all of his uh, cadre of people, and they were yeah. looking at the TV, they, they, one of the questions they said, how did you get it to be interlaced and not flicker? So I said, well, that's a, that's a trade secret. They said, well, yeah. you have to tell us. And so they said, well, we're just not, we can't. You just said, you sent us a certified letter that you're not even going to deploy it. Why would we share this secret with you? And um, Sony, who was the king of TVs, the king of video did not know how web TV pulled it off. And we had people parading in to that meeting room all day long just to see an interlaced TV showing a stable image. People were going up there with magnifying glasses and looking at the, uh, you know, the yeah. rasp of the TV screen. So that's, that was, in, that was the, the innovations that we had to do in order to make it work. Anyways, I think we, should, we probably want to let other people ask questions. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Mike, by the way. I'm going to move you back down. Sorry I threw you under the bus. <laughs> All right. We're going to bring up a spin thwomp. I think I, I think I did that right. Spin, uh, yes, Tommy, you, you did doing? do it right. I am doing well. Jo uh, Joe, Steve, it is such an honor to, to be up here with you guys and hear you guys' voices and hear the stories you guys have to tell. It's uh, really, really an honor. So uh, thanks, Tommy, for bringing me up here. No problem. Did so so I have a couple questions, uh, Some one pertaining to X-Band and uh, another just a general question. So um, it's in the Q&A thread here. I'm just going to read it off. Um, why were some of the uh, assets and uh, stuff in the X-Band UI changed seemingly for no reason so close to launch? I am trying to remember. What, what do you mean, like some of the, um, of the icons? Some of the text strings, some of the icons, yeah. So, like, for example, auto match was changed to challenge and, you know, toss was changed to delete and stuff like that. You know, Joe, I don't remember exactly, but one thing I will tell you that often happens just before launch is you get feedback um, by what people are confused about, you know, right. and very often you change the wording, and uh, that may have been one of the reasons. Um, but Joe, do you remember any specific reason for, for making changes other than feedback from beta? No, but you reminded me of like um, a story from early testing on the Macintosh that I heard from like some of the early Mac guys when they were first building it. Like for the dialogues, they had a button that said do it instead of okay. Uh, and they had to change it because a lot of people misread that as dolt and uh, they felt like the computer was calling them a dolt, you know, a stupid person. So yeah, definitely you get feedback. And, and, yeah. and tweak stuff. And you, and you never know, you really can't completely anticipate. And that's why you've got to do testing. I mean, you know, and both on um, human, you know, what, how people react to things. And as I mentioned before, uh, whether or not you, you're about to set their house on fire. Now, Spin, um, Spin brought up something that I remember. Um, I'm not going to say who said this. But do you guys remember anything about a UI involving an elevator? UI involving an elevator. I am stopped. That I don't remember. What was it? Expand? Yes. Don't remember that. No. All right. What's the story? Um, it probably would have been Sega, and Khan told me it. Okay. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's the other person to have on this call. Although, For sure. uh, I'm not so, you know, the stories he would tell, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Spin, go that. ahead. And... Uh, okay, so uh, my next question is just pertaining to like, uh, so in both of your times in the industry, uh, what changed, you know, throughout the years, uh, like etiquette, lingo, or just like culture in general? Wow. That's a lot. Uh... All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw a few things in there. Um, it's been much harder for me, I can just speak for myself and other people I, I know that are doing similar things, to get funding for underlying technologies. And, you know, it's easy to see why. I mean, you know, um, with the advent of the internet, very powerful processors, uh, the ability, to, you know, certainly with, with the uh, ubiquity of smartphones, it's a lot easier to make money if you're an investor, say a venture capitalist or some other kind of investor, by building on top, on the shoulders of that technology 
a good example is Uber. You know, Uber is only possible because of the advent of the smartphone and the fact that everyone has GPS, right? And, and, and the fact that networks are reasonably fast. So um, when you, but back then, things, a lot of the technologies were still in formation and it wasn't really clear how things were going to end up. So the investors were willing to take a much bigger chance on things. So it's much harder to go and fund uh, uh, companies that are doing things that are difficult. Different. Now, the one thing I want to add, though, is it always was hard to do things that are they're difficult. And, you know, with Web TV, when I tried to first get funding for it, I would bring it to VCs and they would go and say, nobody's ever going to want to interact with the television. So I said, well, look, they already do. They change channels. They change the volume. And they said, well, it doesn't matter. Right here, you know, web browsers are only things people ever use on a computer. You know, a web browser is a computer application. It's not something anyone ever used on a consumer device. So you have to try to get people over the hump on that. And it's very, very difficult. And, um, and you know, in fairness, people are, are looking at things. Another story I'll tell you, which is not directly related to this, but is I remember, you know, when um, Android was trying to get funding and we, I was trying to help Andy out and I was introduced to all different kinds of different people uh, that I knew that were in the venture capital community. In the end, I, there was a guy I knew who we had worked with at Apple. I won't name his name. His name. Very nice guy, and he ended up going to the venture capital. And I ran into him at Whole Foods, and, and I said, "Hey, did you meet with Andy and his guys about this Android thing?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, well, "What did you decide?" He says, "Oh, come on, Steve. He's got to sell a million of those before he breaks even." And uh, I said, "Well, yeah." I said, "Oh, come on. He's trying to boil the ocean." So I said, "I don't think he's boiling the ocean." I said, "But he might. You know, I don't think he's trying to. I think, but we couldn't get anyone to fund it, so I provided the seed funding for it." And um, of course, it, I, I think he sold a, f a couple more than a million units. So it's, but now these days, I will tell you, it is just extraordinarily hard. Uh, we're about to introduce this, this new wireless technology, what we, which we actually first were showing eight years ago and, and you wrote about it earlier than that. And, um, you know, when 5G was introduced, everybody, you know, they, before it was even introduced, everyone said, this is it. Then they would have lab prototypes that didn't really work that well, and they would say, this is it. Then they would go you know, further and further on, and now I think you can read press where people are saying there's really no real difference, which anyone could have told you from just looking at the, the technical specs between that and LTE, and to the point where I think a couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about um, how they couldn't see any difference between 4G and 5G, and, but it uses 5G uses a lot more power, so they want you to, you know, uh, how to... Uh, Remove 5G from your phones. Yeah, all this time, we had a technology that runs 10 times faster than either, either LTE or 5G, uses less power, and we have not been able to get funding. So we had to self-fund it, work with a tiny team, and do it ourselves. And so finally, we're coming out, of course, because you know there's a new spectrum that's made available that is not licensed, so no one can stop us from introducing it. And so you, and you have to wonder, but you know, I think I could have gotten this company funded 20 years ago. Might have been able to get funded 10 years ago. But today, the world, they're like, you know, why are you doing this? You know, there's 5G. You know, 5G is, is the faster thing. And I try to explain technically what's going on, but there's no interest in that. You know what I mean? So I do think that the world, in my mind, has, uh, has technology has evolved. And there's terrific things being built on top of the fundamental technologies you know, Joe's work, um, he's one of the pioneers of the smartphone, and he really should be recognized as that. And I kind of stuck with, you know, uh, TVs and games and, you know, as you know. But he really, the work that he did uh, with Danger, you know, it really became a template for everything we have today. And um, built on those shoulders is, is, is really what is the, the new things that are being built today, and you can get funding for them. If you try and do something which, which starts from the ground up, well, it's really, really difficult. But we're, that doesn't mean we're, we're not, it hasn't stopped me yet. <laughs> Joe, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, totally. No, so first of all, thank you for the, the really kind words. Like, I'm, I'm really flattered. I think, you know, um, now obviously on the internet, you can search for anything. And a lot of times somebody has thought of something similar before. Uh, and so what that means is it's a lot easier than I think ever in the history of, of mankind 
to build technologies that are derivatives, right? I mean, we, we always build on the shoulders of those who came before us, but it's like now there's a lot more shoulders and it's easier to find those shoulders and build stuff. Um, and that, that has a couple of effects. One, like Steve was talking about, from an investor's point of view, um, it in, in some way, I mean, it really is sort of a democratization of technology. It makes it so that it is so much more widely approachable and usable. It gives investors a much larger pool of opportunities to invest in. Whereas when we were doing, we were working on Web TV and we were working on X-Band, um, technology was still a lot more balkanized. You know, you'd have these little pockets of people like, like the guys that we knew from Apple that were able to go on and, and build these products at, at Catapult and, and Web TV. Um, so I think the, the concentration was different. You know, it's like the technology is a lot more diffuse now that enables uh, more people to build and deploy interesting things. Uh, it also enables investors to be uh, a lot more picky about what it is they actually choose to invest in. There's just a lot more choice. But I think, you know, I think it was Mark Twain who said, like, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. People probably felt similarly when semiconductors were just coming of age, right? Because now you have these little chips that integrate a whole bunch of stuff that used to take up multiple PC boards. And so people who lacked the ability to design the logic that was actually inside the IC, in the form of a big PC board, even if they didn't mind it being physically larger, now they were able to take these building blocks. You know, even the microprocessor, that's a great example, right? There, there used to be video game companies like Cinematronics that built their own processors out of discrete logic. And it, it was a very small sort of cadre of people that could actually do that. So, um, so I think that's, that's probably, I, I completely agree with what Steve was saying. It's a, it's a different landscape now. But my hunch is that, that maybe this is sort of a pattern that repeats over and over and over again through the worlds of technology and investors. Now, Joe, I know that you, um, I know that there's a lot of gamers here. You were actually on the cusp with danger of almost uh, combining those two worlds were you not yeah yeah there was um there was a prototype device that we built called the g1 which was um a, a mashup of um of a hip top or sidekick uh and a game boy advance and we built a few of them uh and it was it was really really cool uh we had a custom asic um that we could use so that b both systems the, the game boy advance and the sidekick ran in sort of parallel worlds and this ASIC bridged them together. Uh, so we could do things like, there's this thing called chroma key, which is where you have like a, a magic color in the frame buffer. That means like, don't draw the pixels there, draw the pixels from some other source. Uh, and that's how you get kind of like punch through effects. You know, you could have arbitrarily shaped regions done in, in the chroma key color. Uh, and then that tells the hardware to show some graphic from some other frame buffer or other plane somewhere else. And we did that to combine together Game Boy Advance graphics and Psychic graphics. So like you could be playing um, Super Mario uh, when you're in Game Boy Advance mode, but the Psychic could still pop up little dialogues and notifications as you were getting um, emails or text messages in the background. Uh, and then there were hotkeys you could use to like flip between the two worlds. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, um, it was Finn, pretty insane. It was really cool. Finn, you have uh, one more question, and then yes, we have two one more, more uh, one more, uh, and this one. Well, it's for both of you, and then I have one more for Joe. Uh, for both of you, uh, would you go back and do it all again, knowing that a lot of the stuff that you would put out would eventually not come to be or be a failure, or, or uh, you know? Boy, that's a great question. Um, Look, I, I don't know that I would necessarily want to go back now knowing what I know now and do it again, but I would not want to give up having done it the first time because um, both of those experiences, X-Band and, and Web TV, well, I'm danger too, right? I mean, they, they shaped me. They, they made me who I am today, and, uh, and I'm, I'm tremendously grateful uh, for having been able to have those experiences. So I, I think I have a similar answer. You know, 
Uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So when you look at like, if I if I had only done this, or I've only you know uh, packaged that way, I've only met with that person, I've only spoken to this guy who was ready to give us the funding we needed in an earlier time. If I had only you know um, you know target something for this market a little bit different, I've only written this contract slightly different. You know, there's so many things when you're when you're doing this vast number of things over the years. Um, but when I, I look at the things that we got to do and, you know, and look at that long landscape of stuff, um, I consider myself just incredibly lucky because um, I, I know other folks that, you know, just didn't get a chance to ever do any of these things. And, um, you know, uh, you, you know, you, one of the terms you use is failure. And, you know, and I think that there's different kinds of, of success and failure. It's subjective. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was trying I mean, to say. Well, it's exactly a failure. Yeah. It's a fair thing to say. And by the way, um, if you don't acknowledge the things that don't fail in whatever dimensions of failure they are, how can you learn, right? I, I was just talking about this one thing about, I learned about which market to target, you know? That was a key thing I learned from the Catapult experience is that it doesn't matter which is the largest market, what you need to go is the market of the early adopters who are more likely to go and try something when you new thing. That affected the way that we, we, we marketed web TV and it affected the way that um, I've, I've marketed other products, you know, over the years. And it certainly had a big effect on uh, on live, the way I did MOVA. Um, there's a company called Ice Blink I did. You know, there's all these different lessons that were learned that enabled me to go and do these things. One of the questions people ask is, you know, should you have gone public with web TV rather than be acquired by Microsoft? You know, that was at the dot-com boom period. So we could have made a lot of money in an acquisition. Yeah, well, you know... Um, if we had become a public company, we then would have been, when there was a dot-com crash, it would have been really, really hard to go and stay afloat and get do everything we wanted to do. So landing where we did in the lap of Microsoft with the security we had, we, we powered through the dot-com crash and were able to go and keep on doing really great work. So that was all good too. So I, I don't, you know, uh, certainly with the knowledge I have today and knowledge anybody would have, there's some things I wished I could have done a little bit differently, but generally speaking, at least in my life, I would I consider myself immensely lucky to have, have been able to create the things I did, be able to somehow, some some way, get the funding that we did, have this incredible privilege to work with the level of talent and the, the kindness of people that we worked with and the dedication, and um, and then I also um, you know again crazy lucky to have the opportunity to learn these lessons to be able to do later things in my life that I never would have ever been able to do because I wouldn't have been able to know how to begin. So, um, you know, uh, X-Band was not a failure. Web TV was not a failure. Web TV, I can tell you, look, I was a president of Microsoft. We, it, it made Microsoft um, uh, over, I think over $2 billion in profit, something like that, by the time we shut it down. So it was a very successful acquisition to them. I believe... It was the only dot-com acquisition that Microsoft made that actually made money for the company. And of course, they got this terrific team that then made all these other video products, which are, were additional things that, that allowed Microsoft to build. And I think we're pretty glad that the Xbox 360 came out uh, and then you know, created good competition for Sony and the two things have evolved along their way. And then for all the things I learned there, I, with, I, don't know, I learned all that stuff about gaming and everything in the industry, could never have gone and launched on live. And with OnLive, you know, boy, we were trying to launch a new platform and it was, you know, it was just, it was something that was so big that we, uh, and we, we were just about, you know, we, we got it through the point we were just about to be acquired by Hewlett Packard and then Hewlett Packard had problems. And that's the reason we had to go and wind things down. And that was just a black swan, but we almost made it past the finish line with that one. And Hewlett Packard in that case was not just going to be continuing the game service backed by, which at that time was a, one of the largest companies in the world. But it was going to also be hosting, um, you know, large PC applications, things like, you know, Autodesk Maya and, uh, and, and so on remotely, you know, creating a, a, a completely interactive, um, you know, Windows desktop. So we came so close on that one. But there was another company in England, which was that Hewlett Packard had acquired earlier that had a big, huge $7 billion fraud or something. I don't know. But anyways, that is the thing that, that derailed that project. So there's things we learned and there's things that I, we couldn't have learned. 
But then all of these things, as Joe said, has led us to um, where we are today and what we know. Thank you so much. Spin, you have well, one last question for yeah, Joe? Yeah, well, one for Joe. Uh, and I think it's been sort of something that this whole server would like to know. Here comes the name. Here comes the question. So, Joe. Um, <laughs> basically, in this server, uh, there has been one thing that has been on our minds, which is how do you get your hair? How do you get your hair to stick up like that? How do you get your hair to be like that so beautiful and luscious? Oh my god. I, uh, I'm blushing. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, look, man, I am, I am blessed with incredible genes. My, my father had great hair. Uh, uh, both of my grandfathers had great hair. So, uh, you know, I, I consider myself to be incredibly lucky. And, you know, what's really funny is I, I used to have shorter hair. Like, if you saw that picture from when we were at Web TV, I used to wear it really short all the time. And then during COVID is really when I started growing it out, right? Because I, I we're in lockdown. I couldn't go out and get a haircut, so so I had what I call my COVID haircut, which was which was the really long one, um, and uh, and I decided I liked it, and I just kind of stuck with it. Um, I had one kind of in between, which you probably saw if you watched the the X band video, uh, but I, I I really enjoyed growing it out even longer. So um, I don't do anything. I just I just let it grow, and I I wash it, and like that's it. <laughs> I can't believe you're asking me that, but thank you. Let it grow and wash it. Got it. All right. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, so much. Jeans, jeans are the secret, right? You just, you got to have the right DNA. Well, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. <laughs> so Steve, Joe, thank you guys so much. Natalie, Tommy, also thank you guys. Uh, this has been a really great birthday thing for me. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Oh, happy happy birthday, birthday, by the way. Happy birthday. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys. Right on. <laughs> All right, um, let's check our hands here. Are you guys doing okay on time? Everything okay? Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring up Web TV owner times four. I imagine they have four Web TVs. <laughs> How's it going? True. Are you there? Web TV owner oh, X4. I, yeah, I had to fix my microphone again. Oh, no problem. Yeah, the readers are true. I do own four Web TV boxes. <laughs> yeah, I have oh, two TV. questions. One <laughs> is slightly more important, so I think we'll get on with that one. What's the backstory behind Phil Berger? The, I knew somebody was going to ask that. Um, uh, Tommy... Give me a heads up about Phil Berger. Steve, I don't know if you remember this or not, but in the ROM, there is an image of Phil Goldman uh, eating a hamburger. And I, I looked at this picture recently, really closely, and it looks kind of like an In-N-Out burger. Um, <laughs> I remember the picture really well. I, I don't remember where it came from or why it's in there. I actually sent the picture to... Um, Chris White and a couple of other web TV folks, and, and nobody else can remember it either. Um, you know, the picture, it kind of looks like he's in front of a restaurant because you can see the reflection of a car like parked in front of it. But I think it was probably just at that time, digitized photos were still kind of a novelty. Remember, we were talking about earlier. Um, and I think Phil just put it in there as an Easter egg, but I, I wish I could remember more details. Okay, so Phil was obsessed with diets and, that's right and for a while he was fat free phil yes in anything with fat and then he was um then he was carb free phil and he literally switched from one like overnight and he also was a guy of habits and if i remember correctly he would always go to jack in the box and get some sort of a bowl of something which um uh, no it was the chicken teriyaki bowl i went with him many times there you are. Okay. And he would also go to Gold's Gym at midnight and all the yes. bench pressing. Um, he would not do any other exercise. So I don't know why. Uh, so for him, I've never seen him eat a burger. And perhaps the reason that photo is in there is maybe someone caught him in the act um, because he was so strict and, and followed such a, a precise routine in terms of his diet. 
he was eating that burger with gusto in the photo. Um, and the, the, the Jack in the Box thing, Steve, do you remember when Phil tried to get a Jack in the Box franchise because he wanted to build one near his house? That's right. After the Microsoft acquisition, well, we made some money and he wanted to, he tried to go and get a Jack in the Box franchise near his house just so that he would have a short drive to get his teriyaki chicken bowl. And I remember that bowl too. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I don't know exactly what's in there. I do know this, that we, there was all sorts of little, um, you know, you know, Easter eggs and other things that we, people would leave around. I mean, there have to be, you know, once the, once you finish the code and if there's room in the ROM, you can put whatever you want there. Right. Um, well, and so, there's, there's funny, funny references nobody would get, right? Like remember Andy created Telescript, which was like the scripting language for the modem. And it was funny because it was T E L L Y like a television, but it was also uh, a reference back to Telescript from general magic. Right. Yep. So anyways, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> There's other things in there. If you do photomicrographs of the chips, uh, you'll find that when we, um, just before I sent them, them out to Fab, we would um, put in, um, um, you know, black and white. It, well, they're really line drawings of the um, very high contrast photos, you know, just black and white of the uh, designers of the chips. And the thing about it, a lesson learned there, we sent out, I remember the first time we did that, um, there's a design rule check that's done by the uh, the fab company, the chip fab companies, and <laughs> they said that we, you have you have a part of the chip that's not connected to anything, so therefore <laughs> it got rejected and sent back to us. And it was of course those for us. So now we learned how to design black and white photos of the team that made it and connect them to ground to make sure that they would uh, pass the <laughs> design rule. But all of the chips inside there, Solo One and everything, they have. If you if you go to if you etch away the cover of them, you'll find um, uh, etched into the silicon actual photographs the people who designed them. I actually didn't know about that. Haven't personally taken part in the solos yet, but <laughs> the other one, um, what happened with the dialing music? Like, how did that happen? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there were two composers that worked on the music for, um, for web TV. One was Thomas Dolby, uh, and the other, I don't remember the guy's name. He was, he was really, really good. And we actually found him through, um, Steve Hales and Jim Mitchells, who were the two guys that wrote the audio engine that we used in web TV. Um, I mean, that, that, that's the, the high-level story. Is there a specific question you have about the music? Um, like, were there any other variations? Many. Were... Yeah, many. And I, they're, they're lost to the sands of time now. But um, there, were, there were a lot of different tracks that were written by Thomas and that other guy. And I think we kind of went through and, and picked the ones that we liked the best. Steve, do you remember any more details? No, I do know this, that... Um... One of the things that we said, you know, this is not a computer, it's not a browser. It's hard to believe it, but back in the uh, 1990s, there's a lot of people that really didn't have um, speakers or ever listen to audio because the data rate for music over a phone line, you just couldn't easily dial. I mean, you could have had a lot of time. And of course, that led to, to Napster and so forth. But as far as, you know, real time streaming, it was in its infancy. Um, but we had the ability to, to, to put stuff in the ROM and we wanted music. But anyway, so we um, spent a lot of time and attention because we said this is on television. It should be an entertainment device. We thought the web eventually would be entertainment. It's why, again, the focus on um, Flash. And then we wanted to work with the best um, musicians we could. And, and uh, we ended up with what we thought was pretty good music. You know, a lot of work went into the MIDI um, uh, player as well. And we, you know, because MIDI was, was small enough, if you could find MIDI files on the web, they were small enough that you could play them very, very quickly, you know, through a phone line connection. And, and just to kind of show like how um, small the network is of, of people that do stuff like this. You know, like I said, the sound engine was written by these two guys, Jim Mitchells and Steve Hales, both of whom uh, have deep roots in the gaming industry. Uh, Jim Mitchells, he's done a ton of stuff, but um, he was also the guy at EA who 
reverse engineered the Sega Genesis so that EA could write games for the Genesis without having to take a license from Sega. Uh, and Steve Hales worked on a crazy product back in the 80s called the Starpath Supercharger that was a, uh, a RAM-based cartridge for the Atari 2600 that let you load games off of a cassette tape instead of, instead of having to have them burned into ROM. Um, but both of those guys wound up building uh, this sound engine uh, that got used in a bunch of different products. Steve, I think General Magic used it too. It could be. One of the things you brought up that's kind of related is that, you know, a lot of people, you know, now it's, it's, it's obviously the case that, you know, you have publishers and you have, you know, uh, companies that make platforms like, you know, PlayStation and uh, Xbox. And the, uh, but back in the days of Sega, Genesis and uh, Nintendo, it was a quasi-legal thing whether or not you could go and make a cartridge for these things. I don't remember the details, but some of the earlier um, platforms, because, you know, Sega and, um, you know, and Nintendo, they wanted to make all the, all the stuff for themselves and uh, in the early days, and so did Atari. And uh, there were some lawsuits and things like that, but if you reverse engineered it, you were kind of okay. But one of the things we were worried about, we thought we were going to get sued by Sega when we introduced Xbox, because... Here, or maybe there's some weird copyright law that we were changing the execution of the games or something. And we, right. we just didn't know. Um, and we tried to communicate with Sega. Sega didn't really understand what we were doing. But then when it came out, they, they liked it. And they liked us. And of course, uh, as you know, Nintendo then, it was, it was, I think Joe was there when Nintendo uh, embraced the system. And that was a more official relationship, you know? Nintendo is a whole great story that Khan told um, uh, in the Wrestling with Gaming documentary, uh, where he talked about going up to Seattle and, and giving a demo of X Band um, to, oh man, what was that guy's name? Um, yeah. Lincoln? Howard Lincoln. Howard Lincoln. And Howard Lincoln calling in a bunch of engineers and like berating them for telling him that what Khan had just showed him was impossible, but yet Catapult was doing it. Yep. Yeah, we had a lot of people, by the way, with Web TV. As I said, that was impossible. Catapult was impossible. OnLive was impossible. Um, there, when OnLive was came, when we uh, released OnLive in two thousand and nine at the Game Developer Conference, the one of the most credible publications for games was um, uh, in England. What's it called? Um, edge, Edge, the Edge. Not the Edge. Well, maybe it was the Edge. They, they, but it was the. I don't know. Well, they remember. changed it when they brought it to the U.S. You're right. Um, yeah. These guys, they would do a lot of technical analysis, and they published a thing the day after we, the, the show opened, and they said, why on live can't possibly work? They've since removed that from their website, but it's still there in archive.org, and they had experts go and tear the thing apart and say why cloud gaming is physically impossible while we were violating laws of physics. Therefore, what we were showing at the Game Developer Conference was faked. Mm-hmm. And then the thing about it was we finally launched in the U.S. in 2010, and... Um, there, people were using it in their homes. It was working, I think, but we hadn't yet launched in the UK. That came later. And they still did not acknowledge that it was real. And I'm thinking, what is their mass hysteria that Americans have this thing working? And it wasn't until we launched in the UK that an article came out where they said they compared it and they said that the latency that they were seeing, because we had higher performance servers that were, of course, in the data center, of course, you had the added latency going through the internet, um, but the but compared to an Xbox um, 360 or PlayStation 3, the end latency was the same because the Xbox 360 had lower performance. We had, and so it had latency um, because of lower performance. And so they were seeing the game experience was equivalent. And the thing, I, and then we went and looked for the article and it got, it got removed, as I said, uh, about why it can't possibly work. So again, um, well, you know, this is not, we're getting pretty far away from the question you originally asked, but for those of you who are entrepreneurs, for those of you who are trying things, who believe and you got an idea in something, you know, when people tell you it can't possibly work and you, you know, you have good reason to believe it will because of your, your understanding of it, then that means you've, you've tapped into something really, really big. Now, the question is, will you succeed as a business in doing it? And we've talked about a couple of things. OnLive did not succeed as a business. Neither did uh, uh, Xband. Web TV happened to, but, you know, look, we were acquired by Microsoft and it carried on and so forth. 
Um, I don't know. Maybe if we had not had the funding of Microsoft, you know, and we had gone public, maybe we would not have had the ability to keep going in order to get to a point of success. I don't know. But I will tell you this, that you have to try. Because if you don't try, and if you don't go and keep doing these things, then the world is going to stop innovating. Because we have larger and larger companies, you know, tech companies and so forth. So, um, you know, um, at the time, there's nothing that stings more than having the greatest authorities in the world go and say this thing, you work your ass off to make sure it was real and tell the whole world that it's a fake and that you're, you're, you're a fraud. There's nothing that stings worse than that. It's, if you want to talk about the thing that I hated most in the past, that's what hurt, hurt the most. But in all of those cases, everything was real and we may not have succeeded as a business, but we showed that what we did worked and if it's, other things were built on top of what we did and it was every bit worthwhile, every bit of it. Thank you, Web TV owner, for your questions, by the way. I'm going to move you back down. So, um, up next, we have Halen. Halen, how you doing? You there, buddy? Alan? Okay. Did it, were we still here? Did anything glitch out, guys? Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Sorry, it's been really hard to look at chat. By the way, everyone else, um, I, sometimes I think our answer is, I'm, I'm probably a longer in the mouth than Joe. Um, they may have gotten, well, every, it's, I know how late it is for everybody, and it's great to see that most of you are still here. And um, thank you very much for staying. Absolutely. Thank you, this guys. Super fun. Yeah, actually, I was going to pass the mic to you next. So if you would like to go while Halen fix his audio here. Halen, I'm temporarily going to mute you. The Nintendo one? Genesis was going to be unlicensed third party. Yeah, no, it was unlicensed third party. We were going, we were, we had a partnership with, um, it was the uh, publisher. THQ. THQ. THQ, right. And so they kind of helped us because they had access to the, uh, you know, they had a relationship with Toys R Us and all the game, game companies at the time, game retailers. And so we were going through their channels and we were friends with them and they're, they're great. In fact, I continue to work with them. Uh, they were one of our best partners at OnLive later on uh, when I did that. And um, the, as I said, we really didn't know how, what, how, how this is going to go over with Sega. Um, and we were, we were just worried that they were going to somehow use some legal means. That was the risk we were going forward with, you know. Um, but it, it, um, as, to my recollection, um, Sega loved it. Um, though Joe, I wasn't there. I left and began to start another work on web TV. Joe, you were there when they were talking with uh, Nintendo, I think, and, but I, you might know more. Um, I actually did not recall that the Genesis one got the seal, but I guess it did. Uh, I definitely remember Nintendo having it. Um, but, uh, but that's interesting about, about the Sega version. Um, you know, it was it was wild the way we built those things, right? Because we were not Sega or Nintendo authorized developers when we were putting it all together, but we built the whole operating system and uh, and UI off of, as I recall it, um, like a, a loose leaf binder of pages from some manual that looked like they had been Xeroxed about a hundred times. You know, I'm looking at the boxes that I was showing people earlier. 
And I have a, I have an Xbox box, X band box here that says official Sega seal of approval. There you go. I guess we got it at the last minute, but because we eventually we did do something with Sega. Um, eventually, they they did prove. I do know that we were terrified, and then we found out. Oh, they thought it was a cool idea. So you know. Thank you, Natalie. Halen, I'm going to try to unmute you here. Uh, Halen, are you present? Can you talk? Well, Tommy, you can read Halen's question. Oh, hey, sorry about that. Uh, chat. I'm ready whenever Nat is done. Okay. Something is going on with your mic. Go ahead, Helen, if you'd like, I can read the question for you. Tommy, are you reading the question? Um, I'm waiting for it to be typed. I apologize, guys, for oh, the oh, I didn't know um, dead That's... air. <laughs> oh. Uh. Do you have any disk dumps of web TV units with disks? Is what Halen would like to know. I don't have any. I mean, what, what do you want the code that's on the disk? You want the, um, the, the source code or the. I think you know, what they want are the hard drive images. Because I know they've been ar they've been archiving those because some have different tele scripts on them and uh, yeah. um, I I mean Steve appears to have a, a nice collection of old boxes there I um, I'll dig around and and see what I can find yeah I mean I have um, I I tried to grab one of just about every version. But that doesn't mean I have every um, every release on them. There's one, whatever release is the one that I grabbed. Um, but um, as we see, we're making it through, there's some I don't have. I I, I try remember. I don't think I have uh, the Japanese. There's you know there's a Fujitsu one that we did in Japan. Um, but I have I think the Mitsubishi one that I haven't shown you. I have the one that we did with a Dish Network that um, uh, we designed the Dish Player. But Ooh. I have. Yeah, you guys seen? I have a couple of those somewhere. Those are cool. That, that, yeah. Steve, I've I've got all the junk to dump the discs. If you want them, I can I can try to dump them. Um, one thing that might be interesting, one of the box, I I I think I have like one web, web TV box left. Uh, but um, there might be some good stuff on the ones you've got. Like I, do you remember we did like um, you don't know Jack and uh, somebody did like a port of Mame. Um, we might be able to find that. No, yeah, we, yeah. no, yeah, we, we actually have. We actually have. Um, you don't know Jack and Doom running. Oh my god! Um, and you're able to. Uh, I believe they were gotten from somebody. I think they might have been gotten from a Dish Web TV box or a Web TV Plus, mm -hmm. and somebody had dumped those images, and then we. Uh, I wanted I wanted to say Zephy would probably know off the top of his head, but um, oh Emac Emac actually wrote a utility where you could um, those applications were almost like their own separate partitions. So yeah. Emac had wrote a, a utility that would look at your partition layout and move the app into the next available hard drive space. And so nice. those are un installable now, but I think the community would be appreciative if you guys could find any other boxes with that, any of that stuff on it that you could dump. So there's one other thing, you know what, the, what, what I can always consider to be one of the coolest things that was ever done 
Now, this is the Web TV 1.0, the first one that came out. Okay, the, the, you know that little Sony box I showed you earlier, okay? Two megabytes yep. of RAM. And as, as I mentioned, the, the, the actual, you know, frame buffer is using, um, you know, about 600 uh, kilobytes of that, so really 1.4 megabytes. So we, that, that Web TV box showed the first um, stream, the first, um, you know, digital or stream, I don't know what you want to call it, but the first internet-based uh, TV ads in history. And the way that we did it was like this. I mean, of course, you couldn't, you know, uh, it's this tiny box, tiny amount of memory, and over a phone line, how could you play, you know, an ad? So it occurred to us that, you know, when the, when the thing is connecting, it's, it's doing this 800 number dial, getting a list of local, getting a phone number that is to dial locally and then dials a local phone number. You know, as the modems connect, you usually hear the boing, boing, or whatever, all the things going on while it's equalizing and so forth. That takes it about 30 seconds or so to attack, or 40 seconds. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if during that time an ad played instead of the road to HANA, you know, um, which is the, you know, the animation plays at the beginning. So Peter Barrett, who um, actually wrote the first HTML browser for us, it was sort of a hack browser, but allowed to continue development before we, you know, did a, a more full-fledged browser. He, um, and he was one of the people that did one of the, uh, some of the early um, uh, um, decompressors for QuickTime, you know, uh, video compression, decompression things for plugins for QuickTime. So he, he wrote a thing where, you know, at night the web TV thing would dial up um, and it would go and see if you have any email and then it would put a little, the red light would light up, you know, so you come and wake up in the morning, you could see if you have mail. And during the time when it checked for its email, what it would do, what he wrote is he had to go and download this ad, which, you know, we were able to fit into the 1.4 um, megabytes of memory, but it pushed everything out of RAM, except for the frame buffer, of course. And then he wrote a kind of a, a, a simplified version of MPEG-1 for a decoder that we could do and implement an MPEG-1 decoder in software. Then when the road to HANA came on, it would play that ad while you're waiting for it to connect. And it, it, we couldn't quite get it to the point where it quite filled up the whole screen, but it got to, I would say, about uh, maybe 80% of the screen width. And it was, it, there it was, the first ads. We got a couple advertisers to do that. It didn't last for very long. And then the thing is, after it completed the connection sequence of the modem, the ad was done. And then, of course, the RAM would be taken over to run the system. But those are the first television ads um, over the internet in history. And they're running on this little device, this incredible hack, where here it is using this very small piece of RAM, which just wasn't being used while we were connecting modems. And it gave people to, a chance to watch something. And for us, you know, we, we didn't really make that much money on those ads, but at least, you know, in theory, to be able to uh, create a new revenue source. So it's really everything we, we now know today, streaming video and everything, it, you can really say that uh, the whole, the advertising world for video started with that uh, hack that Peter did. Steve, I'm, I'm, really glad you told, I'm, I'm glad you told that story because Peter is another one of these just like otherworldly, um, in, incredible hackers. And uh, the, the video code hack you're talking about, Steve, he wrote um, something called Setpack, which was one of the first like super popular codecs for QuickTime. Um, and the browser that was the basis of the web TV browser, um, I remember well, Peter, you guys may remember a company called B. Uh, and B was a computer company and they were building their own operating system. It was called BOS. And Peter um, was interested in, and they had a computer called the B Box. And Peter was interested in programming that thing. And he, uh, one of the first programs he wrote for it was a web browser, and it was called Net Positive, um, and and that was actually the the basis of the web TV browser. Right. Yeah. As you know, as I said, we really we had such a small memory footprint because the thing is, we need to hit a, a price point. Not every wise when I hear about prices, but you know, um, here, I'm, here I'm sitting at a board meeting with uh, Bruce and Phil, plus the other board members were our investors. You know. And there was actually one guy who I knew that um, was um, another executive. Um, and the question is, what were we going to price this thing when it comes out? And the general rule of thumb back then, probably still somewhat true today, is that you, if you want to, you break even, if you have a, a bill of goods for a consumer device, 
if you're selling it for about double the price of the bill of goods, right? So web TV at that time, doubling it brought it to $329. So I argued that, look, and, but we knew we had cost reductions coming that would bring it down to the point where it'd be $199, you know, $200 for, the, for a double, you know, just $100 in parts. And um, I argued as strongly as I could to say that we should introduce this product for $199 and eat it, you know, lose some money on it um, because we're getting, you know, monthly revenue. And then, then we'll catch up and meet that price point in order to get as many units as we can. The investors were just worried about that. They said, we're, we can't sell something at a loss. We're too small a company. It's too risky, et cetera. And, and so, you know, we lost. The, um, uh, the engineering team were, was unable to convince the investors. And I was the CEO, but I, I certainly, you know, couldn't override uh, on a business decision, couldn't override the board directors. So Web TV was introduced at 329. So people said 329 plus, it was about, you know, $20 a month for the service. It was, it was too much. And we only sold 35,000 units the first Christmas. And Philips, I know, made over 100,000 units. I don't remember how many Sony did, but there were all these units were stuck in warehouse and it wasn't looking good. <laughs> and so, uh, and, you know, when we was, you know, the, the few months after that, of course, that Microsoft began to speak to us. When Microsoft acquired us, we had only sold 58,000 units into the market, and maybe off by a unit, you know, 57 or whatever, but somewhere in that mark, that, that ballpark, far, still far short of what was already manufactured sitting in the warehouse. But Microsoft saw the potential and they saw how it would lead to other things. And the, one of the very first thing they did after the acquisition is they lowered the price to 199. And when I later learned about that, um, and again, this affected decisions I made with other things I did later, whether well, other products and so forth, is that above 199, it becomes a two spouse buying decision. You've got to bring your spouse to make a decision to make a purchase. But 199 and below was a one spouse buying decision, which is why VCRs and other things at the time were priced there. So these little marketing tidbits and things like that, I mean, certainly coming from our engineering background, never thought I'd have to learn these things. But you know, the thing was intuitively, we all knew that things at 199, we didn't know why, things at 199 sold in vast numbers. And by the way, when we did drop to 199, yeah, that's when we began to have millions of sales. And, um, you know, again, I, I'll say again, to the extent you go and do your own thing and you have business people and you've got a new technology, you're introducing it, stick by your own instincts because they can't, the business folks just don't have the sense of the new world that you're picturing in your mind, but you know. Anyways. Um, Thank you so much. And Halen, yes, yeah, so you have a voice now. So yeah, if you I wanted to say hi and do you have one more question or? Um, I will say hi and I have, I have one more question and a couple people I want to thank uh, afterwards. So I, I want to say, hey, Joe, hey, Steve, it's really an honor to actually be able to ask you guys questions, uh, you know, after all the time I've spent just digging stuff up uh, about web TV. And uh, the people who got me into it can't thank them enough. Um, so the, the last thing I wanted to ask was, uh, what what made you guys think that you wanted to make the Web TV Plus uh, line of boxes come out. I don't know, Joe, do you want me to take it? Do you want to take some of it? Or do I do? No, okay. go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. Okay, so um, if you look at the... Uh, God, you know, I probably have it somewhere. If you look at the original pitch deck, you know, that we gave to investors... And we were telling about what we were going to do, what how the company was going to go. The Web TV Plus, oh, right, right, it wasn't called Web TV Plus, but you know, um, a a set top box that could browse the web and could record television programs onto a hard disk, and would also have video games playable on the hard, you know, on it and so forth, and all in one box. That was in the original. Um, that was the original plan for what we set out to do. We, you know, one of the things that, that's hard to, to, to think about, you know, interactive TV, the idea that your TV could be interactive. When I was at Apple, after Apple, and there's all these different companies that tried to do it, and there was a chicken and an egg problem. 
there were no devices that could really allow you to interact with your TV because there's no content that you could run on the device with this. And then there's no content because there are no devices and so forth. So we saw web TV and, and the advent of, of all this content on the web, even though it was at the time purchased for a uh, purpose for um, PCs and Macs, we saw it as, um, as a, a way to launch the first interactive TV device. And we want to do it at a low price point and we want to go and, and eventually make it so that it became sort of a, you know, an advanced computing device. We, I know this is, sounds crazy, but we, although, you know, Joe was, was, you know, he was at 3DO and we were well aware of the PlayStation 1, we definitely saw, you know, uh, the power of, of having something like a CD-ROM, but we were looking ahead. We were looking at, you know, we, the first gigabyte drives had just come out um, and we were, uh, and the three gigabyte drives and the nine gigabyte drives were coming. So we saw it as, you know, eventually filling up those drives. Joe talked earlier about one way, which is through the, you know, vertical blanking interval. Um, but also we figured, look, let the modems run all night long because the, the modem banks that we, you know, paid for, we paid for by how many we, they were utilized. So if the thing was connected to a modem in the middle of the night, 2, 3 a.m., and not many people are using it, as long as we didn't exceed the number of, of modems that were available to dial into, it didn't cost us anymore. So we saw that th these would be boxes that, that are just loading themselves constantly, constantly with more and more information. And then what was the point of doing the solo chips as opposed to you know, solo two as opposed to solo one? We wanted full on game capability. We wanted to be better than PlayStation, better than 3DO. We wanted to keep evolving. So the, the, uh, getting back to about the Web TV Plus in particular, the Web TV Plus was an interme intermediate step between the first Web TV which you know we had we had to get it out at low cost and had to you know, run on a you know out of a you know out of you know two megabytes of ROM and uh, one megabyte of flash and um, uh, was very limited what it could do so that was then we were going to get to having a disk drive which now could have a lot more you know a lot more code obviously running on it um, and also the disk you know as you know it had a tuner in it so we could tune to PBS and download data and we thought okay we'll add the ability to like you know, provide a program guide and so forth. And then, uh, then the dish player was in the works and I spoke to Charlie Ergen and I was the CEO of dish, still the CEO of dish. And, um, at the time the cable companies had come out with video on demand. Um, and so the, the satellite operators couldn't compete with that because of course it was a broadcast. So I said to Charlie, look, with a big hard disk, I can record shows. Um, that are, are, you know, whenever, whenever they're broadcast on your satellite, and then you can deliver them on demand, and uh, you can compete with cable. And he said, all right, I'm going to do it. And so he, he did that deal. So when we were acquired by Microsoft, we not only had the Web TV Plus uh, that was about to be introduced, um, but the dish player was in development. And um, it was, you know, and, and we already had a deal in place with... Uh, with a dish or it was almost done. The deal was almost closed. So I guess, you know, that was a very long answer to a short question, but the Web TV Plus was halfway to where we wanted to get to and it was planned from the outset. Yeah, um, that, that's some really cool stuff there. Uh, I guess some, some people I want to thank before I uh, step off the stage and have the mic handed over to Matt. I. Uh, I really want to thank Jar for the work I've done with him. I want to thank Tommy for the work that he's done with you guys. Uh, Emac for his uh, all his efforts in reverse engineering and such. Uh, Zephy for his mini serve project. And uh, I know I'm going to be forgetting some people, but uh, I want to thank Matt for some of the stuff he's been documenting over the years and has up on his website. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much, Halen, for joining us. And uh, yeah, I was actually planning on potentially throwing a couple of those people under the bus, but I feel like we have some other questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move uh, I'm gonna move Jeff up here. Jeff worked on the X-Band keyboard project, uh, hacking wise. Jeff, go ahead and take the stage. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, thanks, Joe and Steve, for 
taking some time and answering some questions for us. Um, Joe, I had a question for you. Um, you had okay. sent me the uh, source code for the keyboard firmware a few years ago, and uh -huh. um, I got just really kind of obsessed with that about two years ago when you had sent that to me. It's been a while since I've looked at the project. I've been trying to motivate myself to get back into it, but um, I just had some some nerdy technical questions about that. Um, I don't know if you'll even remember the details, but um, when I was digging through the XBAN uh, source code for the actual modem, um, there was some comments in there where um, you guys were, the original modem was uh, looking, it was basically re looking at the uh, controls every, like every frame. So 60 times a second, you guys were checking controller status. And then at a certain point, it looks like that was changed to only read controls uh 15 times a second so like every three or four frames controls are getting updated and i noticed that the x-band keyboard it sent scan codes uh when keys are pressed down but it didn't send scan codes when the keys are released um and there are some comments in the um uh, firmware source code uh commenting on you know we're going to lower this Actually, no, no, the the modem firmware, it was lowered to 15. And then in your keyboard firmware, at some point, you were like, oh, we're getting rid of scan codes for when keys are released so that we don't lose key presses. Um, I was wondering, was that because it was only scanning, you know, 15 times a second, your, your buffer was getting filled up? Um, and then also, uh, you had commented on a YouTube video that I had uploaded a few years ago um, about when the keyboards initially plugged in and it wasn't recognizing key presses. And um, I actually figured out the bug there. It was some code that you had added in like the day before you guys sent the firmware to manufacturing. And it was uh, some change. <laughs> it was some changes you had added in to attempt to have the keyboard, you know, plugged into the second controller port, not interfere with uh, with other games when they're being played. But um, yeah, the way that was written, it was like you have to hold a key down on the keyboard when you first turn the Genesis on for the keyboard to be recognized. Otherwise, I think, again, it has to do with because controls are only being read 15 times a second and not every frame. Um, it's like you have to push a key on a specific frame for the keyboard to even be initially detected and everything. So um, I guess my question is um, if you could just kind of talk about, you know, having to develop the firmware and develop that keyboard after the initial modem had been shipped and any issues you kind of encountered along with that process and maybe also trying to make that work along with the Sega, you know, and the Super Nintendo, um, basically being the same piece of hardware that you guys had shipped, you know, with sure. just some, yeah. <clears throat> uh, those are great questions. Uh, I wish my memory was that good. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the parts I remember. Um, once it was pretty clear that we were going to have chat and email, uh, we knew we wanted to have a keyboard and I remember us talking about there's got to already be a keyboard for the Genesis and somebody said there's a keyboard in Japan and we tried to track it down and we were not able to. Um, and then I'm sure you've probably also seen reference to the Eric Smith keyboard. Um, that was the, the mm -hmm. very first prototype. So Eric uh, wrote code for a, a, a PIC microcontroller to convert a PS2 keyboard um, into a protocol we could read with the, with the joystick port. Um, but then, and, and you're right, then we shipped the modem and then we kind of came back to that and we're like, okay, we need to, we need to build our own keyboard. Um, and the way I remember that going down was we, we went to Fry's uh, and we found some, some small keyboards that were PC keyboards that looked reasonable uh, from a form factor point of view. And, and that was actually how we found the company that wound up making the production keyboard. Um, I think it was called D Shen. It was like a Korean company. Uh, but because we needed to speak this alien protocol, we had to figure out um, how, to, how to build the firmware. And, you know, we, we, we'd all done uh, different embedded systems before, but none of us had ever actually built like a, a PC style keyboard. And my friend Matt Hershenson and I, we started just looking for the cheapest microcontroller we could find. And we found this part from um, Samsung. I remember we looked at like 4-bit micros and we looked at 8-bit micros. Um, and then we finally found this part from Samsung that was specifically designed to be a, a PC keyboard controller. And they had reference code for it uh, to, to build a PC keyboard. I mean, this was a part they would sell to PC clone makers that wanted to make their own keyboards. 
Uh, but the weird thing about it was all the firmware was written in this compiled fourth, uh, which, and you know, fourth is it's very old and, and very um, uh, kind of idiosyncratic, interesting language. Um, and that actually was the beginning of, of my sort of love affair with fourth. I, I, I actually do remember uh, the code we got from Samsung was pretty messy. And I can actually visualize printing it all out uh, and then having these printouts on the floor of my apartment and then a bunch of colored pencils as I was, or colored pens as I was figuring out the logic in it and then reformatting it uh, and modifying the part that, that actually squirted the characters out to speak our um, catapult protocol. Um, I don't remember why we changed it from every frame to, to the lower frame rate. Uh, maybe we were having some problem with the, the keyboard being able to respond accurately. But as far as like missing characters, the tester for that was Andy McFadden. Andy McFadden could type faster than anybody else in the company. And he was the guy that would bang on it and tell me when he could outrun the keyboard and I had to figure out how to fix it. Andy McFadden also comes up later in the story, after actually I had left Catapult, Andy was still there, I was off working on, X, uh, on uh, web TV, and it turns out, and I don't remember the details of the bug, I'm sure Andy probably remembers, there was a bug in the keyboard firmware that would wind up, it would send up a character that had like the high bit set, and none of the characters were supposed to have the high bit set, and that would percolate up to the server, uh, and it would go into some of, um, uh, oh, actually, I think there was a compression step. I can't remember if the compression was happening on the box or if it was happening in the server. Uh, but anyway, it made Andy McFadden's um, decompressor blow up. Uh, and so if you did the right thing with the keyboard on an X-Band modem, you could actually crash the X-Band service. So that was pretty exciting. That's, uh, yeah, that... <laughs> That's so funny that, you know, things just the way they were built back then. It's like something like that would never happen these days. And just yeah. um, the fragility of older systems and, and learning about that is pretty fascinating. Joe, one of the things I'm trying to remember is that, you know, um, so one thing when we first, you know, started working on, um, uh, you know, expand, we didn't know, you know, actually whether or not we could pull it off. The first thing we thought of was actually synchronizing the actual video displays on each end of the modem so that they literally would be scanning, you know, in synchrony to, with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that was the, where the synchrotron name came. And, right, right. And Joe, if I remember correctly, you implemented that in Mortal Kombat. You actually made, that's the way you did that. Yeah. That but, yeah. When, but that was based on a, an assumption that was incorrect that all the games would compute all the game logic in, in a 60th of a second. Because yes. when I was in other games, certain, and I can tell you it's true with NBA Jam, which I wrote the, I wrote the port for, that was not true. It would, take, it would take a variable amount of time. Sometimes it would complete before the game was, before the 60th, 60th of a second was completed. Sometimes it would take more, more time. And so sampling the game controllers, as I recall, um, um, varied depending on how long it took to get through its cycle. Mm. Um, I don't remember how we did that. Um, and I, but I think that because we had two, and it got really tricky because you would get an edge, you know, a very slight variation between one game and the next because just because, you know, um, whether the CPU clock was a little bit different or whether or not it had different refresh, memory refresh cycles, which would take the CPU, which would cause the, T, the CPU to stall during those times. So we, you had slightly different execution speed on each side of the wire. And I'm trying to remember whether or not we actually um, pulled the controllers on a regular basis anyways, or whether or not we waited until the game logic completed. And, and, but I, I do think it was on a game-by-game -game basis. Well, how you're, tickling, you're tickling a memory, Steve. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think we did play around with the way we sampled the controllers for that very reason. Yeah. So I'm not sure where the keyboard fits into all this because the keyboard was running in, you know, we had a small amount of code that was running on the actual, you know, X-Band mm -hmm. you know, device that was plugged in. That was obviously not the code running the cartridge because the cartridge doesn't know anything about a keyboard. Right. Um, so that part, I don't know um, how that code ran. Because when the game was not running and you were like chatting with somebody, and then you're just mm -hmm. running an R or 
character face in our code. You know what I mean? Yeah. As I yeah. Remember, so the... go ahead, Jeff. Oh yeah, just from kind of looking over both the the XBand OS key uh, source code, um, the way it looks like it works is like once you boot into a game, you know the game is um, refreshing controls as however the game does. Then once you jump back into the XBand operating system, um, the OS was uh, reading you know controls uh, fifteen times a second, and it kind of looked like um, it looked like the Eric Smith you know initial. Um, prototype adapter was being developed at the same time that the actual operating system was on the modem. It was, and yeah. What, yeah, when the Eric Smith adapter was was built, the OS was still um, reading uh, controls controls at sixty times a second, and then mm -hmm. I think just to free up CPU um, at some point, the operating system was changed to only read controls fifteen times a second, and that was kind of an oversight going from the initial prototype adapter to the actual uh, manufactured keyboard, because I think the buffer, you know, would get filled up with key presses because they were only being read from the operating system 15 times a second now instead of 60. So it right. kind of looked like you got you had to make that change to not send the release scan codes because it was just scanning extra scan codes that you didn't ne necessarily need. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and I, I don't think we actually use the key ups for anything. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is interesting you were talking about that the, the firmware is actually the same in the SNES and the Genesis keyboards. There's just like one I.O. pin you pull one way or the other to put it in SNES or Genesis mode. Yeah, I actually took it apart and I uh, <laughs> I saw just this one little uh, pin. It's like a jumper. It's like a solder yeah. jumper. But yeah, yeah, like if it's soldered one way, it's an NES keyboard or Super NES. If it's the other way, it's yeah. a Genesis keyboard. So yeah. I, I also wanted to comment on the... Um, when I was ex exchanging some emails with you, we talked about, um, I think it was after you had left the company, you weren't aware of it. Um, X-Band was also marketed in Brazil. Um, they called it the MegaNet 2 service, and it was basically a carbon copy of uh, X-Band in Brazil translated into Portuguese. Um, right. In our emails, you had mentioned Portugal. Um, it was actually, yeah, Brazil and South America where they had released MegaNet 2, which was just a translated X-Band. And they actually released a version of the keyboard in South America for MegaNet 2 as well. And um, I managed to get a hold of one of those keyboards and wow. it works with X-Band. It, it works with X-Band and vice versa. So um, it's the same firmware running on the South American keyboard as well which um, in South America they run, you know, they use PAL, so it's scanning at 50 hertz, not 60. Ah, and, um, interesting. Apparently all the, all the timings are still good enough where it works at either 50 or 60 hertz. Um, it was kind of a funny story to get that keyboard out of Brazil. Um, they're so rare. Um, I managed to find one on um, this website. It was called Mercado, Mercado Live, I think. It was like the Brazilian version of eBay. And um, some somebody had one of the MegaNet two keyboards for sale, but they only would accept uh, cash for it, and they would, you know, um, it was only for sale in Brazil. And I found this third party website called For Repack. It was like an exporting service, and I was like, man, this is so sketchy. I don't know if this company is gonna, you know, steal my money, but um, <laughs> I paid out them some money, and they got a hold of the keyboard, and then like two months later, it showed up at my house. It was wrapped in a frosted flakes box uh with all of the all of the text it was in portuguese it's it was uh <laughs> that is portuguese cool. Br brazil you know cool. frosted flakes box is like all right here's my MegaNet 2 keyboard so an x-band clone in brazil did you know about that joe well the only reason i know is because khan actually talked about it in the documentary um and he talked about how they just they told the brazil guys like we're not going to give you any support. We're going to give you like a dump of everything. You go off and figure out how to make it work. And I guess they did. It's wild. I forgot about that. <laughs> but, but, but So Jeff, the, the, the Brazilian keyboard, does it look the same? It looks identical minus the X-Band logo uh, that okay. was on okay. the American keyboard. But uh, yeah, okay. that, it's, it's identical. No, the keyboard interesting. Was a, the keyboard oh, is a to total hack, right? I mean, like, I'm sure if you took it apart, you noticed that like there's light pipes for three LEDs, but there's only like one LED actually installed. It's because uh -huh. we didn't want to change the tooling for the keyboard, didn't want to change the tooling for the keycaps either. That's why there's a bunch of blank keycaps. That was a super rush job hack thing. The yeah, interesting... Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, I was going to say, yeah, before I took it apart, I was like, how do... I, what are these other LEDs used for? And then I took it apart. I was like, oh, there's not even any lights there. Yeah, yeah. So an interesting thing about the 
Brazilian MegaNet modems is they actually modified the OS and had some slightly different features that were not in the American box. Now, they were they were technically in the American box, but like from like challenge you could actually connect and just go into chat without using one of the secret games or entering a code. Mm. Um and uh, I don't remember what else. There's a couple weird minor quirks. Maybe somebody else there knows about that stuff. That's wild. <laughs> um, you know, we should just have um we should have uh our Brazilian friend, uh, we should have him dump it. Uh, no, who would, who is the guy who basically got the service running again back in Brazil? Uh, Wallace. Wallace. Oh, I didn't know that. Huh. Well, maybe we could talk with him to get a hold of one of those. Yeah, so the tech toy stuff is a it's really hard to get a surprisingly hard to get a hold of. Yeah, when um, I found that key that keyboard, I was like, "All right, how do I get this out of the country?" Yeah. <laughs> it was a big. By project. the way, by the way, thank you so much for your question, Jeff. Oh and yeah, thanks, Jeff. We're gonna um, actually. Uh, I'm gonna check you guys first. Uh, you guys doing all right? Everything good? Do you wanna jet? You wanna stay a little longer? Take more? I'll stay it's as long as you guys want to talk. Uh, I will too, but, but guys, I got to take a little bio break. I'll, I'll be right back. Absolutely. Okay, so so you can I'll tell you guys know, what. Let's take a. Joe, that he, uh, I would not answer if you were there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So actually, what what Joe has probably on a good idea. Joe, I think we should take a quick five minute break and uh, come back. I know we have. Another question in the queue, if you guys have any more questions, or even if you just want to say a heartfelt thanks and you haven't had a chance to take the stage, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to get to everybody. And uh, we're, we'll just do a quick break here. And if you guys are still listening, uh, eleven oh five is when we'll uh, we'll shoot for here. It's central. <laughs>
Pod strach? Hey Joe, I'm here too. Hey. hey. All right, so Joe, we just said with you going out, we we're gonna take a quick break. But if you okay. guys, if you guys want, if you guys want to start, we can. Whatever you guys want to do, whatever Steve wants to do. Yeah, we are at your disposal. Uh, well, honestly, we're at your guys' disposal. But thank you so much again. Uh, let's go ahead and I. Well. I guess we, we kind of already called a break, so in case anybody's not here, um, we're going to start back up at 05 here. Okay. So. All right, guys, it's 05. Just let me know when you guys are already here. So we have a couple more questions here. Um, while I'm here, and let me actually run to my mic or my uh, mouse. All right, Fresh Egg. So Fresh Eggs is actually working on Super Nintendo X-Band emulation. We're going to bring him on the stage. I'm sure he's got some interesting questions. Go go ahead when you get a second, Fresh. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me OK? Absolutely. Yes. Great. Yeah. Uh, first, thanks for putting this on. And thanks to Joe and Steve for taking the time. It's really cool to uh, be in a room with the two of you after watching a documentary and spending time with the code that you wrote. Fun. Our pleasure. Um, Absolutely. Specifically, and apologies if it was asked, uh, I had to miss most of the session, unfortunately, but uh, one of the things that I liked learning about while emulating for the Super Nintendo was ADSP. And I was always curious. Uh, because that's like a, a, a fascinating time to choose a protocol, I find. Uh, I wondered if there was a particular motivation for choosing ADSP, and if there were any alternatives that were considered, uh, what were they? Steve Perlman, I do not remember. Would this have been like Jevons would... or um, Ryan Topping? Or one of it would be a Topping thing. Yeah. ADSP. Um, I'm not even sure which protocol you're referring to. Uh, like, Apple yeah. Talk data yeah, streaming. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that would definitely be topping that. Yeah. yeah I mean, 
it's because we all came from Apple, you know, and, and um, yeah. I think it was probably very fresh in his mind. Yeah, I think one thing that it's hard for people to believe or people to really understand who didn't live in that era is that, you know, the Internet, we had the Internet, you know, there wasn't the web. There was no web. Right. Or it, it was really being in its infancy, being used by largely, you know, academic institutions. Using, but geez, really, Mosaic even really didn't take hold, I would say, until, um, well, maybe just shortly thereafter. But it wasn't then, you know. In fact, that's one of the reasons General Magic developed Telescript, is there really wasn't a protocol like that. So when we were going and talking about communication protocols over a phone line, where it wasn't part of anything else, we would turn to things that we had learned before. And um, I don't know the exact answer to your question, but I do know that, you know, we, we had all done lots of work at Apple and we had, and a lot of the uh, thinking about the structure of packets and protocols and things like that, um, of course, a lot of those things have been ironed out. And we um, so I, I, my guess is that we just brought it with us, and it was the thing that we had in front of us. Well, and your your point about uh, mosaic is really interesting too, because I think HTML came from something called SGML, which was I believe mainly used for like um, laying out books and manuals. Um, and so I could see how that would be if you were familiar with it, uh, a natural thing to base a layout language on for, um, for a computer. Yes. And, and the other thing is, well, this is going far afield from your question, but I apologize for it, but that's, you know, that's a lot of us, for. <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, the, um, even going further back, um, when I look at what was the first time I saw something where there was a hyperlinked set of documents where information was organized by hyperlinks. It was when um, um, Bill... Atkinson. No, not Bill Gates, no. Was it Bill Atkinson. Bill Atkinson showed me HyperCard. Yes. But HyperCard was all local to one machine. In fact, it, you know, it would run on a, on a disk, but then, you know, one of the things they, they did was somewhere it was a CD-ROM. CD-ROMs were the only things that were big we had, you know, the disk drives early on were, you know, 20, 40, you know, and 80 gigabytes and so forth, 80 megabytes. And, but the CD-ROMs, you know, those were hold 600 megabytes. So that was the big deal. And this was a way of organizing information. So then it, um, the, I always, when I first saw Mosaic working um, on top of the internet, I thought, oh my gosh, this is hypercard for, um, for the internet, you know? And and then, and I, I agree, with Joe. I mean, look, any of you guys work with HTML, you can see it look. It does look like a layout language for documents. And then they, of course, added other things to it, including you know the ability to execute things like JavaScript and so forth. But um, but you know one you know this thing about one thing being built on top of other and one and things that we learn um, being carried over to the next thing are, is very true. I mean, you have to be careful. You don't want to, anything that's, that's that's intellectual property. You know, you're not going to take obviously. But stuff that is not intellectual property, um, but nonetheless, you know, you learn about a way of doing things that does carry over. And, and I think, yeah, and I think um, this kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier about um, how now there's like technology that's more kind of diffused across a much larger population. Uh, and it's certainly a lot easier to find stuff now on the internet when you want to do something you can look around and pretty easily find something that's probably close to what it is you have in mind, if it's not exactly what you have in mind. Um, but before the web, that wasn't the case. And so you would kind of fall back on the things that you knew. And a, a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, there were, there were certain examples of ideas or technologies that if you were, if you were in the space and you were interested in, in computers and these kinds of things, like, you would know about because they were so remarkably well thought out or put together that everybody knew about them, right? If you were in that relatively small like collection of people. And so when I think about things like hyperlinks and mosaic and then the connection it has to SGML, well, two other connections that I can think of, you know, much earlier in time, one was this crazy book called Computer Lib by a guy named Ted Nelson that came out in the 70s. 
that was all about the future of computers. And Ted was talking about hyperlinks in that book. Um, but then that book, uh, you know, it, it was heavily inspired by um, uh, a, a, a hypothetical machine called the Memex that was envisioned by a guy named Vannevar Bush back in the 1940s. And he had imagined this big kind of desk-like computer that had a couple of displays that you could use to um, search for information through hyperlinks. So, you know, the, the, the concept has been around for a really, really long time. And just over time, um, the, the, the folks who were really steeped in that world and interested in it uh, continued to build on it. And of course now, with it reaching kind of critical mass with the World Wide Web, um, now there's a, a much larger population of people who um, can take those concepts and build on them. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks for uh, thanks for the context. I, I kind of figured it was uh, baggage from Apple, just given uh, the backgrounds of most of the people who are working on it. Uh, but yeah, that that slice of uh, a point in time where networked things weren't quite as figured out as they are now. Everything yeah. is the same now. It's just very boring. <laughs> to... Yeah, I mean, think think about the alternative. It would have been like to invent from scratch <laughs> some yeah, protocol. Yeah. The thing is, is that really um, its place in X-Band was to be the the protocol that kind of glued the structure of packets together. And I mean, given the choice, ADFP was actually a, a pretty good decision. Was it the most lightweight for the time? I'll be honest, I, I don't know too much about protocols then, but, you know, it definitely did its job. So one thing I'll, I'll add is that, you know, um, and we didn't do this for all the games, um, but we had a problem with, you know, we're going over a phone line, someone's playing a game, and then someone pick up an extension phone in someone's house. Or, you know, there could be noise on the phone line in one form or another. Or people had call waiting, which meant that, um, you know, if someone called while you're on the phone, it would uh, there'd be a tone that the phone would make, right? So you could tell that a call was coming in. And that, of course, all of those things would disrupt the communications. And then you would get the two games out of sync, right? Because there'd be data that you expected uh, that you were sending from you know, your controller or the other one or vice versa. So in the case, we didn't do it with all the games. I did do it with NPA Jam. When uh, what I ended up having to do was built in um, error correction so that um, we, would, we didn't have a lot of bandwidth. You know, it was a, it was a, was it a, a 2400 bit per second modem, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you think about that and you think about, you know, uh, 60 times a second and you and you got, you know, a controller that you've got to send and you may have some other information that goes along, right? Like, for example, resetting the random number seeds to be the same or anything else. Okay, when there was a... So what I did was I tried various schemes to go and send error correction information and error, also error detect information. I tried all sorts of um, things like um, having, you know, checksums and um, and various other things that were not too heavy. In the end, what I found was work the best was to send the data twice. So every every key press on the controller, I'd send twice, so two bytes. And then if the bytes didn't match at the other end, then I knew there was a disruption. I would cause the game to freeze, and then there would be a message sent back to the other machine for it to freeze. And um, and it would then, then the two uh, machines would go and align themselves, which meant stepping through the game until they were once again on the same frame and once again on, where the logic was all locked together. And then the game would resume. Now, when the game paused like that, um, because of, of, um, of noise, there was, uh, you know, it, it seemed odd because the game would just stop. And so I had to I would put up a little message for the user that to say that there was um, line noise. Now, how do you, so think about it, you know, Sega has very, very particular, this is what Genesis has very particular way it does graphics. So I had to find the right elements that were already in the ROM <laughs> because we didn't have any memory to make up the letters L-I-N-E-N-O-I-S-E. -E. So it just appeared. <laughs> over the screen uh, yeah. the blocks, okay? And uh, so that's how I would have a little line noise message. So there again, 
there was there was no past history of somebody sending controllers for multiplayer games over a phone line. And certainly nobody was dealing with with call waiting or or your no. kid phone if you have the extension phone, right? So we figure out a way to deal with it, right? Yeah, that was a great hack, Steve. Oh, thanks. <laughs> But it was uh, if you if you do use NBA Jam and you pick up a phone, you, hopefully it still shows uh, line noise. <laughs> I'll have to try that out. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Fresh Eggs. Yeah. Oh, uh, we're gonna bring up Doctor Claw. Doctor Claw, uh, if you have a question, how's it going, Doctor Claw? Hey, hey. Uh, I'm real excited uh, and. Uh... Thank you. Um, my uh, just a quick question. I just wanted to know if there's any uh, games that that didn't make the cut, uh, or like you know were in prototype but just didn't get, get released. Uh, maybe anything. I know that there's some that obviously theoretically would never work, uh, like really intensive shooters or something like that. I suppose, but you know, seeing see what was out there. Steve, do you remember? Like, I'm sure there was some stuff probably being worked on after you and I had left Catapult. Yeah, I'm sure there was. You know, here's the thing. Um, we, first of all, again, remember this whole thing took from, you know, May 1994 to in stores in September, 19, which means it left our hands really in late July. So it was May to July was the development time because it, it takes about a month or, or six weeks to get through the uh, distribution pipeline. So, um, and A, you know, maybe the PF Magic guys were right. It was impossible, you know what I mean? <laughs> we didn't know if we could get these games working. And we're looking at this code and trying to find every place where there's random number thing. We don't have any tools. So we're having to develop our tools as we're going along. You know what I mean? And um, uh, so I would say the reason that games did not get released was actually not about things like you mentioned um, first person shooters. That would be like a latency question or something. No, I think we were good enough on latency. Going across the country, if you had a long distance call, maybe the latency mattered, you know, because there you're adding, you know, through the phone line, um, you know, many tens of milliseconds, right? But we're, if you're, you know, kind of on one coast or another or one time zone, um, that, and, and there was a certain latency going through the modem, um, that was good enough for all the games that were out there. But the, um, it was the case, though, that we were stumped very often trying to get these games and figuring out every, everything about the game that could be random or could vary from one machine to the other. And, you know, it was just a lot of work to go and find out where are the random number generators, where are the seeds, and um, hard to go and find the beginning of the, um, you know, of the, uh, of the, you know, the, the game, um, where the game began for its, uh, you know, per frame or per, you know, um, and it wasn't per frame time, as, we, as I said. Very often the, the, the frame of the game would take more than one frame time in order to complete. So finding all those things was uh, a lot of work um, when you're dealing with, you know, pure machine code, you know. Um, and um, that, I would say, was the biggest factor in what games got out there. And I remember, Joe, you, you, know, you and I were on the front lines of that battle. The mo mm -hmm. there was, and then there was like, um, who's working on the hockey game? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Froelich. Mark Froelich. Mark Froelich. Okay. And then there was one other one we had at the time um, at the first launch. And I just was worried that we would not have any games working. Right. And then we had those four, which fortunately were pretty big games at the time, you know, so... We thought people would be excited. We would get a lot of people using it. And then it just, every new game that came out, it was a slog. So the choice really was looking at what are the big sellers, which are the ones that people are likely to have, because right. it was such a difficult task to reverse engineer them. But, you know, we had this, um, we built out a small team. It was like three or four guys um, after those first ones, right? So uh, Mortal Kombat 1 was Shannon, Mortal Kombat 2 was me, NBA Jam was you. Um, Froelich was doing, uh, Froelich did Road Rage and the hockey game. Um, and then there were one or two other guys that, uh, that did like some of the, the SNES titles. Did Richard Kiss, was he a game cracker? I know. That's right. We called them game crackers. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I don't remember. Was um, Richard Kiss would have done uh, the Mario Kart patch on the Super Nintendo side. That's right. That's right. And you know, Richard Kiss went on to be a stand-up comedian. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> if you search on YouTube, you can find some of them, uh, his act. Yeah. Did, did Kevin Snow... Um, mm. one uh, Kevin Snow, that name sounds familiar, too. I think he did one. But the other thing is, um, we had one guy who uh, <laughs> went insane, and he was committed during the... Uh, Oh, dude. Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna share his name, but um, but yeah, there was an episode at at Great America. Uh, you know, it was it was really really gnarly. It was pretty scary. Yeah, the guy went absolutely bananas, and um, so we had to deal with that too. And um, you know, whether or not, you know, um, it, it I, he he had it wasn't the company. I mean, look, we were working uh, working people so hard. It could drive you insane, but not in that way. He, this was a more of a schizophrenic kind of thing. Yeah. But that added to the complexity. I mean, that's an HR issue, and it's like a distraction from the team. He was coming by the lab and bothering people and so forth. It was really, really crazy. And then he the got guy, shot right for something. I don't remember. <laughs> the guy was a total genius, though. Oh, you know who he is? Yeah. Um, in his own way. Um, in his own way. Of course... You know what? Everyone who worked there was uh, pretty brilliant. They had you had to be. Um, yes. and, okay. That, uh, I, no, there's an important cracker we're leaving out too. I don't know if you guys. This is kind of a joke, but I don't know if you guys remember that Khan did the balls patch. Oh my god! I completely forgotten that. <laughs> right. Balls. That's really funny. Yeah, he loved the day. <laughs> well, and, and balls was from our our friends at PF Magic. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That was their game. That was yeah. their one game. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yep. I, well, I, I just remember. Of all the I titles. Remember. What's that? Just of all the titles, you know, he picked that one. Balls. Yeah, well, yeah, for the obvious reasons. But there's things going on that we won't go into. Um, yeah. It was a um, – I had a, um, you know, an admin – Administrative assistant, you know, back she actually liked to be called the secretary. She was sort of old school, and um, I think she was the only adult there. Uh, and, she was. Uh, was that? She was, yeah. So Stacy, Stacy Cheney, yeah, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, lady, and uh, she was there. She was the one who would go and pick through the rubble every morning, and uh, you know. Uh, I remember she said she was sh one time she told me she was shocked because she's picking up all the garbage, the you know junk food and everything else. Um, and I was passed out. Solo was wandering around licking things and everything. And I remember she picked up it was something a pizza box or something, and uh, there was a guy sleeping underneath it, and she was shocked. <laughs> she was you know, it well, just started. The, the, the other story I remember, Steve, is like in not the first building, but the, the second building we were in, there was like this big purple beam that uh, that was where I'm the term architectural element, like it like spanned the whole building. And one night, someone, I will not reveal their name, but it was not me, uh, used black electrical tape to spell out F-U-C-K in big letters on the purple beam. Uh, and then everybody went home, right, because that was like in the middle of the night. Well, the next morning, I think there was like a board meeting, and Stacy came in and <laughs> found that. You know, it's like you walk in the building, and there's this giant four-letter word, like, floating above uh, the whole building. And um, so the first thing she did, because Stacy was awesome, is, like, she got uh, a ladder, and she started trying to take the tape down. But as she was peeling it off, it was pulling the paint off. So it started leaving, like, this big F, you know, in peeled-off paint, so that wasn't going to work. So because she was also brilliant, she just taped a big piece of white paper up over it so that anybody who came in wouldn't see it. Steve, do you remember that? Yeah, well, that, and there's other things um, <laughs> in the morning. The thing is, because you know, she worked for me, um, she would go and give me a report on things, and I was already <laughs> so freaking exhausted, and she would go. The thing about her that made her perfect for what we were doing, there was nothing absolutely nothing that would phase her right it could be weird it could be this or that it had 
there were something sometimes people found um under the covers in some of the rooms and um <laughs> in the morning there was a person who had not worked there but spent the night there with someone and she'd say <laughs> would you uh, would you like some coffee <laughs> you know? and uh etc you know it was like as if nothing had happened you know what i mean and while they're wrapped in a, in a blanket so it really it, it was it was it was the crazy home away from home again you're everything went on there and yeah. uh it was this uh it was just like a time i just don't know of any other time like that and stacy was there as the one small little corner of of stability and um sanity and and adulthood in the whole place right so did uh no, a good story that I've heard. Um, I believe somebody got their. Uh, I believe somebody got their sunbox sold there. No, if you guys know about this one. Some things. What, what's a sunbox? Uh, like the, the... A Solaris. Okay. Uh, some. Oh Wait, yeah. Know. We're running on some sort of a workstation. Think... For the service, I don't remember what it was. I don't think it was a Solaris Sun, was it? I remember Fadden loved Solaris uh, or Sun OS. Like he was a big Sun guy. Okay. So I think I think what happened is uh, somebody there had a had their own Solaris box, and they okay. were pretty proud of it. They brought it in, and okay. I think you guys, I think somebody else hid it in the ceiling tiles. Oh no no no! That was that was Ted Cohn's next machine. So Ted Cohn had a crackers, wasn't he? Or what was he working on? Ted, Ted 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 was working on the uh, some part of the OS. Um, but okay. Ted had a um, he had a, an original Next Cube, and like he had bought it when it was new. He had all the original boxes and everything, and um, he was going to sell it. And somebody, and he was really proud of the fact he had all the original shipping containers and everything. Um, someone, you know, we have these drop ceilings with the ceiling tiles. Somebody just like pushed up a ceiling tile, put all the boxes up there, and then brought the ceiling tiles back down. And then uh, when, when Ted was asking what happened to it, all these stories about, oh, the cleaners must have taken it, like don't know what happened to it. Uh, but yeah, Ted was pretty unhappy about that. Yep. There were there were there were so many pranks, man. Like there was this other one we did, like uh you know how like a TV works. These are all CRT TVs, obviously, from the time. And the TV works by like scanning a raster, right? It goes from like the upper left corner and scans out these scan lines. Well, that's all controlled like with this big coil on the back of the on the back of the TV tube, right? That's like generating these um electromagnetic fields that are actually moving the, the electron beam. Yo. One, one night, we took apart uh, someone's TV, and we just reversed the, the, um, the x-axis. So it would scan backward. This is really easy to do with a CRT TV, just reverse two wires. Um, and so when you turn the TV on, the whole image is just mirrored, right, around the y-axis, flipped around the y-axis. And that, that alone was pretty funny. But then Josh Horowitz was like, oh, we should also open up the joypad and reverse the left and right keys. And it was like, oh yes, absolutely. So took apart the joypad, cut the traces, ran some wires, flipped left and right. So when this person fired their machine up the next day, the screen was reversed. And then they grabbed the controller, but the joypad worked the right way. And so they thought, oh, it must be like some bug. And they went about trying to debug it. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> There's other things we also did that we're not going to talk about. But anyways, uh, yes. Well, like, you, guys are you guys are digging and digging, but uh, maybe we should move on to the next question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have any more questions? Oh, hold on. Give me a second here. Um... <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, sorry guys. Uh, we're gonna bring back Hello Mumble on the stage here. Hey. Hello. Uh, Welcome hi. back. Um, 
Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing me back, Tommy. Um, so uh, one thing I want to mention about PF Magic is that they've actually went on to make like the dogs, cats, and pets series as well as babies, which got up, bought by Ubisoft and became a shovelware series afterwards. Um, but they later on became the infamous game well, in online communities known as Facade, which was like an art experimental game between a couple. Um, but that's just besides my questions, actually. I just want to mention that. <laughs> um, but my question is, uh, in the, you know, this is partnering to the web TV day. So I imagine you guys had like some moderation teams at the web TV uh, days to moderate like the, uh, the user content that would be produced on the, I think like the forms on the web TV, uh, boxes. Um, we did have, and, uh, Okay, so one of the questions that I was asking in the, myself early on uh, that I didn't have time early on to ask was there was this um, uh, there was this famous group of people at the time who would go on uh, web TV and try to find all the secrets and all the stuff. There was one person named Madman. I don't know if these people ever reach your desk at the time. We, well, I don't know, well, I can tell you as the CEO, at least every time there was an attack, it would come to my attention. And so we okay. had, we were constantly under attack uh, of trying to, people trying to break in. I mean, I wouldn't say constantly, but we had a lot of uh, attempt at this, attempt at that, and so forth. But we built a very, very uh, robust system, and there never was any breach. As far as I know, there was never any downtime. I think the system kept running, at least for the time I was there. Yeah. Um, um, and there was only ever one breach that I got. Um, <laughs> somebody had built a robot at Web TV uh, and had it near the desk, <laughs> who remained nameless. And I got a call from Microsoft Security. This is after the acquisition, you know, like two, three in the morning, and I was home. And then they said, Hey, listen, we've got a security breach, and we traced it to one of your offices. So I'm like, oh my God, they break into, uh, huh. said, it's a Linux system and it didn't have any, you know, it's no firewall, it's right on the internet and they've taken control of it and so forth. And it's like, oh crap. So we found out what it was and it was this little robot that this guy had made um, that was running Linux and he just didn't think that somebody might come in and, you know, and take control of it. So this thing was rolling around the office and taking pictures of things. Yeah. Um, and then the hackers were seeing whatever. Um, I don't know the details. I think it, it actually actually got to an elevator at some point. Um, so we did have, there was that one breach, not, not of any of the web TV systems, but of uh, a hobby of one of the uh, web TV developers. So I, I got, you know, I got, I, you know, said, look, you know, we'll, we're not going to, we'll, I, I, that won't happen again. Cause I was getting, I was in a lot of trouble. You know what I mean? They're very, very tight with security at Microsoft, and that was a big deal for them. And so managed to go, and the person did not get fired. Um, the robot would had a firewall, uh, and uh, and life went on, um, as far as we know. But that is the only um, thing close to a breach that we ever had. But we had lots of other um, of issues with people that we, we had to, unfortunately, kick off the system for one reason or another, as you can well imagine. Because it was the first real broad consumer access device. I mean, you know, you have to have a certain level of of know how to get a uh, a browser running on a, on a uh, to get a computer working and then get a browser running on it. But Web TV, you plugged it in, off you go, right? And um, for most of the, the vast majority of the subscribers were just fine. But as you can well imagine, we had some troublemakers, and I had to deal with the FBI uh, on a couple of occasions. Um, and we had to help them in their investigations. Um, so that was, um, again, a, a something I never imagined I would do in my life or that's something I would do would ever lead to. Um, but there were some arrests that were made. The other thing, Web TV, um, um, I had a theft in a cabin in Tahoe um, where I had a Web TV and uh, you know, I had a VCR, I had, you know, a dish player then because, it would, you know, and so forth. And um, they had stolen all of it, the TV, all the electronics. They stole even some, you know, other things in the, in the cabin. And so I'm like, well, that kind of sucks. And the, the, the sheriff there was, it was, you know, it's a very small community, Myers, it's near South Tahoe. And there's a sheriff 
who was just, you know, and a very, very, very small staff of people there. So they, they, they had no idea who stole it, and that was that. So the thing about Web TV, remember I told you it dials an 800 number when it first connects? So I notified yeah. the customer service folks to watch for that 800 number connection. Sure enough, six months later, it does connect. And what's the phone number? It, it's a phone number in South Tahoe. And it was a, um, you know, it was one where it was unlisted and had caller ID blocked, but that didn't stop the 800 number. So like, aha, we can go and just contact, you know, the sheriff and have it corrected. Well, the sheriff said, well, in order to go look up this person's phone number, we need a search warrant. So I said, okay, so why don't you get one? They said, well, we, we only have a judge and, and who's part-time judge, part-time coroner. And right now he's the coroner. But next month he'll be judge again. I'll ask him then. And so, so he got the search warrant. And then he says, you know, he looked up the guy's name. He told me, he says, you know, this guy, he's not a bad guy. You know, do you really want me to go investigate? I said, he stole stuff from a house. He says, yeah, but he's a cool guy and everything, I'm sure, you know. And so it turns out that he was one of the painters that we had hired, and he had stole it. And then, of course, he went, did the investigation, and sure enough, the web TV was there with all the other things that were stolen. And they never took any action against the guy because <laughs> he was one of their buddies. It's too small a community. But that was the one time web TV in my own life led us directly to a person. And there were, there were many other law enforcement occasions where the exact same technique was used to uh, find people that were actually committing felonies who are, I don't know if they're still in prison, but that uh, ended up in prison um, because they never imagined their unlisted number could ever be identified because um, they didn't know about that 800 number trick we used. That is a great story. And it reminds me of a danger. We actually helped catch a, a, um, a bank robber. Uh, and it was a bank robber who um, you know, almost got away with it. Uh, but the, uh, the FBI um, uh, filed a subpoena, and um, uh, we were, through that, we, we were able to release some records about this guy's smartphone, including his, his sidekick, uh, including his notes app. And it turned out this guy had used the notes app to, like, plan out the robbery. And so there were all of his notes about exactly what he was going to do and where he was going to be to pull off this heist. And that resulted in his conviction. So, so yeah, I think um, the connectedness of everything, especially in these early days, uh, represented a, a massive kind of learning curve for, for criminals uh, as well. Um, and then the other thing that I thought about is, as we were talking about this story, is, Steve, do you remember the incident, Reindeer Games? Oh, God. I was, you know, I was thinking we should, whether or not we, we should bring that up. But, yeah, I remember the Reindeer Games incident very well. Because I'm the one who got one in the middle of the night. Do you want to tell the story or shall I? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, we had a kid's page, you know, on web TV. And it was Christmas. That was the first Christmas that web TV was out. That must have been 96, right? And um, we, had, we had a content team. Remember, there wasn't any such thing as a content team before. We had hired people. In fact, I hired a bunch. Of, I, I, there was a person I knew who was a liberal arts student at um, Stanford. And... She um, and the, oh, and the one of the women who co-founded uh, InfoSeek came to work for us. And she had like a whole cadre of liberal arts students who were going and searching for fun content for kids. So there was a page, there was a kid page that was that went live uh, after midnight on Christmas Day. So when the kids would wake up, they'd have it. And one of the things was reindeer games. Now, when people we didn't have any development tools or anything like that for making HTML pages, so people would have placeholders while they're you know setting some stuff. Up and the reindeer games placeholder that this particular content person did was xxx.com that they planned to go and type in the proper URL and somehow or another it, it QA missed it. So when the rain, so I got a call because the East Coast saw it first. Kids are waking up, they click on reindeer games and it would take them to triple x.com. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh my god, the parents were like freaking out. So I like it. You know, it was early in the morning on the West Coast, and I'm like, oh, God, who do I get to fix this thing instantly? So we had to go rouse people out of bed, get them over the office, you know, because we didn't really have remote login, and um, as quickly as possible, change it over to the proper Reindeer Game site. So there you are. We, for a little while, uh, we unfortunately shocked a couple of, of, of early riser kids on the East Coast 
uh, with uh, web TV. <laughs> Good times. That's amazing. That is. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I can't imagine the reaction from the parents, like, oh my God, dealing with that as well in the early mornings. Uh, but uh, the reason why I was mentioning that is because actually, um, I think uh, one of the, uh, you know, there, I've never actually known any of the like the actual you know people that like uh, did a lot of trouble in trouble with the web TV stuff. Like I think there was one media outlet that one that at one point uh, talked about a quote unquote virus with web TV, where basically if you had if you had it, it would call nine one one instead of calling the toll free number. I don't know if you guys were aware of that at one point. Not not to my knowledge. Not while I was there. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, the reason why I was mentioning that is because actually one of the more inf uh, famous people in those scenes, you know, that would go and sniff around just to see what was hidden is actually uh, in the audience right now. So, but he, he, he's pretty much this guy and another guy um, that we mentioned, actually mentioned earlier have pretty much helped over the years to, um, you know, get web TV up and running again uh, by uh, the mini serve and stuff like that. And so I think it's actually pretty interesting to see the change between, you know, uh, being kind of naughty hackers to legitimately helping web TV be archived and stuff. Right. Um, you know, I gotta yeah. say, it's, it's so cool that that you guys have web TV working again, you know, and x band working again. Um, Crazy. Uh, you know, what I, I remember thinking, because when I was growing up, I liked to take apart video games. I like to take apart stuff on the Apple II. I like to take apart stuff on the Genesis. Um, and I remember after we did, you know, web TV and, uh, and X band thinking, Oh, you know, it's kind of a bummer. People aren't really going to hack on this the way that I used to hack on stuff because there's no server anymore, but you guys are doing it. Like you built a clone of the service for X band and, and web TV, which is just incredible. It is amazing. Um, it really is. And you know, and it's cool. I mean, this is, um, you know, it's <laughs> it's a well-designed system. Um, um, you know, I at that point, by the way, my job was uh, I was, um, um, you know, acting CEO in the beginning because I really didn't want to be a business person at all. Um, but when they we brought in all these choices of people that would be the people that become the CEO, it was really clear none of them could manage something as technically complex and as sophisticated and as new as what we're doing with web TV. So that's when I became the real time, the real CEO and, you know, continue to do that. And Joe eventually made that transition himself later on. And, um, but I can tell you that, you know, the excellence of, of, of execution there, you know, it's just so superb. And it, 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 it's sad when these things go away. It's sad when these things get eventually get shut down um, that, you know, this really good work is just not, is not being used and to see you guys go and bring it back to life and show that uh, it lives on uh, is really, really great. And to have you have, have the, um, to, to see the code and see it in such detail that you can ask questions like this, where you're understanding, um, you know, the, the very, very fine details of it is just so impressive. You know, um, it reminds me of like, you know, nowadays you've got pretty much everything online. You can access to whatever, you want but you know i'm not i've never really used web tv back in the day actually this was out of and same with x band it was actually later on like wow it was like 2014 maybe that i started discovering this stuff i think at web tv i saw it once on the windows 98 setup when i was doing that i was like oh look web tv guide which was nothing like the actual thing <laughs> but um you know for me, back in uh, back in, when I was younger, the the more semblance of that would be maybe like the Wii with the the channels on there that allow you to see the weather, the news, and the internet. And I, it's kind of the same thing that happened with the web TV. Actually, I'm pretty sure in a way, web TV probably inspired all these different, uh, you know, other things that do the exact same thing. Because on the web TV, you could check the weather, the news, uh, you could check uh, the stock market, and stuff like that. So I find it interesting that we're kind of like running a loop where every time these kind of services shut down, people get nostalgic for it. And they're like, well, you know what? Maybe we should try and bring it back just for reliving memories. And um, it's also allows hackers to be like, well, here's a challenge. Let's try and bring it back. 
I mean, it's a challenge because we don't know anything about the service. It's going to probably take our mindset the entire day to do this, but why not? It's, uh, it's, uh, look, it's, 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 I can relate to it very much. You know, when um, all the different projects that I've been involved with, and I, I think I, I probably speak for Joe as well, um, they involve this sort of excellence of code, really low level stuff, which is working very close to the, you know, the CPU working, you know, uh, very close to the hardware. And that is reaching past the era that you're in. And what I mean by that is that um, for to do what we did with Web TV, you know, one of the things that you touched on that I'll, I'll, I'll point out is that the thing that Web TV, you know, we think about Web TV associated with TV because it's the name, obviously it's the way you used it and so forth. But actually the thing that it pioneered, you were just touched on, and that is it was the first consumer device to use the web. It's the first time the web was used not as an application in, you know, a computer, which is, you know, a productivity device, but rather was used for by consumers. And now if you look at web use, of course, almost all of it, well, I would say all of it, but the vast majority of it is uh, through smartphones, right, or tablets. Um, so, you know, what we, the, what web TV did back in those days was something that eventually became to be the mainstream way things are done. No, it's not on a television. It's, you know, because we had no other device that was a um, mainstream consumer device that could, could, you know, conceivably use the web except for the television. But there, that's what we did and we worked within its constraints. Um, you know, for example, you know, moving around a selection box as opposed to uh, trying to implement some, something like a mouse. You know what I mean? That there were some people that attempted that and we, we made the decision that that's just not, not very user friendly and make it so that you can usually do things, you know, we, we could always do things with uh, the remote control and the keyboard helped if you had a lot of typing to do, but try to make it that you can get to a lot of things through just, um, you know, a few selections. And of course the web today looks much more like that than a text heavy sort of experience as the way it was, um, you know, back then, because of course you're touching things on a touch screen on your phone. So, um, when, so getting back to why I said that we, we were having to work with what what the, the raw materials that were available at the time. I mean, it was so hard to get this level of execution performance that was needed. And when, when NEC came in and said, we have a, a, you know, a MIPS 4000 instead of a MIPS 3000, which of course, you know, it, I didn't learn until later is what, you know, because of a golf game made us lose Sony. But anyways, oh God, it was such a relief because we were, we were dealing with such a low performance CPU and that gave us an, an extra notch in performance. And then when they, they were trying to push it and promote it and we got it for 10 bucks, oh man, that changed things, you know, about what we could do. And in fact, as, as you know, we ultimately moved from a dedicated hardware modem, we, which we bought from Rockwell, to a software modem. And if you look at, I don't know if you've seen some of the Web TV boards, but they, the pads on the circuit board have, have a pad, a larger pad for a Rockwell chip, and then in the, underneath it, you'll see that there's a smaller pad for the codec, the ADD and DNA converters that were used for a software modem. So we first released the Rockwell modem, and then we gradually transitioned over to the software modem after we debugged it, you know, and made sure it worked. And no one ever implemented the software modem before, in, you know, for any kind of product. But again, all of the, so why were we doing that? Why are we getting rid of the Rockwell chip and put doing software? Why not just use a chip for the modem? Because we had to bring the cost down. Remember before I mentioned that we had to get down to 199 to get to a single spouse buying decision. So here it is, all of this capability and all of this very sophisticated code packed into this very, very small device. And the reason it was needed is that we were trying to go and bring the future closer to the present. And we had to work with the raw materials available. Now you guys are cracking open this thing and you're finding, you know, again, as the CEO, Okay, but you're finding all the work of the, the folks that were, that were developing this thing um, and just the sheer, you know, brilliance and excellence and the sheer creativity and, and, and the heart that went into it uh, to make this thing. You know, the audio, the music had to be great. You know, we had to make sure that the experience was terrific. We had to invent the idea of having, um, you know, preloaded content for uh, different, for kids or for you know parents or something. You know, there's so many different things that went into that. 
it was so sad when Microsoft shut it down, you know, I think it was 2013, if I understand, MSN TV. Yeah. And, and it was so great when you guys brought it back to life, you know? Same thing with x well, I mean, x was just such a brilliant, cool thing. And it was so sad when it had to be shut down, you know? Yeah, well, um, we, uh, you can go ahead, Tommy. I think um, there are several of us conglomerating online uh, from the the days X band shut down until now, uh, and I think it's crazy because I think X band pushed a lot of us to learn uh, <laughs> to learn the levels of programming, the levels of hardware hacking, um, you, to get where a lot of us are today. And, you know, at the time, I just remember, I remember a bunch of us sitting around on a forum and just trying everything we could, everything stupid, and we, we weren't there. And it took us, it took us a really long time to even hit the handshake and um after that everything just started flowing yeah um i remember like watching the video that tommy had released at the time when they first got the handshake it was like to be fairly honest x Men. as i said before i had no experiences with x-men before i knew it from wikipedia articles and just seeing it online i mean it looked cool because, you know, it reminded me of like uh, in Japan, they had like the saddle, uh, saddle view, saddle view, I think it was for the SNES and stuff similar to that. And I was always intrigued with early internet stuff because I was kind of late. So I never had to experience that kind of stuff. You know, how uh, some people might experience vinyl or, you know, cassettes and stuff like that. So, but when I saw Tommy and his buddy, I don't remember what it is. If it was like Launchbox, maybe, uh, trying to, um, get the handshake and we saw it and he saw it working for the first time made the video i remember i was like oh my god that's amazing like i hadn't i didn't know anything about this product except from what i'd seen but it was such such an interesting feeling to just be like well maybe we'll be able to relive history that got us to where we are nowadays and well that's why i'd like to say thank you to you too and all the rest all the team at both of these companies and so on for making such great products honestly Oh that's so cool. It's, it's so cool that you guys um, are there to see it. You know, unless you dig into it, which was super hard and it's what you guys did, you can't see what, you know, you can't really see, you know, what is so cool and so, um, you know, and, and the level of intricate detail that went into that thing, despite rank exhaustion uh, in order to bring it to life. And the other thing I think you appreciate, and you're commenting a little about seeing it and how cool it was, is, you know, there just wasn't, we, there were um, multiplayer games, you know, through the internet with some PC games, of course, you know. Yeah. But the idea of having a, uh, a service like this where you have all this stuff automatic and any person without any real knowledge of technology, you know, of, uh, of computers and everything can play their favorite games that, you know, and, and console games were much more popular than PC games at the time. And, um, you know, that was the dream we had, and that was the vision. And then we're like, okay, what are all the things we need to do to make, to figure this thing out? And then, then the fact that that whole thing was figured out in such a short amount of time, it really was, um, you know, an incredible thing. And it's so great to have people, you know, <laughs> go and, and dig in and, and actually see the inner workings of this thing that was created. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it would only take until like 1998 before such a service would eventually come out properly, like um, from the Sega Dreamcast. And even then, it will only take until 2001 with the Xbox Live to actually work, uh, like for that people would actually play it in the millions. So yeah, you guys have done some groundbreaking work, pretty much. Yeah, because honestly, the Dreamcast, while it was arguably... Uh, the first next gen that had online, its features were not even on par with the X Band. It wasn't until I think Xbox Live that the console was actually finally on par with the X Band. 
Yep. Dreamcast was great, to be honest. But it, yeah, I, I get that there was a lot less complexity going on with the Dreamcast versus the, with the X-Band because the X-Band was just groundbreaking, pretty much. Yeah. But thank you. Hello, we got two more people raising their hands. Um, yeah. You guys don't mind getting to uh, those, do you? No, we're here. We're on the east. We're on the west coast, so it's easier for us than you guys. I know it's it's getting really late uh, if you're on the east coast, or I don't know if anyone's outside the country. But uh, this is uh, well, we do have um, Saskatchewan Mike here. I know that is French John been around. I don't. I haven't seen French John around. So okay. um, we're gonna bring up. We're gonna bring back Jeff actually. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Um, yeah, when you guys were talking about earlier about how you guys used to hack on hardware um, when you were first getting into this stuff, it just reminded me of, um, you know, hacking on this keyboard. And when I first got into this project, I, I had never worked on hardware at all. I knew nothing about hardware. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I feel so fortunate living in a time where we have, I started out with an Arduino board, you know, and I could just drive down to the store, buy an Arduino, connect some wires and watch some YouTube videos. And I got to the point where the Arduino, you know, wasn't doing what I wanted. It couldn't do open drain. A friend of mine mentioned, oh, you need to do open drain for this. There's a comment in the source code that said, uh, driven to tell Eric, I have something for him. And I was like, what does that even mean? And then I later, I figured out like, oh, the X-Band's driving specific pin and if it's high you know the x-band wants to send or if it's low it wants to receive data and um you know just being able to google everything as i went along and you know the arduino didn't work so then i switched over to an adapter a board called the blue pill which is pretty cool you can buy them for two bucks off of alibaba and uh it's like an arduino board but um i ended up building out a whole adapter where you can plug a ps2 keyboard into it and I connected a logic analyzer to both that and the original keyboard and made sure the timings are all accurate, you know, down to the microsecond to the original keyboard and everything. Um, but um, my question is, you know, we're so we're so lucky and fortunate to have the Internet to be able to just Google things. And there's so many YouTube videos and so many classes. And um, I was curious, did computer science even exist as as a major when you guys were in school? <laughs> and um, how how did you how did you even originally get into something like this? I mean, you were writing everything in assembly language, and um, you know, growing up, it was such this closed ecosystem. You know, everything was on cartridges, and it's like, how how are these games even made? How did somebody even get into something like this back in the day? And uh, and what was the first computer that you you ever used? Joe, you first. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, I. I think Steve and I probably have a lot of similar parts of our, our history here, but, um, you know, as a little kid, I was always interested in taking stuff apart. Um, and I, I was really interested in electronics. Um, uh, and it was, I mean, it was, it was pervasive. Like I was just obsessed with this stuff. My mom has photos of me as a toddler grinning, holding up extension cords. And I've heard these stories about when I was a kid, I would, go for play dates at my friends' houses. And when my mom would come to pick me up, the, the friend's parents would say, well, Joe has counted all of the outlets in the house. He knows how many of those we have. Like, I was just always drawn to, uh, to anything um, electronic. And then, uh, you know, growing up in like the 70s and 80s, it was, it was a really, really good time to be doing this kind of stuff because there were tons of magazines. You know, there was like 73 and QST for ham radio uh, magazines and there was Byte magazine and popular electronics and radio electronics and I subscribed to them all uh, and and uh, I just I love this stuff you know and and it was it was what I did and I was always scrounging uh, for parts or uh, old equipment that I could hack or take apart um, and it was it was just what I was into you know I was, I was kind of a weird kid that way uh, the first computer I ever programmed was a TRS-80 Model One. Um, and the first computer I ever had was an Apple II. Um, but, um, I mean, that, that's a really short version. I mean, I could, I could tell you lots of stories about taking apart all kinds of stuff, pinball machines. I, I, this one buddy of mine, uh, his uncle had a, um, uh, an IBM disk drive from a mainframe. It was like one of these, it was a box about the size of a, of a small freezer 
with like a 14 platter uh, disc pack. And I inherited that and went up in my garage and I completely took it apart and had a great time doing it. So um, I don't know, you know, I just, I, I kind of always had the bit set. So I think my background is very similar to Joe's. Um, uh, he's a bit younger than me. So um, when I started out, but I was um, at my um, junior high school in Connecticut, they had um, you know a math resource center and there was a, uh, a teletype terminal there with a acoustic modem, you know, that would do 110 uh, baud. And the computer that the, the school system had was a Honeywell 400. That was, you know, far away, but you could dial up to it. None of the teachers knew how to use it. And I, but they had a manual for basic and Fortran that it could do. So I, I, I also grew up um, building things all the time. There's something called Heath kits, which were really, oh, yeah. 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 I build all sorts of electronic things and stuff. And like, you know, mechanical things, go-karts, anything. I would build whatever that you could build. And like Joe, I was pretty obsessed with it. Um, so this thing, I just started going and trying all different kinds of things. And the, my first program, I was just all print statements of a picture of Snoopy on a doghouse. And then I started writing more basic programs and I kind of hit the limitations of basic and started coding in Fortran. And then I started going to the high school had, um, was open later for the computer room. And I just wrote code and code and code. And, and there was a, a tape punch machine where you could, you know, uh, that would save your programs. So then I started going to a, a, a science center, uh, Tucker Mountain Science Center in Connecticut, where they had more dial-up machines. I was doing more coding there. Okay, but the big revelation for me was when um, um, I saw, so like Joe, I'd get these magazines, and one of them was Byte Magazine, I think even later, but even before that was something called Kilobaud. Oh, yeah. And you could see in there that they had like the MSI 8080, and these other microcomputers that had just come out, you had to build them, they were kits. And so there's one, a Southwest Tech 6800, SWTPC 6800. And I was able to go and um, get one of those. And I remember bringing it home, bringing the kit home and, and building it one night, uh, overnight in the basement, thinking, oh, this is great, I have a computer. And there's a button that's power, another button that says reset on it. Got it running, it, it turned it on, and I, I sat there. I'm like, okay, now what? So I, I made some calls to people that you know um, that you know are selling the computers and everything. And they said, well, you have to hook it up to a terminal. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had no idea. And so then I got a Heath kit to build a terminal. <laughs> and so I had to build a terminal before I could use that computer. And that computer um, stored things. There was a, another thing you had to build so it could save things on a cassette tape which it, I would say about one out of every three times it successfully did, either saving or loading. Eventually, I did get a, um, a, a, a disk drive for it. And it was con and then I, I built this graphics display. That was another thing you do that was actually driven through the parallel port. And I took some cassette tape boxes and put buttons on them and made some video games. So really the first code I, I wrote, even on that Honeywell 400, I was always writing games. And, but these games, of course, I could do with graphics. Um, and then people have parties. And you got to remember back then, the only games that were available were things like Pong. Um, and Space Invaders had just come out, you know, but not for home. So I had some games where, like, hit planes flying over and you could shoot at them and some other games, which... Um, and I remember having parties. And back there, if you're 18, you could drink. And um, I remember people just were lining up to play these games on this computer. It was like crazy level of interest. And then somebody would put a beer on this computer and it would spill over. And that would be the end of the entertainment, of course. And then I'd have to go and figure out what was wrong with it. Now, I had done analog electronics before then, but not digital. So I got a, a book called The Bug Book with a little, um, in a, you know, it had a one of those white prototype boards, you know, with the the wires and the chips and stuff like that, and LEDs, and I learned about digital hardware. And then I literally, it was because the computer constantly getting destroyed by people that were playing with it, I learned how to debug it, and I learned all about building things. Okay, anyway, so then I, um, um, I got a job building a computer, which I assembled from what I learned about the 6800 with using a 6802, and then... Um, started coding that. Then, uh, you know, as Joe mentioned, the Apple II came out, 
started programming basic on that, and then 6502. You know, I never, to me, because of the way I got into this thing, there never was much of a boundary between machine code, you know, um, higher level languages or the hardware. Um, by the time I went to college and I went to Columbia and they had just started offering a major in computing science. There was not one um, before that. And it wasn't, and, and they got to start with basic and then they would jump into assembler and um, Pascal was very new then. And then C had just begun to come into use. But there was a lot of other candidates out there. You know, there was LISP, there was Algol, Simula, um, and so forth. And, um, but I remember, you know, I liked Pascal a lot and I really fell in love with C and then later with C++ just because it was so close to, um, you know, close, so close to the low level of machine. And you could, and then doing compiling and, and, and different stuff like that, um, you know, I learned about compilers and how to optimize them because you can look at the code and see how they worked and, and so on. So there's another thing that, that I, I'm not going to tell you my whole life history, but I, I will mention one thing that, happened at Columbia, which led to some of the things like the software modem, is um, there was a the dial-up to the Columbia's main, they have mainframes, uh, a DEX System 20 and a um, IBM 360. And I mainly use the DEX System 20, but anyways, if you want to get to that mainframe, and that was to have real computing performance, you need to use dial-up. And all the dial-up connections, well, first of all, they had terminals in the, you know, in the first floor of the dorms, and but they, there were these Hewlett Packard terminals. But if you, you use the, um, um, uh, you could dial up and there was a 300 baud connection most of the time, but there was four 1200 baud connections. And so it made all the difference in the world, as you can imagine. So I would go and get on and I, I would keep dialing until I got one of those lines. Then I had a televideo terminal because I couldn't afford these expensive Hewlett Packard ones, but it had very different control codes, like using Emacs or whatever were controlling the screen. And so I wrote a protocol converter on my Southwest Tech 6800, which would convert the Hewlett Packard codes into uh, um, televideo codes. And then I could go and of course use that terminal there. And I had a um, Epson MX80, of course they could print things. And, by, and there were some markup languages available then that you could print things nicely. And back then everyone used typewriters to enter, to do reports. And so I, showed people you could edit things using Emacs and also use markup languages to make really nice reports and not have to use a typewriter with whiteout and everything. And I literally had a line of students going out of my dorm room waiting to get onto the one computer with the image writer so they, could, they didn't have to use a typewriter to type up reports. And was, then I really got the insight that, wow, computers were not just for technologists, you know, but the real thing was to make these things accessible to average people that are not technologists. So the last thought story I'll tell you is I did an independent project there because I was very interested. It seemed to me that I learned about how 1200 bond modems worked. It seemed to me that it should be possible to make a modem work in software by looking at the waveforms and having the software keep up with it. So I, um, I was, got to know a professor there, let me do an independent project. And I wrote the code and showed the whole thing working as a simulation. But to build it, you know, I'd have to go and build an interface to a phone line and get A to D, D to D converters. And I didn't have the means to do that. And, and so when I showed him the results, he said, you know, it's a really good effort. I'm glad you're looking at it. But because it's not working, I'm going to have to give you an incomplete until you get it working. And so I said, no, no, it really will work. And I tried to explain it to him. He says, he said, look, Steve. It's, I'm always going to try to encourage students to go and try to do things, but it's well known that a modem is a hardware problem and it cannot be done in software. <laughs> so I left Columbia and then I went to work for Atari and then I went to work for Coleco, all right? And ColecoVision, you know, remember that? And they were they had the Coleco oh. added. And I said, look, I think I can make a 1200 bit per second modem run in software. And I, and at that point, the IBM PC was out. I wrote it on in, in 8088 um, on that machine and I was able to go and of course follow these waveforms and, and it worked. And so I, by the way, when you graduate, if you have incompletes, it's an F. So I got an F for this thing. And um, I sent an email to the professor <laughs> through the thing. I said, hey, this is working on software modem. And he said, I'm really glad you didn't give up. And I'm sorry if I, I discouraged you, but this is a really great thing. He was actually very nice about it, you know. And then fast forward all the way to um, web TV. 
So this is actually a web TV story. Well, at General Magic, I tried to, remember I added that one instruction, the multiply add, which is really essential for doing any digital signal processing. And at this point, modems could go up to 9600 baud, then you know, eventually 56K. And you really needed that level of processing. And we, at General Magic, I'd started a software modem project to work on that thing. But of course, all those things never came into, into being. But General Magic was nice enough to let um, um, uh, a guy take that software modem um, and spin it out as a company. Okay, and um, but he didn't really have a way to go and take that software mode and really try it out. We were good. we could try it out in the field, and I already described to you how we did that by doing it side by side with the Rockwell modem in enough phone locations in order to end up getting it working. So that made the software modem for this other startup valuable, and in fact, Broadcom wanted to acquire it from them, wanted to acquire the company. Trouble is that um, Rockwell and Motorola, no Motorola had the patents, had a basic patent on make, implementing a modem in software. And they had been hitting everybody with seeking royalties on this patent um, and um, had made about $2 billion from this patent at that point. And um, so they were not about to go and see a large company like um, um, Broadcom suddenly have technology that eliminated the need for having a chip but rather could do it all in software. And so they um, were suing um, my friend who did this company. He came to me and said, you remember you told me that story about the thing you got this incomplete in, in college? He said, yes. Yeah. So, well, we're getting sued on this patent from Motorola. And you did this work in college, you know, like was it five years or something before they did. Do you still have that stuff? So much as I went and dug, I am a pack rat. And just like dug up all these little like, expand things and old web TV things, I did still have my notebooks from that project. And I have the thing where the red lines, the professor giving me effectively an F. Um, and I went and um, uh, gave that, that notebook to my friend, gave it to his attorneys who brought it into court and brought it to Motorola and said, look, this notebook here shows an invention that was documented five years before your patent was filed. Now, if you want to keep collecting royalties from everywhere else in the world, except for this company that's about to be acquired, then we're not going to ever show this note notebook to anybody. But if you're going to sue them, it's going to come out in this trial and that will wipe out your, your modem, software modem royalties. So um, that in the, in the, so in the end, they agreed and he, his company was acquired and the rest is history and Broadcom, all the chips Broadcom made used that software and so on. So the last little thing I will say is I, called by Columbia and they asked me whether or not I could make a donation, uh, you know, as you do as a alumnus. And I have donated money there and everything. And so I said, you know, I tried to donate $2 billion and you wouldn't take it. And so they said, well, and they said, what? So I said, well, if you would file a patent, instead of giving an F on this paper, then uh, you would have made $2 billion in royalty by now. Um, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> And uh, I said, they, uh, anyways, so uh, this started as a story of my life and ended up a, a, a thing that led to a web TV story. I'm sorry about that. I tend to run off of the mouth, but uh, uh, I think oh, we yeah, go ahead. For it. I, I am, Joe and I are very much the same. I think Joe would agree. We see no boundary between different layers in the, the software. We see no boundary going from the software to the hardware. Um, we make things because we love to make things and everything we see, we want to improve it. And um, sure, we need to make businesses that are successful as well. You know, otherwise, otherwise, there's no way to keep funding them, right? But uh, that's not why we work so hard and do the things we do. I'm, I'm speaking on your behalf, Joe, but I hope that that's fair. Oh, here, here. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I can definitely see how there would be a natural, you know, progression from hardware to software and there's not really much of a boundary when you're working, you know, that close to the metal and everything. Um, I did have one last question for Joe. Um, in an interview you did a few years ago, I think you had mentioned you had written like a Mac OS clone for the Sega Genesis before you were working oh. on X-Band. Oh, yeah. No, that was super fun. So that's when I was at Apple um, and I was I was hacking on the Genesis for fun. And this was one of those things. It's like I went to Fry's. The Genesis was still relatively new. Um, I bought one. I took it home. I took it apart immediately. Uh, it had a 68,000 in it. Uh, because I was at Apple, 
I had access to a 68,000 in-circuit emulator, which at the time was a fantastically expensive piece of hardware. It basically would plug in in place of the 68,000 and give you full control over the machine. You know, you could stop it, start it, single step it. Um, and I used that to start looking at how um, Sonic worked. Um, and I had another buddy at Apple, a guy named Alex Rosenberg, uh, who was also interested in this stuff. And he was part of this event that happened um, every year called Mac Hack. And at Mac Hack, uh, Mac developers would get together and they would just like hack on stuff, you know, for a few days and then have a contest to show off what they had built. So Alex and I uh, had this idea. Well, at first it started with like, man, could we get the Mac ROM running on a Genesis? And the, the problem was like, there wasn't enough memory. Uh, and, you know, it has this, um, the, the video subsystem of the Genesis is not just a simple frame buffer. Um, and, and um, you know, it chews up a lot more memory to actually have a frame buffer. So basically there wasn't enough memory to, to really run the Mac. Um, but we built something that looked like a Mac. And you would you turn the Genesis on, and uh, you would hear the Mac boot beep, and you would see, it was called Sega Mac, and you would see the, the Mac Plus style stipple pattern with the Happy Mac in the middle as it was booting. Um, and then you would see something that looked like the Finder. And when, when we showed this at Mac Hack, like people went crazy. But it was all just smoke and mirrors. It was an illusion. Like it would, it would play the Mac boot beep sound. It would put up the the boot end, the boot screen, and then you would land at what looked like the Finder with some windows open, and you could use the joypad to move the cursor around. Um, but then when you would click on something, you would get this bomb dialog. Like this was really common on the Mac a long time ago, and it crashed. There was no memory protection or anything, and you would just get this alert with like a you know, ca cartoon style round bomb and like a system error message. So um, it was not real. It was, it was just an illusion. It looked like a Mac, it started up and it looked like it crashed, but it was good enough to get a standing ovation at Mac hack. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. I was always curious if you had some full on operating system that you had written that was running on the, on the Sega. Oh, no, no. <laughs> there was another thing though that, uh, I mean, it's off topic, but uh, in in Japan, there was Sony had a computer, a handheld computer that came out before the Palm that was called the Sony Palm Top. And if you, if you Google for it, you can find info on it. And it was interesting because it was a, a, a handheld computer that was based on the 68,000. And a good friend of mine, Paul Mercer, well, and Steve's friend too, um, one Christmas, he and a couple of other friends of ours ported the Mac Plus ROM to run on the Palm Top. Uh, and it was amazing. It was like this handheld Macintosh computer. Yeah, by the way, about nice. Paul Mercer, again, off topic, but a little bit of history. Um, Paul wrote the original operating system for the iPod. That's right. And if you go and if you have one of the original ones on the wheel, if you go to about, you see that it's, uh, it's uh, from Pixo. And um, Pixo was Paul's company. Yeah. So if you think about that whole iOS thing, you know, which of course evolved to, you know, the, the enormous thing it is right now. <laughs> it all started with Apple reaching out to one guy who had a, had some code. Yep. Nice. Yeah. When I was a kid, I always thought it would be cool to like use the Sega as more of a traditional computer, you know, with an operating system and everything. And that's actually part of the reason I got so obsessed with the X-Band keyboard. Cause I was always like, oh, yeah. what if you could connect a keyboard Sega, and then when I found out, like, oh my God, this exists, um, <laughs> that's what really you know sparked my, my interest in it. And um, yeah, I've actually started kind of dabbling with. Um, there's a Linux distribution called UC Linux, which is made for uh -huh. running on embedded hardware, and yeah. um, the, the Sega itself only has 64k of memory, which isn't enough to run that Linux distribution. But I'm using this flash cartridge. Um, that has an extra 16 megabytes of, of work memory built into that cartridge. Mm. And um, I've started, I've gotten, uh, I've just kind of been dabbling with some of those tools and everything. And I've gotten it to the point where I actually can compile a ROM and it has a proper Genesis header in it. Cause if I boot that up in an emulator, um, you know, it shows some information there. I haven't quite gotten text, you know, drawn onto the screen yet, but uh, 
it's a work in yeah, progress. So. Plays, yeah, you, you got to learn how to use it. It's I, I don't remember the details of it, but it's not, you know, it's yeah, not, I do. Not simple. <laughs> I, I I did manage to throw together a keyboard test ROM that just lets me draw, you know, characters onto the screen. And just it probably took me about a year to figure out just how to <laughs> get a character onto the screen. That was a big uh, that was a big deal. So the VDP yeah. is the crazy beast. It, it is. For but sure. Jeff, you know, the other thing that's really interesting is you're doing this development in an emulator. And when we were doing X-Band, we built a simulator and did most of the development there. Um, but most companies didn't do that. Most folks developed on the real hardware, which, um, which was a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that in the code? I see references to Big Easy. Was that the emulator <laughs> you guys were using? <laughs> <laughs> Big Easy, that actually traces its roots back to Paul Mercer. And I think I think if you look in the comments at the top, it says, like, written by Paul Mercer's mom. Um, but that was just like a, uh, that was just like a, a framework for, like, a generic Mac application that, that uh, a bunch of the guys at Apple built. And um, somehow it, it became the basis of the X-Band simulator. Yeah. Um, recently, I know Natalie got it compiled. But I know, uh, Joe, you actually gave us a compiled version of the simulator. If we can strip out everything but the binaries, maybe we could get a release of that um, for people to play with in emulators or on real hardware. Sure. Um, no, actually, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, actually, ironically, you mentioned, um, oh, goodness, uh, I just had a brain aneurysm here. Okay, Alex Rosenberg. Um, yeah. So he's actually, he's actually going to be doing a talk on m the history of Macintosh and some of his work over at PlayStation for us. Okay. So, uh, and I know he worked on the... Um, I think he worked on the operating system for the PlayStation 4, if I'm... Yeah, if I'm that, that, that's right. I was actually just trading emails with him yesterday. Uh, Alex and I were very close. We, we worked together at Apple. Now, um, who else? We have, one, we have one more here, and it's uh, Halen again. Let's see here. Yeah, um, thanks for having me back. Uh, I had another couple questions that just popped into my head. And uh, one that I wanted to just start off with, I guess, is um, are you guys aware of anything that's come from your projects that's uh, still in use and some other stuff today? So maybe uh, stuff from like Web TV, X Band, Online, that kind of stuff? Well, I think um, with. Uh... With the Danger Sidekick, um, we did a lot of work around um, autocomplete uh, for a mobile device, and I think um, that may be one of the, the earliest implementations of autocomplete. Um, and with the Sidekick, you could actually like program in your own uh, autocomplete um, things. So, like, you type something really short, and the Sidekick would automatically expand it out to whatever you would set that short version to. And that turned out to be the source of many practical jokes, like at, at Danger, people would leave their phones lying around and somebody would set up a, uh, uh, an autocomplete so that if someone actually typed, like, can't talk right now, it would turn into maybe a really rude expression that their phone would send over to somebody else. So there's that. Um, and then I've heard that there's vestigial bits of web TV in, um, in AT&T Uverse. That well, that's true because you know ATV well AT and T Uverse came from what they called Media Room at Microsoft, which by the way is something that Peter Barrett had a lot of involvement with, which yeah. was you know um, an IPTV thing to run over, um, you know DSL or or you know UDSL that uh, AT and T was deploying, and it was and it was other countries where you'll see Media Room used, um, and yeah you know a lot of the code that just what that was developed for web TV for one reason or another made it into other things. You know, Windows CE was in its infancy then, and we were asked to go and port web TV to Windows CE. Why? Because it's called Windows, um, which, well, I won't get into that, but the bottom line is that it was very difficult to go and take something that was 
so tightly tuned for inexpensive hardware and that was often running right on the on the ground you know on the ground floor you know the bare metal and then get it running on top of an operating system which was really an operating system that was designed without it, it, you know with a little bit of operating system if you will the thing that kept web tv running and would boot it up and everything was written exactly for what it was needed uh, similar to the way we would write things to boot up with xpan Windows CE was written in abstraction. You know, they wrote it not exactly having a target for what it would be. And it had a lot of overhead and a lot of things that were not real time that made it very, very difficult to use. And so we had a tough time porting over to that. Um, and it was very it was very difficult. And we're, we were kind of, it was maybe a bit of a culture clash because, um, you know, Microsoft, having an operating system and having, um, you know, APIs and, um, standard way of interfacing, making it so it's extendable, scalable, all the different things that operating, things, the operating systems do are great. Okay, however, when, when you're trying to do something that's real time and trying to do it for a dedicated device and you're dealing and you're trying to get that dedicated device accessible to a lot of people, which means it's gotta be inexpensive, you know, then you have to be really careful about this balance between um, having an op, the ideal abstractions that you'd like to have and the practical things that just have to work in a timely way. So, um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of things that we did which made it into Windows CE and changed Windows it's, it's Windows CE because it had to change in order to be able to run in real time and, and you know, and actually be in these devices that were doing the various things like, you know, the later later versions of, um, um, you know, uh, was Ultimate TV, I think is what they called the web TV running on the, for direct TVs, you know, right. DDR and everything. And then of course we have, you know, Windows C eventually migrated its way to mobile devices. A lot of people don't realize that one of the very first WinCE PDAs was developed by um, Tony Fidel after he left General Magic and it was based on that chip that General Magic designed that you know had a MIPS processor with a single cycle multiple accumulate and had all the other components around it. It you know to the, today the idea of you know having a chip which has an embedded ARM processor in the case of modern devices today, then have all the other things you need you know you know the the display controller the you know the interfaces etc that you need inside of a phone. Who would ever imagine doing it differently than that? But this was the very first device. That did that, and then um, Tony, when he left with, when he left General Magic, he went to Philips because um, Philips was one of the he had a relationship with them. We you know we all knew the people there, and then he made one of the first Windows CE devices based on this chip. So it's funny that General Magic's work, and a lot of the guys there had kind of religion against Microsoft, you know. Um, but anyways, it ended up being the found, foundation, the thing that they never shipped, the you know the MIPS based thing turned out to be the foundation hardware for Windows CE, which again, got the benefit of um, a later, at least later on, got the benefit of the learnings from web TV. So there's so many things. Um, and then, you know, and then you look at products that go beyond that, that they did. And of course, Xbox 360. So these things live on. And um, I think we started this talk very early on, talking about building on the shoulders of work done before us. Well, it is the case we're seeing work built upon the shoulders of things that, that we've done, sometimes directly where it's actually, you know, pieces of our code that we wrote. Sometimes it's indirectly in the sense that, you know, there's, a, there's an architectural concept at, at any layer, whether it's at the layer of, you know, the, the human interface layer, the, um, you know, the layer of, of how you would, might structure an operating system, how you might do, um, you know, we talked about communications, you know, layer um, and the protocol there that we see make it way into layer devices. I mean, I think we all can agree that, you know, the um, later, you know, um, you know, the concept of a, of a place you go that, that hosts multiplayer games, like, you know, Xbox Live and so on, um, you know, there are ideas that came from X-Band and, um, and, and so on. And, um, you know, I, it, it, there, the other thing I, I want to also share just very briefly is that, you know, it's always with mixed feelings because 
you you see these things and they they get out there and, and it's particularly if you know if you couldn't quite get over get over the hump and get high uh high volume for the thing you want to do as we couldn't really with x band and you're like gosh you know <laughs> i wish we could have you know done it and sometimes i you, you hear an expression that venture capitalists say is that yeah well you know the um the pioneers are the ones that get all the arrows but the settlers are the one that 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 uh, of course um you know plow the land and um and the ones that, that reap all the you know the um, the benefits from it, maybe there's a little bit of that. But you know, um, I it's still the case that you really wanted to go and um, you want to really re if you could ever have the pioneers be the ones that carry something all the way to the point of fruition. Those are the people with the passion. Those are the people with the dream, and uh, they're the ones that will do anything anything it takes in order to go and make the thing work. The, the people that come later on that are building on this, it's not that I don't like, you know, I love the fact they're doing it and I'm so glad they are. And I'm so glad that makes these wonderful systems available for us. But you kind of wish that uh, if they're going to let this thing exist today, then why didn't you let us do it back then? Absolutely. You know, there's there's it, it, kind of a flip to the question. There's um, there's some things that I think about that we did in these earlier systems that um, I'm more bothered by them not being carried forward, right? Like Steve was talking earlier about how fast things boot um, on the web TV box, on danger. We, we cared about starting up as fast as possible. Um, and... You know, nowadays, it feels like that's not necessarily uh, the high priority. Um, and, but there's other things that we did that I think were, were features that we kind of took for granted as being like the right thing to do, but they, they never propagated forward. Like when we launched the, the Sidekick at Nature, um, the demo that we did was, uh, was pretty cool. We had a guy on stage who had a Sidekick, and um, he was demoing it. And then he asked the audience for, um, for just some random phrases. And they gave him random phrases and he typed them into a notepad. And of course, the sidekick you know, reflected those all back up to the cloud. Then he took his sidekick and he put it on the ground and he dropped a bowling ball on it and just destroyed it like in real life in front of everybody. He picked up the broken sidekick, he took out the SIM card, and then he put the SIM card in a brand new sidekick and everything came back down exactly like he had it on his original sidekick. And um, we still don't have that today. Right? And I really miss it. Every time I have to upgrade my phone, it's a huge pain in the butt because there's a bunch of stuff that just doesn't come back automatically. But doesn't iCloud do that? Um, maybe iCloud does everything. Does it do all your passwords and everything? Android doesn't. Yeah, iCloud will do the, your keychain. But do you get everything back exactly like you had it before? And you may. I'm sorry. I just, I don't, I'm not sure with iPhone. Um, I don't. You don't get all your apps back. I think you have to re-download all that stuff. But I think your important user data, like your notes, your your texts, your uh, addresses, like your saved addresses and your GPS and stuff like that. Text yeah. I mean, you, you do get stuff like that back on, on Android as well. But like... It always seems like there's some password that I have to remember, and I don't remember it, so I have to reset it. Um, uh, but on the sidekick, just it was your environment, right? That was like your your virtual world. Uh, and when you moved to a new phone, like you didn't do anything except move the SIM card. Yeah, I think. Look, Apple, I think, tries to go and do that. And it one of the things you know that's iOS versus Android is you know. Uh, Apple creates a very, very, a, a really well decorated room if it's the room you want to be in, uh, and it makes all the pieces work very well together. Android, I think you get to go and design the room the way you want it, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And but but along with that flexibility, you, you give things up. It, for me, I, we use both. I mean, um, in fact, in, in my home, we're split right down the middle. Half of us, our primary phones are iOS or Android, and. At um, uh, at Artemis, we we use both of them for different reasons. You know, there's certain things we can do with iOS we can't do with Android, and with Android we can't do with iOS, etc. 
So I'm, I'm glad that both operating systems exist today. God, you know, one thing I will say, you know, um, I, I heard it was an interview with Bill Gates um, just before the pandemic, where he, of course, was then focused on the pandemic, where he asked if he had any regrets in his um, career. And he says the one business mistake he made was not to acquire Android. And of course, what happened there was they, Microsoft had, well, when in, certainly when I was there in the, um, in the late night, in the end of the nineties, um, Microsoft really ruled the world because the only alternative platform was, was, you know, Macintosh, which was a very small percentage of the market. And um, then, you know, a lot of innovators, Joe, as I already mentioned, one of the pioneers, um, then created a new platform, which is the, you know, the mobile platforms. And, you know, iOS, you know, grew out of, um, you know, the iPod. And the, then the, the question was, who's going to, there's always, the world tends to settle usually on two platforms, right? And so Microsoft scrambled to go and uh, make Windows CE be that second one. But Android was already very far along, you know, and they scrambled faster. And they did something that Microsoft just couldn't do because it was just wasn't something they, they did the way they, they, the way their software was structured, the way their business was structured. That is, they gave it away for free. And believe it or not, that, that was a page out of uh, the original Microsoft playbook when, of course, I don't know if you guys knew, but you know, MS-DOS was made available for free with the IBM PC, whereas CPM, which at the time was a much more popular microcomputer operating system, you had to pay for so MS-DOS ended up being put into all the IBM PCs. Microsoft didn't make any money from it. But when the clones came, Compaq and all the ones that followed, of course, then people paid for, um, for MS-DOS. And well, and then there was also Office. They did very well. But it, it, that, you know, the, I, the rest is history. The way they became the dominant platform was by giving it away for free when there was a new um, piece of hardware that was emerging. So Android... Um, Google moved quickly and they got Android into this new thing. And Qualcomm, of course, had, you know, the core chips that they could build it on top of and a bunch of different manufacturers. You know, HTC was one of the early ones doing Android and so forth, um, were able to go and, and uh, create the other platform. Microsoft tried and tried and tried to get people to adopt, um, you know, the, the various things they did with, with mobile after that. And of course, none of them caught on. So um, I think I, I mentioned before that nobody would fund Android, well, including Microsoft. Um, and it was because because <laughs> I, um, you know, gave them the seed funding, they were able to keep going. And uh, uh, eventually, you know, then, then after that, they got limited um, venture funding and then were, of course, acquired by Google. So anyway, it's funny how these things end up, um, you never... You never can imagine how big something's going to be until you, you know, until it happens. Absolutely. So it's kind of funny that you were just bringing up um, Microsoft, their chances. And uh, I think what IBM came to Microsoft because they had basic, right? And assumed that Microsoft had an operating system, but they didn't yet. So Microsoft literally, I believe they went to CPM to get CPM, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I guess because, because IBM was with them and they threw down a, a, co like a non-disclosure before they would even talk, I guess IBM and Microsoft both got kicked out of that room and Microsoft ended up DOS, uh, I think it was called FreeDOS at the time or something? I don't remember. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the same history books you are, so I, I don't know. Um, uh, the details of it. I, I, my understanding is that Microsoft had no operating system, so they bought one for like $45,000 from some guy. I think that's <laughs> right. Yeah. But a lot of people know Bill Gates wrote BASIC for the Apple II. Yeah. And, and it was retargeted to a bunch of different things. But, you know, I think part of the story also is um, CPM came from a company called Digital Research that was founded by a guy named Gary Kildall, who was very, very famous. Um, and um, I think there was a little bit of hubris there. You know, CBM was the dominant operating system at the time, at a time when there really weren't that many microcomputers out there. But CBM was the, the big player. That's what IBM originally wanted. But um, the story I, I remember was 
Gary Kildall didn't, he really didn't want to work with IBM. Um, and uh, it was a story of hubris. Gary also is in a private plane. And um, I think IBM came out to visit and Gary didn't want to meet with them and decided he was going to fly his plane that day and blew off IBM. And that led to IBM going up to uh, Washington and, and meeting with their backup plan, which was Microsoft. So I, I can tell you, um, I, I went to, I was working for Dun & Bradstreet when I was at Columbia in New York, and we were working on a thing where you could use uh, touchstones when you, you know, called up for customer service and, and have it menu like that. And we were using Apple IIs to uh, decode the touchstone sounds. And then the IBM, uh, the IBM PC came out in 1982, and they bought those. And we were immediately said, we're going to work on these IBM PCs. It's IBM. It's a big company. We'd rather work with them. And there were distinctly two operating system boxes that came with it. Well, of course, they were done to Pratt 3 had tons of money, so they would buy whatever's there. There was an MS-DOS thing, and then there was this CPM. You could get, you could load either. And um, we ended, and I wasn't familiar with CPM. I'd never heard of MS-DOS before. I, remember, I think it was just called DOS. I'm trying to remember what the box looked like. But, PC uh, DOS, I think. PC DOS, was that it? I remember. That was but, IBM branded version. But what but, but quickly became apparent was, um, is, is the people the, the people started writing code, everybody's writing their code on DOS. I, I didn't think too hard about why. Um, I just know that that was the case. And so I, then at some point, CPM just sort of you know evaporated and we didn't see it. And, um, and then I didn't know what Microsoft was. I've never heard of them before. <laughs> so they were micro dash soft at the time. It wasn't, wasn't until I, mean, I heard of the next time I heard about them was when I, I saw Word um, as an operating, as a, oh, sorry, as a Word and Excel. But really the big, the dominant tools there were things like WordPerfect and uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3. Um, so it, they, you know, we think of, 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 of Microsoft now as this you know, incredibly dominant player, but they weren't back then. They were, you know, a relatively small, scrappy outfit. And, you know, Bill was writing code and um, they had to go and, and claw their way in, you know, to where they got to. And, uh, well, yeah. And, and they, they made the Z80 soft card for the Apple II to let the Apple II run CPM. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, I'm not sure. If, um, so I don't know if you had uh, if we answered the questions you did or over answered or under answered them. Oh no that that was uh, that was perfectly fine. Um, something else, and I'm kind of forgetting here. It slipped my mind. Oh yeah, right. Uh, uh, what kind of involvement did you guys have with the uh, Web TV Japan team? And uh, was there anything about Web TV Dreamcast that you guys were working on? Web TV Dreamcast? Or are you talking about uh, Xband? No, no, there was a port. There was a port of Xband to Dreamcast. I mean, to Web TV to Dreamcast. I remember it, and I remember the kid who was doing it. I can picture him, but I can't. I can't remember his name. Okay, so all right, let me tell you about Web TV Japan. So it's called Web TV KK. That's what you call. It's like incorporated here. They say KK, and. Um, before Microsoft acquired us, um, we, uh, Sony in particular, wanted a web TV in Japan, as you can well imagine. And so, and they were so impressed with that, you know, that, that we had implemented Japanese in a matter of a couple of days. And I was, I, I was still <laughs> ready to wring their throats, but anyways, no, no they did the right thing. Um, the, um, and so, I went and began to talk to partners there. Now, it's, it's, it's essentially impossible, but for even a large company, but maybe a large company, can, but, but definitely impossible for a startup to form a new company in Japan, at least back then. And so we looked to partners who we could partner with. And um, in the end, we went to a bunch of different large companies. We ended up with Fujitsu. And Fujitsu really wanted to have a controlling interest in this KK. And I just couldn't see it because I was really worried that we just, because Yahoo did that, by the way, you know, Yahoo Japan gave a controlling interest to SoftBank and Yahoo lost control of Japan. 
And it, it actually became a very different thing than Yahoo as we knew in the United States. And um, so, you know, um, and Fujitsu said they're going to walk away and we weren't going to have anything in Japan. I was getting a lot of pressure from Sony and everything. And I said to the board, guys, look, you know, this is a very complex device. We're going to have more issues when we go to Japan with whatever we do there. We need to have control of it. So in the end, we agreed on a 51-49% deal where Web TV, owned, Web TV US owned 51%. And then we worked with Fujitsu. They brought over some people, and then we hired other people and so on. Okay, so that was then in place. And then we had to go and begin to make you know, Web TV hardware and, um, and a build of Web TV software. And this work was primarily done in the United States, but we still had um, staff. So the the team in Japan was mainly things like QA, um, and we had uh, staff there. And like one of the things that's very tricky is a, a keyboard for Japanese, because it's really, really hard the way that they enter text, you know. I don't remember exactly where we ended up with that, but, and then they market things super differently. You know, the way they do ads and everything is just really, really different, and they, you know, and they, they've got other cultural things that are very important to them, you know, that, that resonate with the public, you know, and um, and so anyways, in, in the end, we, um, we did get it out there and they did start selling it. And one of the things that, that was difficult in Japan was that the, um, they did not have uh, any toll-free telephone calls. So even if you're just calling the person next door, um, it still costs something. So that really made it hard for someone who had an extended session, as you can imagine. Now, people had dial-up services there, things like AOL. In fact, there was an AOL Japan at the time. And so people were used to paying extra money in order to have you know, these connections, and we were like that. But unlike AOL, of course, we were trying to reach a much lower, lower cost you know, audience. And so it was tough. We did sell a lot of units there, and uh, it went on. Now, I'm trying to remember the details of the... Um, the Sega Dreamcast situation in Japan. God, you know, I've, I completely blanked that out. But I, 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 that's right. We were, there's a way that you could go, we're going to get our code to run on Sega Dreamcast. So if you had Sega Dreamcast and you hooked up a modem to it, or it had a modem, I don't remember, then you'd be able to use Web TV. I, I remembered his name. It was Josh Carroll, uh, C A R U L L. He was, because um, I remember he was sitting like, near where Andy and I sat upstairs um, in, the, uh, in the old Netscape building. Uh, and Josh was like the one guy who was working on get, trying to get um, uh, web TV running on, on Dreamcast. Huh, okay. And I don't remember if we ever did. Maybe we did. I no, think I, it worked. I, just, I don't know whatever happened to it. Right. Yeah, so... Um... But that's a whole other world there. It really was. Um, uh, it really was interesting seeing that. And then, then, oh, by the way, the the one part of, of of Web TV KK that figures into the Microsoft acquisition. When we, I got, you know, I spoke to Bill Gates. You heard about that before. We had the, you know, team Microsoft come over and so on. And so we decided that they are going to acquire the company. And then they said, so. And then I, when they're going through all the documents, Laura said, "You have a Japanese division." I said, "Yeah." Web TV KK, and it's a joint venture with Fujitsu. And they said, we can't go forward with the acquisition. And I'm like, what? And they said, well, we just can't. You know, we need to have control over all of our, um, you know, ventures. We're not going to buy a company, which is then um, the Japanese, you know, ver the Japanese part of the company is controlled by another company. So I said, it isn't controlled by another company. It's called controlled by us. And they said, what? As a startup, you negotiated with Fujitsu and formed a company in Japan where you control it. So I said, yeah, I said, we really want the quality to be a certain way and, and so on. And the guy said that they had been through, they, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, startups that Microsoft had looked into acquiring. And we were the first ones to stand our ground <laughs> and made sure we kept control. And they said, well, great, we'll go forward. Then when Microsoft got involved, Microsoft Japan, tied in with Web TV KK. They brought in actually a CEO who was a, a Microsoft executive. Um, and, and, and I got to know the uh, head of Microsoft Japan very well, Sam Furukawa, who was kind of a, a celebrity in, uh, and, uh, in Japan. So whenever we would, I would go to Japan, Sam would drive me around 
in his car, which was a which was a even they have a left hand drive there, you know. But he had a Ameri- we had a you know like a uh, a right hand drive car. Steering was on the other side because he wanted a particular BMW that was only available in the United States. So, anyways, um, but we go to restaurants in fancy places, and and people were like they bow to him. It was crazy. It really was crazy. Oh, and the other thing that that's another crazy thing when I would come. As the CEO of uh, Web TV, and I would go to different companies we were going to partner with in Japan for one reason or another. As I would walk, through, I'd be usually with whatever the senior executive, very often the president or CEO of that company was. As we'd walk through the hallways, people would stand up and bow as we were walking through. And then as we were past, they'd get up and sit down again. It was really, really weird. Um, but uh, they're just a, there's a level of politeness and um, decorum that, uh, at least back then, that I had never experienced before. And I had never, it, it seemed really weird to, to have people bowing down to you guys. It's not, that's not me. <laughs> but um, that's the one time in my life I think anyone's ever bowed down to me, actually. <laughs> usually, they usually seem, hey, we got to get this thing done. This is really twisted piece of code that someone left that he passed out. Steve, fix it. (laughs) Thank you, Halen, by the way, for your question. Yeah. um, One, one last thing that I was wondering about, but I'm not sure if you guys were aware of this. Uh, There's this website where this guy uh, posted uh, these high rise pictures of, what Ultimate TV was going to become, but it never did. Supposedly, he had a lot of hand in the design of this stuff. Um, were you guys at all aware of the Ultimate TV, Lat TV, and the Media Nodes thing? Sorry, no. I think that was after me. Nodes. Yeah, I, uh, I've got the link here. Did you uh, have any other questions, Taylor? Um, yeah. The, the only thing I can really think of at this point is I noticed that every web TV client besides uh, stuff like the Dreamcast, they all have a smart card slot, uh, and it was very underutilized. What, what pushed the... I guess, abundance of it on the hardware, just pretty much every unit having it. We imagined that we were going to be doing transactions. It was one of the dreams that we had, that eventually people would do transactions, and we needed, we want to utilize the, the, potent, the security of it. Smart cards took off in Europe in a big way, um, way, way before they did in the United States, you know. Um, and so... We are seeing whether or not we could be in the front of that curve. I think the only thing it was ever used for that I can remember, and Joe, you may remember something else, is that we did some promotions where you get a smart card and it'd give you a discount on like web TV service or something, you know, for a month or something, one month free, and you'd stick the smart card in. But I don't think it was ever used for much more than that. Um, yeah, part... Apart from that, the, the last thing I think I could think of to ask here really is, uh, I know from what Matt has documented, uh, there was a trial for the uh, web TV service in Europe, but that never went through. So uh, h- how did that just fall apart? I don't remember that trial. Um, it may have been after I left. Um, I know that... So uh, here's the thing. We actually were going to first try to get it working in the UK just because it was in English, even though Philips uh, was, of course, a Dutch company. But they also agreed. The first thing to do is get it working in Europe. The funny thing about it, you can Google this, is that um, it was true for both the UK and Japan. Um, we, the, um, um, who was it? Was the NSA contacted us and said, we're not allowed <clears throat> to ship web TV outside the United States because it is a munition. Is, um, 
So it's a munition because we use strong encryption. We use a long in encryption, you know. And um, so, you know, one of the things about Web TV, you don't know, talk about pioneering things, is that, you know, back then, websites, all of them were sent, you know, websites um, were, were unencrypted, except, you know, maybe if you do a credit card kind of transaction, but most of them were not, you know, today we have a lot of, you know, secure websites, right? But um, we nonetheless, if I, I think everything we sent down to the, from our server to the web TV box was encrypted, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. So they said we couldn't do it. So then it was, I had to go to Washington, D.C. My first time there, other than visiting it as a kid. And I had to put on a suit and a tie um, and uh, meet with the Congress, you know, the two senators for California with, um, I met with the NSA, I met with the CIA, the FBI, and, um, and the House Intelligence Committee permanent, I met with all these people to try to explain to them that this munition was something you could buy at Circuit City for $199. And, and anybody could pack it in their luggage and I'm sure customs would not, would think it was like a VCR. And then I said, on top of that, this level of encryption is available through open source. And so anybody in the world um, could use it. I remember there was one senator who remained nameless because she's the senator is still in office. Um, she yelled at me and kicked me out of her office and said, you are giving away America's, um, you're giving away America's military secrets, secrets of the enemy. All right, so Web TV for a period of time was classified as munitions and we could not export it. But then I finally did get clearance from all those agencies, which allowed us to make it available in Japan and also allowed us to make it available in the UK. So then when I flew to the UK to announce that we, and I, there was a conference and I remember it was a press conference and I was asked a bunch of questions. One of the questions from a reporter came, we would like, uh, uh, Mr. Perlman, we'd like you and other Americans to know that from our point of view, hostilities between our two countries were resolved in the Revolutionary War and then the War of 1812. But be, since then, we consider you to be allies. And we will share our encryption technology with you. And we hope that you'll share your encryption technology with us since it's the same thing. And so... <laughs> Anyways, so I got kind of razzed by the people in, in Europe about that. Okay, that was not your question. Your question is why we did not, what happened to the, the trying to ship it in Europe? And it took longer because of that to get things out of the United States. And then by the time, um, by the time I left, which is in late, which is in May of 1999 or something, um, we had not yet had something ready for Europe. Um, I will say this though, that web TV, the, the, the more, the, 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 I don't know if you guys want another story, but the more interesting thing is that the state that web TV sold highest from a per capita basis is one of the two states where web TV was not made available. We also had two states where we did not offer web TV. But, um, which were? Different story. <laughs> and well, I don't what know. were the states? Uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason was that um, we just could not, the, the, the population of both states was small enough that we, and the, they also, they were sparse enough. Believe it or not, Hawaii, the population density is quite low compared to the area. And um, there wasn't enough people there for the, what, what we need to do for support and so forth. So anyways, um, do you want to hear the, the, the story of Hawaii, the Hawaii story or... Tommy, should I go into that about why it became our highest per capita state and the most? Absolutely. Okay, so we we had people that one of the things that people came back and said is that it's not fair that you have to pay twenty dollars a month, and then when when on AOL raised the twenty one ninety five, essentially twenty two dollars a month, that people have to pay twenty twenty two dollars a month to you know web TV in order to get their service if they already have an ISP. Why shouldn't they be able to use their own ISP for dial-up? So we implemented a thing that we called Open ISP, which allowed you to go and choose your own ISP. And I think we got ten dollars a month instead of the twenty-one or the twenty-two dollars a month. And then you would type in a phone number, and it would connect to your ISP. And um, 
although we had a lot of like the press and so forth was pushing very hard for that because they're and some of them had their own isps but in the end very few people really signed up for it in the states we offered it uh in in, in where web tv was signed but and that was fine and by the way the people that did do that <laughs> made web tv incredibly profitable because of course almost all of our cost was for those modem banks right and so if we're you're going to provide your own modem bank and you're going to pay us ten dollars a month then it was great so and but you know so that was all fine we didn't mind doing it then something unexpected happened maui.net is a isp or was an isp in uh hawaii on maui and on other islands and um they had dial up modems and people connected to it so what these guys would do is they go to the mainland like california or something they buy a huge number of web tv units and they they'd fly them back to um hawaii and then door to door because you know what everyone knows each other there they would knock on the door and they would say hey how would you like to have the web on your tv and it's just you know and they charge what we charge 21.95 a month and and we'll set it up for you and we'll provide customer service and everything because we weren't supporting the units and they were outside of uh mainland united states and um people are like this is great wow cool and so maui.net then was essentially collecting the you know the twelve dollars and we would get ten dollars a unit from each of those things and so we just see started seeing you know when we were getting reports at the end of the month about where our users are hawaii was going through the roof and we're like it's not offered for sale there's not any stores there you know and we finally figured it out the Bowie and Night guys were super nice and we we were happy we we're happy to help them and so forth and work with them and hawaii ended up being the highest per capita state for web tv and by far the most profitable i mean it was just printing money <laughs> so uh it's interesting how you know entrepreneurs um will then go and and run with something so that was a, another as i said there's unexpected outcomes particularly if you're willing to embrace other entrepreneurs and work with them you know what i mean and this was a happy outcome for everyone you know Absolutely. In fact, I mean, that was Maui.net's own little innovation that they could, you know, offer their customers. And Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's so many people in Hawaii that when I would get letters from them, you know, saying how awesome it was because they didn't really understand the Internet. They didn't have a computer. And it was so great that, you know, they thanked us for providing <laughs> this service to connect them to the world and uh, made us happy to, to hear that, you know. Oh, by the way, when web, when web TV shut down, or MSN TV then shut down, gosh, I have this letter, if I could even find it, um, that someone wrote me that was just it's so touching. You know, these people write things saying how much it meant to their lives. Uh, let me see if I can find web TV letter on this computer. Steve, I remember when I was at web TV, I, I wrote like the original screensaver, the, the one before um, Sean Callahan's with the rotating logos. Some lady sent me a box of cookies that she had made because she liked the web TV logo bouncing around. I don't, I don't know how she got my name and figured that out, but this uh -huh. box of cookies showed up. And I got to tell you, I did not try eating one of those, but Bruce Lee did, and, and he was okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, so there's a web to memento here. Okay, a letter. It's a handwritten letter from Ms. Leslie Ben. I can read this if people like to see it. I could send it to you. Um, and it's it's written to Steve Perlman, inventor. <laughs> so, as you got my address, and she's from Orinda, California. R. E. Lost emails of historical significance, dear Steve. Well, she's being very kind here, but uh, we give you a new of two. What she's writing here, but she's basically saying how web TV um, made a big difference in her life. It was very nice for her to write, and uh, I think other mail like that. But we, you know, you, you do these things and you touch people's lives in ways you have no idea you will be reaching them, you know. And that, of course, you know, as I think you guys all know, is one of the big rewards that you get from doing this stuff. It's so weird because my relation to this is 
that when X band shut down, um, because of the way my parents were, I basically lost my email address, like my <laughs> own address to email at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, I think that's um, you know, um, I don't know what what other questions you guys got. It, it's super late for you. It's two a.m. on the East Coast and eleven our time. Um, you're you're talking about a lot. Uh, there's there's a couple things that happened uh, after you left. Um, for w- what what reason did you guys actually leave Web TV? Well, let's see, Joe. When did you leave? You left after I did. I, think, right? I left. I left um, at the end of 1999, um, and uh, you know, I left. I I had worked on. I had the great fortune to work on. I think every single product at Web TV from the founding um, until that point, like around December of '99, and um, you know, I just I I wanted to do something different, and um, and that's when I left and and started Danger with Andy and Matt. Mm -hmm. And so I left in May and of 1999, and. I did not have a specific thing I was going to start. Um, and in fact, I, I took a little bit of a break for maybe, I think that maybe the three months or four months after that was the only time in my entire life I've not been working like crazy. So um, that was kind of nice. But the reason I left, I so I was a president of Microsoft. Okay, I was a senior executive. Okay, you know, of, of the most powerful technology company in the world, particularly then. And, you know, they were being investigated, as you probably know, if you look at history books the, at that time for, um, and they, you know, they had to do a consent decree. So they were like digging through all everyone's mail and stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of accusations about them using their uh, market power for different things. So I was separate from that because, of course, we were acquired and we had our thing. So for the, I was there, I guess I was there for two and a half years. And during that time, we were largely allowed to do continue to operate the way we were. Um, you know, I was able to still, con- you know, uh, work with the same people, um, still, you know, contribute technically. Um, you can look them up. You'll see that there's quite a number of patents that I filed while I was at Microsoft, just as I had been done before Microsoft, um, because I was still, you know, set aside some of my time for doing technical work. And um, we were building some cool products um, and still doing that. But what began to happen is, you know, it became much more, I was, I was beginning to be, they expected me to become much more of a full-time executive and less an executive plus, you know, uh, technologist or developer, which is what my role was before. And that just wasn't, wasn't who I was. In fact, the other executives, when I said I was moving on, because, you know, there was <laughs> the, the time Microsoft office was, was, you know, there's a lot of money to be made there, et cetera. Um, and, you know, they, they paid their executives very well. You know, I think that should be obvious to everyone. Um, and so here I'm walking away from what for most of them was the, you know, the, the ultimate thing that they could see in their career, because they saw themselves as executives and saw their ultimate role as business people and you know, making budgets, laying out plans, and then having people underneath them that would go and lay out their things and just kind of make decisions, but, you know, be very, very high above everything else. That just wasn't who I was. I mean, you know, here I am, uh, you know, last weekend, I think I, (laughs) what, it was two 18-hour days of C++ coding because I had a, a tricky thing that had to be written. So here I am, I'm still, I haven't changed. I'm never grew up. Um, and uh, and just Microsoft wouldn't let me do it. The, the things that I had to do, the number of meetings I had to do, the number of budget things I had to file and so forth. And the, I think one of the other things I realized too was I proposed a bunch of things that I thought Microsoft could do. And I thought, geez, this is a company with tens of billions of dollars in the bank. And all of these years, the, the big thing has always been trying to raise funding to go and do you know, ideas that are out of the box. And... I couldn't get them behind anything. Um, they, and I, I realized that um, it just wasn't in their DNA. Their DNA was really to be a fast follower. They did a very good job being a fast follower. 
but it was it was contrary to their DNA to be a pioneer in any in, in really most anything. Now I do believe that that has changed. I think Microsoft is particularly with the new um, CEO. There's there's a bunch of things that they're pioneering, and I think in a lot of ways they've they've done some really great stuff. And and then look, look for all I know, it's just maybe what they were doing was was right, and you know, and and you know. Um, Maybe I, you know, if I was, you know, a smarter person or knew what was good for me, I should have just stayed and, and taken the ride and so forth. I just couldn't. I had to go back to making things. And I really want to get as far away from um, being an executive in a large corporation as I could. So left on good terms and uh, left Bruce Leake took over as the uh, president of, uh, well, I, I, I don't know if the title they gave was president. I think it may be vice president, but either way. He head up to the division. Um, everyone stayed, and uh, most of the people stayed. One thing I'll tell you is that um, as of the day I left, one of the things I noted was of the first, I think, 35 people that joined Web TV, I think it was like 30 or 31 of them were still there. And it's highly unusual after a large acquisition that was, was, was successful financially, you know, successful as a business and that, you know, we still have a thing out there for people to stay. A lot of people go and, you know, if you will, cash out their winnings and, and, and go on. And some people did, but people stayed for a while at Microsoft and because they saw it as, because we were allowed to go and innovate and they saw it as this, this environment and this great opportunity continuing. And I tried as much as I could to, to defend that. And I felt like I, there was the dam between me and the big corporation where this holes kept popping through and I'd stick a finger and cover up that hole and another one of things that were trying to, you know, make web, make the web TV team um, more corporate. And I finally had run out of fingers to plug in the dam. Plus I myself, as I said, was just, you know, I was, I needed to go back and uh, designing things and not have projects shot down. I was, I, I'd rather make the trade that I'd go and propose something that was, that was, next to impossible to get funded than just have the thing shot down out of hand, um, you know, because it was, it was something that, you know, was, was, was too outside of the box, you know what I mean? So that was the call for me. And um, I, I'm very grateful for the guys at Microsoft. I think they were great. I'm still in touch with a lot of them that I worked with. And that scene, you know, being in the big corporation was good for them. And um, I'm happy that, uh, uh, in the end, I think it was it worked out very well for everyone. Uh, Joe, I, I I don't know if your feeling was that it ended up being a, a, a good deal all around. Absolutely, no. I mean, it was uh, transformative, wonderful, and um, you know, like you, I, I still have so many connections with wonderful people from that time. All right. And if we got more questions here. Um, I think actually our question queue is closed or well, there's nothing in there, but Halen, thank you so much for your questions. Um, yeah. This is our last chance to throw out. If you've got any quick questions here, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get to them. If not, you guys, huh? This was quite the session. I did what? not expect it was going to be, uh, me neither. Where? Five hours and fifteen minutes. Actually, wow. Sophie has Sophie has a question that she wants me to. Ask. Give me a second. Cool. I have to find it because I know it's in here. She's you know, she's sitting next to me. She's too shy to ask. So, um, I think so, we kind of hit on a little bit. Sophie, we're, we're very happy to answer whatever you have, any question you have. Do you want to? Uh -huh. No? Okay. Yeah, she doesn't want to. Um, I'm having trouble finding. Oh. Do you have any cute, funny anecdotes or memories? Oh, you want the other one? Oh. Okay, uh, hold on. Products like X-Band, Web TV, the Hip Top, and PSO gave consumers amazing features. 
these products seem so far ahead of the times, especially when you compare them with modern day equivalents. Are there any new emerging areas in technology and innovation that you are personally excited about or think that we will eventually look back on years from now with the same kind of wonder as X-Band, P-Cell, Hip-Top, Web TV, etc.? Or anything that you think we will be looking back years from now feeling the same way about? Do you want to start? <laughs> Was that... Yeah, Steve. If you have if you have ideas, please go ahead. Okay. So yes, um, there's always new stuff, and there's always great ideas in any era, in any age, any time. Uh, there's always you know great things that are come. Um, so you know some things I can tell you about. You know the the story for cloud gaming. I was very uh, you know a very disappointing ending with with Unlive. We tried so hard. And now there are cloud gaming services out there. You know, Stadia, there's NVIDIA as this thing. Microsoft's doing it. Sony's doing it. Uh, Amazon's trying to do it um, and so on. And um, that idea of having um, a huge amount of computing power and then be able to stream the games, I think is, uh, is great because, of course, you know, that it can continue to be upgraded and you can um, have... You can have systems that would be unaffordable or impractical to have at home. They make too much noise, for example. And um, when these resources are shared among a lot of people, it's a lot less expensive. So, you know, uh, um, one thing a lot of people don't realize about on live that's an interesting statistic is that we were getting close to 100 to 1 utilization. In other words, if we had one server, that server would um, be utilized by about 100 users. You know, in other words, in, in a given month, you take a month, that server would be used by 100 different people. And meanwhile, everybody, whenever they'd get on the service, would think that they had access to the server they wanted instantly. And there's other cool things we were doing, like um, we could teleport you, you know, if you, like if, when you walked away from a game, and if you're playing a game, a lot of times people just pause and they stop the moment. I mean, and you'd think you were tying up a server there. We had built a framework around that where the game state was, uh, was kept separately from every one of the games. When we, port, when, we, when we ported a game over to the service, we separated out the game state and so that it would... So if a person walked away for even just a couple minutes and the game wasn't moving, we would go and take that game state, store it off on a disk, and then hand off that server to someone else who needed it. Then they came back to sit down that game would start within a couple seconds because all the games would be running and all we do is load the state. You know what I mean? And then if you went to a different part of the country where the latency was lower to a different data center, we'd actually teleport the game over. And then once in the Luxembourg data center, we had two rooms in Europe and they had a, the, the fire uh, retardant thing went off and it actually destroyed all the servers there. But when we got an alarm, if you will, um, to our server code, the code that the servers were, the power is going down, that the, that we're switching the batteries and there was a fault. What we did before those, those servers died is they all, in their last dying breath, if you will, teleported over to the other room and kept the games alive with just a few seconds of delay. And then when that server room got overloaded in Luxembourg, because we had, we didn't have enough servers, you know, with only half the servers there, then it went and looked at the games that could tolerate higher latency. You know, there's some games that are more like, you know, chess or checkers, you know, that don't need the minimum latency, like first person shooter. It teleported those over to the Virginia's data center, which uh, had, had enough servers to handle it. The users never saw it other than this brief delay. So that concept of having um, a computing state and having incredibly powerful servers and having so that your set perception of the latency is basically nil, I think is a very, very powerful idea. And what we did with OnLive and what the cloud gaming services today are doing is doing that with servers that are somewhat remote from you, maybe a thousand miles away, and they're, you know, um, maybe closer, I don't know, um, for all the things, but usually they're, they're adding, you know, tens of milliseconds of latency is, is in the budget for the transport from the data center to the user. The, What's cool now is um, multi-access edge computing, MEC, where 
this is the, this, in this case, the servers are on the edge and they're going to be very, very close to you where you will have, and we have stuff running, where the latency between the server and the delivery of the pixels is actually less than a millisecond. Um, you'll end up having more milliseconds than that just because equipment in between, like whatever your wireless system is or what have you, will be a little bit more than that. But the reason that this is important and why I'm excited about the future is that when we're moving with video games, you can tolerate, you know, if you're, if you're a good player, you can tolerate 50, 60 milliseconds of latency. If you're an expert, you know, hardcore, you know, competitive gamer, you can tolerate 35, 40 milliseconds latency and still is as responsive as you can't tell there's a delay. But if you're doing alternate augmented reality or virtual reality, you really need to get in there in less than 10 milliseconds, ideally less than five milliseconds. The reason is when you move your head, if the world doesn't move with you, you get seasick. Okay, so the way that's been addressed, and it's one of the reasons why these things have not taken off so, so quickly, is they, they put the actual computer on you, of course, or you have the computer in the room with you. And in my view, for most consumers, that's, that's a non-starter. And the other thing you, you really have to do, particularly if you're carrying it with you, I'm sure you've seen the little thing that they have, like for the um, um, Magic Leap stuff, you know, you have a little thing on your belt or something. You're just not gonna have enough computing power. The kind of computing power is, that you could do is similar to what you could do in an iPad or something and so forth which has gotten to be incredibly impressive for sure over the last few years, but it doesn't touch what we're doing now with servers where we've got dual 64 core um, uh, AMD CPUs coupled with um, multiple GPUs and then having multiple servers tied together. And we've created new ethernet drivers that are able to deliver consistently with multiple connections uh, achieve less than 30 microseconds of latency between the machines. So we essentially have these supercomputing things. And then, well, you know, you'll be reading about some announcements soon. But what we've done with Artemis um, is create a technology that can deliver many simultaneous video, um, um, wireless connections with ex very high reliability and sub millisecond latency. So if you have something like glasses on your head, even ones much thinner than the glasses that we're used to seeing for virtual reality or augmented reality. I mean, closer to like, you ever see those Bose frames that have like audio, you know, something of that weight and size, and then eventually even contact lenses. Then you'll have this ultra photorealistic experience with sub millisecond latency being created by computers, servers that are gonna be within, you know, maybe 10, 15 miles of where you are. So the, the entire latency uh, is extremely low. And then as far as creating those photorealistic experiences, we've developed this technology you may have seen called Nova, which does these, does very, very photorealistic facial capture. And then you can, it capture, it tracks the face as it moves, which allows you to go and uh, transform that face. And um, the, the, the system we have, and it's on the Nova website, is, is an old one that we built a long time ago. And um, it certainly works great for movie production and also some video game production, like uh, you know, like Rise of the Tomb Raider, I guess, um, used it. Not necessarily with our permission, but nonetheless, <laughs> they, uh, at other games. So, um, the, but anyways, the facial capture, in my view, in fact, there was a New York Times article. I don't think she just called me out of the blue two weeks ago. It's a, a little blog, you can read about it. The face communicates so much of the emotion and expression of the human humans to each other. You know, it's not just words, it's, it's you know, all those micro expressions and things like that. That's so important for storytelling, for, uh, for your character, for you to, to emote what you want to the other character. And um, there are ways, we haven't announced it, we haven't gone through it and so forth, but there are ways where we will be able to capture faces with the kind of realism that we, we were doing when you're sitting in a rig. But instead, again, with nothing more than the glasses, such as the ones I described on your face. So you put all those pieces together and you'll be able to walk around in a world with augmented reality. I think, to me, it's, that's a bit more interesting than virtual reality. But in any case, if you want to block off the world and do virtual reality, you can. But where you'll have um, 
you know, all the bandwidth you need coming in to deliver these experiences, sub millisecond latency, phenomenal computing power, just, you know, incredible computing power behind the scenes. Um, and you'll be able to communicate with other people, not just with the words you say or the motion of your hands, things like that, but actually with the micro expressions of your face. And you'll have avatars that are created of whatever kind of thing you want to be, um, person, animal, whatever gender, whatever planet you want to be from. And then you'll be able to enter into whatever world you want to do. You can go back in history. You can go and um, do something that's entertainment. You can be in a virtual world that's closer to like Mario Brother kinds of worlds. You can um, do anything. So that is coming. There are so many pieces to get all those things working. We've got a bunch of them working that were essential components of it. And you'll see you know, some announcements and so forth. Um, and still, when you go back and look to see this evolution of, of what we've done here, you know, the idea of multiplayer games and people interacting together, the idea of making the world accessible and, uh, and so on, what we do with web TV, the idea of going and leaping, leaping forward with the technology to get it to do things that it's just not ready to do if you're using the mainstream stuff. The business lessons we've learned, um, having the privilege of working with superb talent and people who really, really care about the end result. That is what is going to enable this thing to come into being. And also failures, things that like, like on live that didn't make it um, for one reason or another. And that uh, whipped at them and, you know, um, and of course, x that didn't make it for one reason or another. All of those things had to happen or to get at least me to where, I, where we are now um, and hopefully get as far as we can down the road of what I just described. All right, that, so much detail. <laughs> that, was in, that was incredibly fascinating. And honestly, um, I think um, I, it's just so funny because I still remember, um, you know, we keep talking about the recurring theme of uh, you guys being so ahead of the curve in one way or another on so many different projects. I remember on live um, and before it was out. And when I heard that you were working on it um, and there was articles out that were negative. And I remember customers and friends being like, that's never going to work. I'm like, you know, um, sounds awfully familiar, but Steve Perlman's working on this. I think, I think it's going to work. Like, well, it's very kind of you to say that. Um, not everything I work on does work, but, uh, um, you know, and, and once again, you know, there's me, okay, but you just have to give credit. Uh, so, so, you know, you, you just have to go and, and, and it, I couldn't do these things without the really amazing people and the, the sacrifices they make and how hard they work to create that stuff that you see. And so anyways, and, and, you know, as I said, it's, um, it's a, uh, for me, it's really a privilege. And I, uh, I was dragged kicking and screaming into the job of CEO, you know, at, at uh, as you well know, I think at, um, at Catapult, I was not the CEO, I was the chief technology officer. And, um, and then Khan took that over when I, when I moved on. But um, at Web TV, I, realize that's something I needed to do. And I think, Joe, at, at some point in your life, you decided that's something you needed to do too in order to make sure, sure. things, all the different hard things happened, even yep. when things were really dicey, you know? Yep, for sure. So in closing, I think um, we're in uh, two sentences each, maybe three sentences. Um, What's the best piece of advice you guys could each give to all of us fledgling hackers, developers, hobbyists? Um, okay, uh, boy. <laughs> uh, you know, look, I think 
I'm going to go more than two sentences. What what you guys are doing now is uh, is remarkable because you're diving into some very complex technology that um, uh, that set the stage for a, a lot of modern technologies, um, and and you're looking at it from a perspective that very few people do. So I I uh, I think that's amazing, and I'm I'm sure you're getting um, a, a lot of uh, uh, if nothing else. Like, you know, really um, interesting points of view on, on how to approach certain problems. And I, and I hope that influences all the great things that you do going forward. And I think, I think that's really the, the, the balance, at least, that, that I try to keep in mind, which is like, um, you know, looking both to the past and to the future to try to understand what the right things to do are. And we've talked about how many things repeat over and over and over again. Um, if you've ever, if you've never seen a, a video called "The Mother of All Demos," I encourage you to go to YouTube and look that up because that's something from 1968 that was put together by a guy named Douglas Engelbart, the guy who invented the computer mouse. And the first time I saw it, which was probably 20 years ago, it blew my mind because this was like 1968, demonstrating like collaboration between people who were geographically separated. Um, using hypertext, using things like source code control systems, like things that I would not have thought existed in 1968 when I first saw it. So um, being able to understand history is really, really important for being able to map out the future. So I completely agree with what, what Joe just said. And, you know, I certainly, and as you heard from Joe, we took things apart in order to learn. And, you know, there is no better way to learn. Because when you really, you know, have to go in and look at this thing and, it, and it's this opaque, you know, box or this opaque piece of code and you've got to walk it through, you know, Joe's talking about using colored pencils. And, you know, as I mentioned, this, uh, what we had to do to, um, you know, to, um, um, you, you know, to go and reverse engineer all the, the uh, you know, the game cracker stuff that we have to do to get these games to work. But we're doing that all always, you know, I'm still doing it now. It's like, you know, like, oh, we got to make phones work got to make work with these protocols for phones and it's it's just super hard because even when the things are documented <laughs> they're not documented well or they're not documented in a well way you necessarily know how they how they work but here's the thing you know there is what you guys are doing is going to give you lessons and learnings there is no class you can take that's going to give you that same information okay it, it would give you an overview you know, it'll, it'll give you, certainly you can get insights, you learn about, you know, you learn how virtual memory works from class, et cetera. But you guys are like on the ground floor, you're, you're touching the actual metal, you're touching the bits, you're seeing decisions that were made by people who had a practical problem to solve, and you're learning from it. And by bringing these things back to life, it means that, 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 that you know, you, you know, you've, you You've conquered them. You've you've gone and taken these things, and and you know, they're yours. You know, and so you know, I encourage you to keep on doing it. As Joe said, we we are we all should be students of history, all of us, um, and we certainly have benefit from it in order to get to where we are. And I also am I'm, I'm humbled, and I'm flattered, and I'm touched. I don't know how many other words to to say. Um, to see this work that we put in there, to see if there's people out there that care enough to go and carefully, carefully, bit by bit, go and piece it back together and bring it back to working order. I never imagined this would ever happen. I figured, okay, that, that company had to come to a, a close and well, it was nice while I was there. So to see these things working now and seeing people that are interested in it, it's just, I just can't tell you how rewarding it is. It's really amazing. It truly is mind blowing. Well, again, we can't thank you guys enough for all the work that you've put in to get here with your brilliant teams, and um, very much appreciate the inspiration and all of the knowledge we've gained, and so much more that you guys would take time out of your schedules to sit down and give us. Um, give us a run here 
and uh, this is the first time we've we've done something like this, and you know, um, hopefully, we're going to do some more in the future, and maybe even you know, next year, you guys can come back and tell us some new stories or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, there are a lot more stories. Even in, oh, we yeah. have a lot of stories, but we have not scratched the surface. That's right. Excellent. So we we didn't get too many we didn't get too many spoilers this time around. So, <laughs> but thank you guys so much. Um, there's a couple people I want to thank because they helped they helped put everything together here. So first off, uh, Natalie, thank you so much, and. Um, Jarhead, thank you so much. Uh, Natalie kind of helped organize and keep things in uh, in line here, and even had to go jump back into how the uh, X Men newspapers worked so we could get those updated. <laughs> and uh, Jarhead took care of getting the Web TV network updated for uh, the news blasts here. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you guys all in the audience for taking time out of your schedules to come hang out and uh, listen to some of the insights that these guys have. And again, if you guys think that we should continue to do stuff like this, please let us know in the chat. Um, and yeah, so just overall, thanks everybody. And uh, hope you guys have a good night. And uh, yeah, talk to y'all soon. Okay, so long, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you all so much. It was super yeah. fun. All right, have a good night. All right. Bye-bye.